Welcome to this comprehensive Go programming course for beginners. Throughout this course, you'll learn key concepts and techniques to write performant, idiomatic Go code. You will be guided by the expertise of Lane Wagner and Alan Lyers, who combined have over 18 years of coding experience. Alongside mastering topics such as variables, functions, loops, and more, you'll also have the opportunity to apply your newfound skills in seven real-world projects, ranging from building an RSS aggregator to implementing authentication with API keys. So get ready to unlock the incredible potential of Go. Go has been exploding in popularity recently. It feels like all of the most modern tech companies are using Go to build scalable backend infrastructure. It actually makes a lot of sense. Go is fast, lightweight, has an amazing developer experience, and is actually super easy to learn. Stick around, and in just a few minutes, I'll explain the rest of the reasons why Go could be a game changer for your coding career. At this point, I'll just introduce myself really quickly. I'm Lane, the founder of Boot.dev, and I've been writing Go for a little over seven years, and I've been building software for about 10. I've actually spent over two years designing this Go course, and I've taught thousands of students with this material. The feedback from all of my students over the last couple of years has actually been incorporated in the course. So everything is very battle-tested and up-to-date. I was actually just making some updates yesterday. So how does this course actually work? Well, we're going to start by doing over 100 hands-on coding lessons and exercises. Now, when we're done with all of that, you'll actually have a really strong grasp on the fundamentals. So at that point, we'll go build a production-ready backend server in Go from scratch. Now, I'm begging you, please do not binge watch this video. Tutorial Hell is a very real place, and it's a place that you will go if you don't write your own code. Get your hands on the keyboard and write some code with me. In fact, you should actually be coding ahead of me and only using my solutions when you get stuck. So head over to boot.dev and create a free account. That's where all of the code samples for this course are hosted. Now, alternatively, I have linked a GitHub repo in the description below. All of the raw code for the samples in this course are hosted there. It won't be quite as streamlined of an option, but it is an option. Now, you should also know that this course is just one part of the full backend developer career path over on boot.dev. So if you're interested in going from zero to hired as a backend developer, you should definitely check that out too. Now, as long as we're talking about external resources, know that if you get stuck during this course, you have some options for help. First, you've got the boot.dev discord. Second, you've got the free code camp discord. And third, you've got the free code camp forum. I will link all of those down in the description below. Okay, one last thing before we jump into the course. If you want to connect with me personally, or you want access to my other Go and backend content, then you can follow me on Twitter, at WagsLane, or you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, at boot.dev. I'll link both of those down in the description below. With all of that out of the way, let's talk about Go. Everyone always wants to talk about how fast the Go programming language is. Let's talk about it and let's compare Go to some of the other more popular programming languages. So in terms of execution speed, execution speed, Go is much faster than JavaScript, Python, Ruby, and PHP. Pretty much any interpreted language, a language that's not compiled, is going to be slower than Go because Go is a compiled language. Now, don't worry too much if you're not familiar with the terms compiled and interpreted. We'll talk about those in just a minute. For now, just understand that Go is much faster um, than these languages when it comes to executing programs. If we're doing computationally heavy work, Go is going to be much more performant um, than some of these other languages. Now, here on the other side, I've listed some compiled languages. So when it comes to compilation speed, compilation speed, Go is actually much faster than these compiled languages when it comes to compiling the code. Now, again, we'll talk about compiling in a minute, but for now, just understand that you have to compile your code before you can run it when you're working with a compiled language. And so by having a fast compilation speed like Go has, it actually increases developer productivity quite a bit. We can iterate more quickly on our code. We can deploy it more quickly. It's not as expensive to run tests, to compile 
uh, the program and deploy it to production. Um, so this is actually a huge benefit that Go has. Now, I do want to point out that Go does not necessarily run faster. It does not necessarily have a faster execution speed than all of these languages, but it does beat them handily when it comes to compiling. Not to beat a dead horse, but I want to talk a little bit more about execution speed. So we talked about how Go is generally faster than the interpreted languages, right? Python, JavaScript, Ruby, PHP, and so on. It gets a little interesting when we compare Go to kind of the natively compiled languages or the languages that compile directly to uh, kind of machine code that runs on your CPU versus the compiled languages that run on top of a virtual machine. Right, so the, the two big ones that run on a virtual machine are Java and C Sharp, while some of the compiled or natively compiled languages that you'll be familiar with might be Rust, C, C++. Even though Go is a natively compiled language, a, a language that compiles directly to machine code like Rust, C, and C++, its execution speed is actually more similar to Java and C Sharp when it comes to its runtime speed, how many computations it can do kind of per second. And we'll talk more about this later, but the primary reason for that is the Go runtime. There's basically a chunk of code that's included in every Go program that manages memory, and that tends to slow down the execution speed a little bit. That said, it is worth pointing out that a Go program tends to use much less memory than Java and C Sharp because there isn't a need for an entire virtual machine. Here we are, the first coding challenge. Let me break down what we are supposed to do, and then I'll kind of explain what this code over on the right actually does. So um, our assignment is to log the string starting Textio server to the console instead of hello world. So throughout this course, we'll be building out little pieces of the Textio product, which if you're familiar with Twilio, it'll kind of be like a Twilio clone. It's a kind of backend server that sends SMS and email messages and works a lot with kind of textual data. Every file of Go code has a package declaration at the top. Here we have package main simply because this program builds into an executable Go program. Right, so we can run this code kind of standalone. The next line is importing the FMT package from the standard library. We are importing it because we are using it down here within the main function. Now, the main function is the entry point to the program. So every Go program starts execution at the top of the main function, which is just a function named main that takes no inputs and doesn't return anything. On line six and seven, we have some single line comments. These don't execute, they are not part of the program, they're just there for documentation. And single line comments just start with that double slash. Finally, on line eight, we have the one thing that this program actually does, which is print the string hello world to the console. So let me go ahead and run that. See down here, printed to the console. It's using the standard libraries FMT package um, and the print line function that is exposed from that package uh, to do so. So the assignment here is pretty simple. Uh, we're just supposed to swap out that hello world message for starting text IO server. I'm gonna run that and make sure it looks like what I would expect. We're good to go. Next, let's fix a quick bug. I love quick wins. Um, we're not gonna talk about all of this syntax in this program. What we're interested in is just fixing the math bug on line 17. So the assignment description says, text.io users are reporting that we are billing them for wildly inaccurate amounts. They're supposed to be billed for $0.02 for each text message they send. Something else is happening. So the total cost here is being set to the cost per message plus the number of messages. Now that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Go ahead and pause the video, see if you can figure this one out on your own. Um, to me, it looks like the cost per message should be multiplied by the number of messages, right? And let me let me run it like this so that we can see. Doris spent 4.02 on text messages today. Four messages, that doesn't make sense, right? For four messages, she should not be billed $4.02 if each message only costs two cents. So I'm gonna go ahead and change that to a multiply. I would expect eight cents. Yep, Dora spent eight cents on text messages today. Cool, gonna go ahead and submit that. This is one of my favorite XKCD comics. Uh, you can pause and read it uh, really quick if you'd like. 
slow and resource expensive compilation times are a really terrible thing to work with. I've worked on systems in Java and C++ that took over an hour to compile the code. That means that if we find a bug and we want to deploy it to production, even if we get the bug fixed within five minutes, it's still going to take an hour just to build the new production version so that we can deploy it on our servers. I've personally never worked on a Go program that's taken more than just a couple of seconds to build and compile. So the first question is, Go code generally runs blank than interpreted languages and compiles blank than other compiled languages like C and Rust. So the answer is going to be faster and faster, right? It runs faster than inter most interpreted languages and it compiles faster than most compiled languages. So the question on this one is, does Go generally execute faster than Rust? The answer is going to be no. So I've thrown around this word compilation or compiled a few times, but we haven't really talked about what it means. When we write code, we write it in a human readable format, right? Typically in a file, in the case of Go, a .go file, right? Maybe main.go. And this file is going to contain human readable text, right? Go code that we as developers work on. The thing is, your computer's hardware doesn't know what any of that human-readable text means. Your computer's CPU only understands binary, right? Which is ones and zeros, right? Which, at the end of the day, is just numbers, right? But it's just numbers and simple operations, things like add and subtract. So we need some process that we can use to convert human-readable code to machine code that can be executed by the computer's hardware. And that's all that compilation is. Compilation is just the process of taking some human readable code, right? Go code in our instance, and converting it to binary or machine code that our computer can actually understand. So what does this process actually look like? Well, normally you'd start by writing your Go program. So say main.go and you'd run it through the Go compiler. On your command line, you'd type go build. And that would produce a new file, which is the executable program. Let's say we were doing a hello world, a hello world program. It might be hello world.exe, right? An executable program on your computer. And then you could run that executable directly on your operating system without ever having to use the Go tool chain again. So the great thing is you can take this hello world.exe program and give it to someone else and they can run it on their computer without ever having to install the Go tool chain or even know that you used Go to build the program in the first place. This is different than languages like Python where if you want to run someone's Python code, you have to use the Python interpreter every single time and you run the source code, you run the source code directly on your machine. It's also worth pointing out that part of the reason that compiling is so much faster at runtime is that we do all of this compiling work up front. So when we go to run the executable, we don't have to do any conversions from human readable text to binary machine code. That's different than how interpreted languages work. With an interpreted language, as we run the program, the interpreter is reading the human code and kind of at runtime converting it to machine code that the CPU can operate on. So you might be wondering, where is the compiling happening here on boot dev? Well, we actually do the compiling and the running at the same time for you. So when you click the run button, um, we're actually taking your code, shipping it off to our servers, compiling it, running it, and giving you the result. Don't worry, when we get down the road to the actual project, you'll be building and running your own Go code on your own machine. But we can see the difference between a compiler error and a runtime error even here on boot dev. So for example, um, here in this code, the assignment says, to pass this exercise, fix the compiler error in the code. So I'm just gonna run it as is. And you'll see we get this nasty error here and it says main.go, right, line six, syntax error. This is actually a compile time error. So we weren't even able to compile this code. It didn't fail at runtime, it failed at compile time, right? Which again, that distinction will become more clear a little bit later. So anyways, um, we can fix it by adding that close parenthesis that was missing. And now it compiles and runs just fine. 
So to review, Go code, like this little Go program here that prints Hello World, that's not understood directly by the hardware on your computer. Your computer's processor or your computer's CPU understands machine code. So we need to take our human readable Go code, run it through the Go compiler to produce the machine code that we can run directly on our CPU, right? The CPU is designed by the manufacturer to run a specific format of binary. Cool, so the question for this exercise is, do computer processors understand English instructions like open the browser? No, processors are not chat GPT. Uh, they need machine code. Now, we touched on this very briefly before, but I want to talk about how you distribute a compiled program versus how you would distribute an interpreted program. So let's say that you'd written a script in Python. So you've got this script main.py, right? This is raw Python code. And you want to give it to your friend so that they can run your script. Well, all you would do with an interpreted language is give your friend the main.py file, and then on their computer, they would run the command python main.py, and they'd be able to run your code. Now, there are a couple of downsides to this approach. The first problem is that your friend needs to have Python installed on their computer. So you, your, your friend being able to use your program is dependent on them already having Python installed, it's even dependent on them knowing how to use it or knowing how to use a command line, right? So distributing the programs of interpreted languages can be tricky because it's really only useful if you're distributing to other developers who know how to use these tools already. The other problem is the code itself. Let's say you spent you know, many weeks writing this Python script and it's super useful and you're trying to sell it to customers, if you just give them your Python code, I mean, they effectively own it, they can change it. Even if you didn't intend for it to be open source, congratulations, it's now open source. The problem is you can't really allow someone to use your program without giving them all of the special sauce that makes it work. Let's review how this works in a language like Go. So in Go, we'd start the same way. Right? We'd write some human readable Go code in a file called main.go. But instead of giving that file to our friend, we're going to compile it first. We're going to compile it. We'd use the Go tool chain. So we'd write something like go build in our command line. And that would produce a new executable file. Right? So this is, this is machine code here. Um, let's just say that the name of our program is hello world. Why not? So if we're on Windows, it might be hello world.exe, right? So when you go online and you download a program to use, say it's a video game, um, it is probably a bundle of machine code. It is a built binary, right? In order to run your favorite video game, let's say StarCraft II or World of Warcraft, you don't need to install the C++ compiler, right? You're just given the built kind of final product, the final executable program. And that's what we're doing in uh, the Go programming language as well. So now we can give our friend this executable. They don't need to install Go and they do not need access to the original source code. So generally speaking, distributing programs that are natively compiled is much, much easier um, than distributing programs that kind of have a runtime dependency like an interpreter. So to answer the question for this exercise, do users of compiled programs need access to the source code? No, they don't. And a related question, which language is interpreted? We've got Go, C++, Python, and Rust. And the answer is Python. The rest are all compiled. So now the question is, why is it generally more simple to deploy a compiled server-side program or back-end application? And the answers are compiled code is more memory efficient because Docker exists, there are no runtime language dependencies, or because compiled code is faster. Well, it's just the same as what we talked about earlier. Um, when we deploy to a server, say on the cloud, uh, we have to have all of the dependencies uh, that our backend application needs in order to run installed on that server. And if there are no runtime dependencies, if all we need is a compiled binary, then that's arguably the simplest way to do it. 
right? So the answer is it's more simple to deploy a comp to deploy a compiled program to a backend server if there are no runtime language dependencies, things like the Python interpreter or the Node.js interpreter, for example. Go is strongly typed and statically typed. And that's a really good thing. If you've been paying any attention at all to the JavaScript world, you'll notice that a lot of JavaScript developers are making the switch to TypeScript, and that's primarily to get access to static typing. A lot goes into typing and type systems, but one of the biggest benefits of a static type system like Go's is that when we declare a string, right? Like say this username string that I've set equal to Wags Lane, we can't later accidentally change it to an integer, a number, right? Like a float 64. Um, it's going to stay a string. The nice thing about a static type system like we have with Go or that you have with TypeScript is that we get feedback on our errors uh, much more quickly, right? Rather than finding out about a bug when our code is running in production, we find out about the bug, say, when we compile our code. Let's move on to the assignment. So the assignment says we'll be using basic authentication for the text.io API. So basic authentication is, is just this format here where you've got a username and a password um, in an HTTP header. It tells the server on each individual request to the server who you are, right? It's kind of like logging in. Um, or rather, it's kind of like being logged in. Okay, uh, so the code on the right has a type error. Change the type of password to a string. Okay, cool. So I'm just gonna run it to see the type error first. So invalid operation, username plus colon plus password has mismatched types of string in it. Now, this is a compile time error. We, we weren't even able to compile this code, right? Let alone run it in production. Um, so we've been instructed in the assignment, change the type of password to a string, but use the same numeric value so that it can be concatenated with the username variable. Okay, cool. So I'm just gonna change this to a string by surrounding it in double quotes. That's how you do strings in Go. Pretty similar to other languages. And then I'm just gonna change that type to a string type and run it again. Authorization, basic, wags lane, colon, number. That looks good to me. When we're talking about the performance of a programming language or an application, we really care about how it performs across two different axes. One is speed, how fast it can do computations, right? Which is kind of measured in CPU cycles. And then we also have memory consumption, which is just how bloaty the program is, how much data it has to store in memory to be able to do those computations. Every program you write, no matter the language, is going to be using memory. Every time you create a new variable, it allocates space in memory where it can store that variable's data. Now, in languages like Rust or C, memory management is effectively manual. Now, that said, Rust does have some nice tooling that kind of takes care of it for you at compile time, so it's not quite as error prone um, as, as it would be in C or C++. But at the end of the day, your program is allocating memory, right? It's saying, this chunk of memory I'm going to use, I'm going to store some variable data here in this bit of RAM. And then later your program says, I'm not using it anymore, um, so we can free it up for use by other programs. Now, let's jump over to Java. So with Java, it's a little bit different. Um, Java is a garbage collected language, garbage collection, which essentially means that memory management is automated. And in Java, it's done by the Java virtual machine. So every time you run a Java program, you're actually creating an entire mini virtual machine that your Java bytecode runs within. So this is the JVM. And then you kind of insert your code into the JVM and you run your code in there. And the JVM is what takes care of allocating and freeing all of the memory that you use. And this creates overhead. Basically, at the end of the day, Java programs use quite a bit more memory than Rust or C programs. Go is in an interesting sort of in-between world where Go is a garbage collected language like Java. So it has automated, automated memory management, but it does not have a JVM. When you compile Go code, rather than having to run it within a JVM, just like with Rust and C, you get one binary 
or one executable program. The difference is that Go includes a runtime, a runtime within every single binary that's built using the Go programming language. So we could think of it as something like this. It's kind of like a little sidecar that is compiled alongside your code. So your Go program basically has this, this little bit of extra code that's added to it. And that bit of code is what handles garbage collection and automated memory management. So it's a little more bloaty than what you'd get with Rust and C, right? It is garbage collected, um, but it's not nearly as um, expensive in terms of memory overhead as a language like Java or C Sharp. Let's take a look at what some actual numbers look like. I pulled this chart from Dexter Darwick's uh, blog, and if you're following along on BootDev, you can click the link to go check out the full, the full blog and the description of this experiment. But basically, he built a RESTful web server in three different programming languages, right? In Java, Go, and Rust, and then me measured the memory consumption. And when the servers were just at rest, effectively doing nothing and waiting for requests to come in, Rust used less than half of the memory that Go was using, and Go used 100 times less memory, right, measured in megabytes, than the JVM was using to run the REST service. So to order the three languages in terms of memory efficiency, I would say Java is the least efficient, uh, Go is in the middle, and Rust would be the most memory efficient. And it's also worth pointing out, just really quickly, that as the load on the server increases, I would expect Go to have more similar performance to Java. In other words, we wouldn't see as quite a large discrepancy here, right? Go would likely still be more memory efficient than Java, almost certainly, in fact, um, but it probably wouldn't be a 100x discrepancy. We're seeing this huge discrepancy um, mostly because this is an idle, uh, a test of an idle program. So generally speaking, which language uses more memory? That's going to be Java. Another question on the same topic is what's one of the purposes of the Go runtime? So to style Go code and make it easier to read, that doesn't make sense. That would be like compile time tooling, right? Not runtime tooling. To clean up unused memory, to cook fried chicken, or to compile Go code. So it's definitely going to be to clean up unused memory. And if you remember, the runtime is just that little bit of extra code that's included in every compiled Go program that among other things, handles memory management. So we've already talked about how Go has strong and static types, but we haven't yet talked about what those types are. You're probably already familiar with Boolean values and string values, which are valid Go types and also exist in pretty much every other programming language. Um, numbers are where it first starts to get a little bit different uh, if Go is your first compiled programming language. Generally speaking, numbers fall into four different buckets. We have integers, unsigned integers, or uints, floats, and complex numbers. Integers are just whole numbers. They can be positive or negative, right? One, two, three, four, uh, you get the idea. Unsigned integers are the same as integers, but they're not signed, which basically just means they don't have a negative component. You can only represent positive numbers in an unsigned integer. You're probably already familiar with the idea of floats. It's just fractional numbers, right? Numbers that have a fractional component. Things like 1.21 or 3.14. Complex numbers are a little funny. They're used to represent the concept of imaginary numbers. If you've gotten to imaginary numbers in your math studies. I've never actually used complex numbers um, in production. I'm sure there are plenty of use cases for them, but we're not gonna go into detail on how they work here. You can certainly go read up on it if you'd like. The only other thing worth mentioning is that size matters when it comes to types. A uint8 and a uint16 are two different types. They both represent unsigned integers, but a uint16 has twice as much room for data within it. It has 16 bits of data, whereas a uint8 only has eight bits. For example, the largest number that you can store in a uint8 is 255, because that's the largest number you can represent with eight ones and zeros in binary. But with a uint16, the largest number you can store is about 65,000. Again, because that's the biggest number that can be represented by 16 binary digits. 
Just like bigger number, better person, uh, bigger number in your types means you can represent more possible values uh, within that type. So float 64 can represent more values than a float 32. The only reason you wouldn't use a larger type is if you're trying to save on memory. If you're trying to write a program that is hyper-performant, you'll want to use a smaller size. Right. If you know that an integer is only ever going to store three different values, say one, two, or three, then you might consider using a uint8. The byte type is an interesting one, and it's one that you'll use a lot, especially when you're, say, marshalling a JSON object um, to be sent across a network connection, or maybe you're reading to and from a file on disk. Um, but under the hood, a byte is just an alias for the uint8 type, which makes sense, right? A byte is just eight binary digits, eight bits. And that's all a uint8 is. A rune is a Unicode code point, which generally speaking, you can think of as one character in a string, and that's usually how it's used. Under the hood, it's just an alias for the int32 type. Moving on to the assignment, it says initialize the given variables to int, float64, bool, and string respectively with their zero values. And um, as we can see here, if we just use var, the name of the variable and the type, that should do it. So we'll initialize the variables here. So var SMS sending limit is an int. Var cost per SMS is a float 64. Has, has permission is a bool. And username is a string. Okay, cool. And all, so all of these variables are now instantiated and should contain their zero value. So for example, zero, uh, 0, 0, false, and empty string. So let's go ahead and run that. And that looks correct to me. I'm gonna go ahead and submit it. We've been declaring variables the hard way. Now we're going to do it the easy way. There is an operator in Go, colon equals, that is the short assignment operator. And it allows us to declare variables and have Go infer their type. So instead of typing var empty string, we can just say empty colon equals the empty string and Go knows that this has to be a string. So it is a string. Now, when we use this short assignment operator, we're not saying this is a loose type that can change in the future. It's still a static type. Empty is a string just like it would be if we declared it this way. In reality, in Go, you will very rarely see variables declared like this. You will almost always see them declared using the short, the short assignment operator. For example, numcars colon equals 10 creates a new variable called numcars and sets it equal to 10, and its type will be inferred to be an int. And the int type alias is either int32 or int64, depending on your computer's architecture. If you want to specify a particular size of integer, then you would declare it using this kind of longhand syntax. So in this assignment, we're just meant to declare a variable named congrats with the value happy birthday using a short variable declaration. So as simple as congrats colon equals the string happy birthday. Let me run that. Perfect. This next assignment says our current price to send a text message in Textio is two cents. However, it's likely in the future that the price will have to be a fraction of a penny or have a fractional part to the cost. So we should use a float 64 to store this value. Edit the pennies per text declaration so that it's inferred by the compiler to be a float 64. Okay, cool. So here we're just setting it equal to two. If I run that. Then I get the type of pennies per text is int. And this percent %t in Go um, is, is a formatting verb that, that tells the Go programming language, or, or at least the printf function, I should say the formatting package from the standard library, um, that I want to print the type of this variable rather than its value. So that's why we're seeing int there instead of two. Um, to get a float, all we need to do is change it from two to 2.0, I believe. 64. Cool. Another handy syntactic quirk of the Go programming language is that we can declare multiple values on the same line. So in this assignment, it says declare a float called average open rate and a string called display message on the same line. Okay, so average open rate, display message, same line. The average open rate 
um, must be 0.23. And the display message should be the string is the average open rate of your message. And then it looks like this is just going to print them together. So it's going to say 0.23 is the average open rate. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and run that. 0.023 is the average open rate of your messages. That looks correct to me. So we've already briefly talked about the different type sizes in Go, right? So we have the int type, int 8, int 16, int 32, and int 64. And it's important to understand that the int type just aliases int 32 or int 64. Um, same with the uint type, just depending on your CPU's architecture. So you might be on a 32 or a 64-bit machine. Most modern machines are going to be 64 bits. My recommendation is that unless you have an explicit reason to care about the size, right? So unless you're trying to kind of hyper optimize for performance, then you should really just stick to these four types, int, uint, float64, and again, if you're working with imaginary numbers, then complex128, but that's honestly unlikely. So these three types are going to do the vast majority of the heavy lifting when it comes to working with numbers in Go. We can also convert numbers between you know, different number types. For example, we could take a, an integer, 88, and convert it to a float like this. So it'd become 88.0, right? Um, converting the other way is a little trickier though, because say we had 88.6, if we were to convert it to an int, we would lose the 0.6. We would truncate it down to just 88. Now, this assignment says, our TextAU customers want to know how long they've had accounts with us. Follow the instructions in the comment provided. You will create a new variable called account age int that will be the truncated integer version of account age. Okay, cool. So create a new account age int here. Should be the result of casting account age to an integer. So we'll just do int account age. And I would expect that to be two after casting it because it should truncate the 0.6. So let's go ahead and run that. Your account has existed for two years. Yeah, that looks good to me. We already briefly touched on this, but it's worth mentioning again. I recommend that you stick to the, I call them the default types. So for example, we know there's um, you know five or six, I can't think of it off the top of my head now, different types of ints, right? Int, int eight, int 16, int 32, int 64. I'd recommend sticking to int unless you have a very good reason to specify a smaller size like int 8 or int 32. And that's simply so you avoid cluttering your code with tons of type conversions that can sometimes even lead to bugs. So unless you need a smaller type for performance reasons, just use these default types. Okay, so the question for this assignment is, when should you elect to not use a default type? when either a default or a specific size will work, when my system has lots of extra hardware that I want to utilize, or when performance and memory are the primary concern. So it's gonna be performance. If you have performance concerns, that's the time I would maybe stray away from the default types. The next question is, what does the size of a type indicate? So a float 64, what does 64 mean? Is it bits, bytes, or nibbles? Uh, the answer is going to be bits. Now, it is worth pointing out, nibbles is a real thing. So a byte is eight bits, a nibble is actually four bits, if you didn't know that. Fun, interesting trivia. Aside from variables, Go also supports constants, which are immutable values. Um, and in Go, just like in JavaScript or TypeScript, we use the const keyword, and constants do not support the short declaration syntax. So we have to kind of write it all out. Okay, so getting to the assignment says, use two separate constants. Something weird is happening in this code. What should be happening is that we create two separate constants, premium plan name and basic plan name. Right now it looks like we're trying to overwrite one of them. Okay, cool. So on line six, we've got premium plan name and we're setting it to premium plan. And then we have premium plan name again, attempting to override the value and set it to a new string. If we try to run this, we actually get a compile time error. So we're not allowed to mutate constants in Go. So what we should be doing is creating a separate constant and it should be named basic plan name. Let's go ahead and run that. Plan, premium plan, plan, basic plan. Looks good to me. 
Constants in Go are not the same as constants in JavaScript and in TypeScript. In JavaScript and TypeScript, the const keyword really just means you can't reassign to this variable, but you can compute the variable or the variable's value at runtime. In Go, every value that's stored in a constant must be known or computed at compile time before the program runs. So if we create this new constant called my int and set it equal to 15, within the compiled Go binary, effectively this symbol, my int, just refers to the static number 15. The cool thing is that we can actually compute constants, like we can make constants that depend on other constants, but that computation will run when we compile our code, not when we run our code. So for example, um, I can create this constant first name, Lane, last name, Wagner, and then I can create a new constant called full name. It's first name plus a space plus a last name. And that's really convenient in case I ever want to change first name. Uh, now I don't have to change it in two places, right? Full name will automatically update. But this is only valid because all of the inputs to this full name constant, first name and last name, are known at compile time. So the compiler can still do the thing it wants to do, which is replace full name with a static string, right? Lane space Wagner. So onto the assignment. It says keeping track of time in a message sending application like Textio is critical. Imagine getting an appointment reminder an hour after your doctor's visit. Not very helpful, right? Complete the code using a computed constant to print the number of seconds in an hour. Okay. So we've got the number of seconds in a minute is 60. The number of minutes in an hour is also 60. So how many seconds are in an hour? Cool, well, we could hard code this as like 60 times 60. But the cool thing is we can actually compute it because we can say, well, we know the minutes, the number of minutes in an hour, and we know the number of seconds in a minute. And if we multiply those two together, we should get the number of seconds in an hour. That looks correct to me. So I'm obviously a huge Go fan, but formatting strings in Go is honestly one of my least favorite features of the language. I think it's one of its weaknesses at the moment. Who knows? Maybe it'll improve in the future. The way it's done, well, we essentially have two different functions provided to us by the standard library. We have printf and sprintf. Printf prints a formatted string directly to standard out, and sprintf just returns the formatted string as a value. Basically, all string formatting in Go currently works the same way. We have these formatting verbs, things like percent %v, percent %s, percent %d, and they're replaced in the string template with actual values. So for example, I am percent %v years old. The percent %v in this case is replaced by 10, the first parameter uh, that comes after the template in the printf function. Here we could also replace with a string instead of an integer, right? I am percent %v years old, way too many. Prints I am way too many years old. Percent %v is sort of the default formatter. It's usually what you want. Assume you don't want to print in kind of the default standard way using percent %v, then there are a few others. Um, percent %s interpolates a string, percent %d interpolates an integer in decimal form. So for example, 10 becomes the number 10 instead of say in binary form. Uh, percent %s is for floats, so you can specify the number of kind of places after the decimal point uh, that you want printed out to the console or printed out to the returned string in the case of s printf. Um, so I actually do end up using percent %f fairly regularly when I'm working with floats. So onto the assignment. It says create a new variable called MSG on line nine. MSG stands for message, of course. Um, it's a string that contains the following. Hi name, your open rate is open rate percent, where a name is the given name and open rate is the open rate rounded to the nearest tenths place. Okay, so the tenths place is the number right after the decimal. So let's get started here. Message colon equals fmt dot sprintf. So we're gonna use sprintf instead of printf because we don't want this value going to standard out. We want it returned from the function. So we can save it in the msg variable. Let's just grab this template. So we'll use percent %s. We could use percent %s or percent %v here because we're just uh, interpolating a string. 
and we'll do percent um, 0.1 F because we want to just print the first number after the, def the decimal point, right? The tenths place. Okay, and then we just pass the two values as the following parameters or as the last two parameters. So name and open rate. All right, so the first value name will go into the first verb. The second value will go into the second verb. Let's run that, see what we get. Hi, Saul Goodman, your open rate is 30.5%. That looks good to me. Let's talk about conditionals in Go. So a conditional is just where we are checking if a condition is true. If it is, we do one thing. If it's not, we may do another. So for example, uh, here's an if statement in Go. And if this expression evaluates to true, then we'll run the stuff within the curly braces, the body of the if statement. If you're familiar with other programming languages like JavaScript, this is um, a very, very similar syntax. The only difference is we're not surrounding the height is greater than four section with um, parentheses. So again, to be clear, this bit between the if keyword and the curly brace um, will be evaluated. And if it evaluates to true, then the stuff inside the curly braces will be executed. Um, so in this case, we have the variable height and we're using the greater than operator um, to compare it to the number four. So if height is greater than four, then we'll print you are tall enough. I've sort of listed um, some of the different comparison operators uh, down here at the bottom. They are basically identical to pretty much every other programming language you will uh, probably have used uh, up to this point. Additionally, we can do different things um, if the if statement does not evaluate to true. So this is a perfectly valid if statement. You do not need an else if or an else block. They are they're optional effectively. Um, but the way it works is when we get to this code, uh, basically we'll, we'll uh, compare height to six, right? And if that expression evaluates to true, then we'll just print you are super tall and we'll be done, okay? Otherwise, if that expression evaluates to false, then we'll drop down into this next if else, or sorry, else if statement, and we'll compare height to four. If height is greater than four, then we'll print you are tall enough. And again, we'll be done at that point. So if this evaluates to true, we execute this um, kind of section of code between the curly braces, and at that point we'll be done. Otherwise, if that's also false, so if height is not greater than six and height is not greater than four, then the else statement executes. Notice the else statement does not have its own expression. It just kind of always executes if all of the if and else if statements um, turned out to be false. So let's jump into the assignment. It says, fix the bug on line 12. The if statement should print message sent if the message length is less than or equal to the max message length or message not sent otherwise. Okay, cool. So up here, we've defined two variables. Uh, message length is 10, max message length is 20. Um, and then here we're gonna do some comparing. Let me just run the code in its current state. It says trying to send a message of length 10 and a max length of 20. Message not sent. Okay, so that seems problematic, right? Because with a message length of 10 and a max message length of 20, I should be able to send that message. So the bug on line 12, I think we just need to flip this operator to be less than or equal to, so that now this expression, right? Message length less than or equal to max message length should evaluate to true because it is message length is in fact smaller. Okay, let's run that. Message sent, that seems to work. It's worth pointing out that in Go, we also have kind of an alternate way to write if statements. If the variable that we are comparing in an if statement is only used in that if statement, then this syntax can be helpful. Okay, so here's kind of the traditional way of doing something. We would create a variable called length. Let's just assume it's an integer. You can kind of forget um, this function syntax for now. We'll talk about it um, in a future chapter. But basically the idea here is we have a length variable. It's an integer, right? And we're initializing it here. We're creating the variable here. Um, and then we're comparing it against one, right? We're checking if it's less than one. And if it is, we're doing something. In this case, we're printing that the email is invalid. 
Well, instead of this syntax, and by the way, this works perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with uh, doing it this way. Um, but we can alternately do it this way, which is basically to initialize that length variable in the if block within that first kind of initial statement. So notice there's two statements here um, separated by a semicolon. And in the first one, we're creating that length variable. And then we're moving the comparison itself kind of after the semicolon. And then if that condition obviously uh, evaluates to true, then we'll um, execute the block. This does kind of two things for us. First, it saves us a line of code, um, which I would argue probably isn't the biggest benefit in the world. Um, but more importantly, uh, it makes it so that this length variable is only accessible within uh, kind of the scope of this if block. So kind of down underneath this code, we wouldn't be able to use the length uh, variable anymore, which is kind of nice if you never intended to use it in the first place. You can kind of think of this as a clean code hack or like a um, kind of safety hack um, to ensure that the length variable is never reused down below in other code when you never intended it to be reused. Okay, so uh, the question for this assignment is, why would you use the initial section of an if statement? Uh, and the answers are to confuse other programmers, to keep the code concise and the scope limited, or to speed up your code. Um, the answer is going to be to keep the code more concise and to, again, limit the scope that that variable um, exists within. Like other programming languages, Go supports functions. Functions are basically just a way to break up your code into individual units that are easier to reason about, right? A function takes in a specified number of inputs and it returns a specified number of outputs. For example, this subtract function here named sub takes two inputs, x, an integer, and y, an integer, and it returns a single integer. In this case, it just performs the simple calculation x minus y and then returns the result to the caller. Now, this little bit right here, right, func sub, x integer, y integer, returns integer, is what's known as the function signature. If you've never heard that term before, it's basically just a description of what the function does in terms of its types, in terms of its inputs and its outputs and what types they are, right? This basically says this is a function called sub, it takes an integer x and an integer y and returns another integer. Function signatures are great because they tell us how we can use the functions. Really, at the end of the day, if we're the person calling the function or the person using the function, really all we care about is what we need to give the function as inputs and what we get out of the function in terms of its outputs. So a function signature basically tells us all we need to know about a function to be able to use it. It omits all of the implementation details, the stuff with, within the curly brackets or within the body of the function. So let's get on to the assignment. Assignment says, we often need to manipulate strings in our messaging app. That makes sense, right? We're working with SMS and email uh, messages within Textio, so we're doing a lot of textual data manipulation. The concat function should take two strings as inputs and smash them together, right? So returning a new string that is a concatenation of the inputs. For example, hello plus world equals hello world. So we'd expect to return this concatenated string from our concat function over here. Fix the function the function signature of concat to reflect its behavior. Okay, cool. So let me try running this and just see what happens. Looks like undefined S1, undefined S2, undefined S1. Okay, so these are undefined. And so S1 and S2, that kind of stands for string one, string two. That makes sense. The problem here is that we're not, we're not telling Go what the types of the inputs should be. And this plus operator when operating on strings just concatenates, so that should work. Let's go ahead and run that. Yeah, this looks good to me. I want to just make one more point about function signatures in Go. You'll notice that the type comes after the name of the variable. So S1 is a string, S2 is a string. And that's just to make it a little easier to read. The authors of the Go programming language kind of built on uh, a lot of the ideas from C, and in C it was the reverse. It was string S1, string S2, and it, that just kind of reads a little clunky if you're used to kind of speaking in plain English. It makes more sense for the type to kind of come after um, what it describes. 
Go provides another bit of interesting syntactic sugar when it comes to function signatures. When multiple arguments are of the same type, in this case x and y, the inputs to the add function are both integers, um, the type only needs to be declared on the last one, assuming that they're in order, right? So in this case, this is valid Go code and x and y are both integers. Because they follow one another, we can put the integer um, just after the y. If we were going to add, say, a string as a third parameter, uh, to this function, then we would just add a comma here after int and put, you know, name, string, or or whatever. Um, this is just a bit of syntactic sugar. Uh, it makes our code a little less verbose. You don't need to do this. You can explicitly put the type on every input and output, but you will often see code like this. It's a convenient shorthand. So we've got these two um, example snippets of code. Funk create user, first name, string, last name, string, age, int, and funk create user, first name, last name, string, age, int. So which of the following is the most succinct way to write a function signature? Succinct is just another word for kind of, uh, it's, I guess it's the opposite of verbose, right? L fewer, fewer words. Um, it's going to be the one that uses the syntactic sugar, which is this one, because we're omitting the string keyword after first name. So we already talked about this briefly, the idea that in Go, we specify the type of a variable after the variable name. And this is, you know, different from kind of the C style way of doing things, which if you were to declare a variable Y in C, you would say int Y. And really the authors of the Go programming language just felt that that didn't flow naturally from English. It's not the way we talk, right? We say X is an integer, not integer is X. If you want to read up on that decision and why they ended up uh, choosing that style, then uh, you can follow this link here, assuming you're following along on boot dev. So the question is, what are we talking about when we discuss this declaration syntax, right? This, this swapping of the name and the type. Um, and here are options, the decision about Campbell case versus snake case, um, the style of language used to create new variables, types, and functions guard clauses versus if else, no, the ever important question of tabs versus spaces. No, it's gonna be the style of language used to create new variables, types, and functions. Related question is which languages declaration syntax reads like English from right to left? C or Go, the answer is gonna be Go. Go supports functions as data, or basically the idea that you can pass functions around your program uh, to be called in different places callbacks, right? If you're familiar with JavaScript, then you're probably familiar with the idea of a callback. It's a function that you could pass to another function to be called later. This question deals with that idea. Whenever we pass a callback in Go, the type of the function changes based on what its inputs and outputs are. So for example, here, func int 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 is a function that takes two integers as an input and returns an integer. And that's going to be a different type than a function that say took three integers as input and returned an integer. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? If I'm going to pass a function to another function so that it can call it later, it kind of needs to know how many inputs, how many parameters it can pass into that function. If it's a function that takes two inputs versus three inputs, then the caller is going to have to write the code differently. So we have to treat every function signature as its own unique type. So this question's a bit of a doozy. I encourage you to pause the video and try to work this one out on your own. Um, but basically it says, what is this hairy beast here, right? F func func int 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 int. All right, potential answers are a function named F that takes as int, takes an int as the argument and returns an int. Uh, no, it is not nearly that simple, right? A function named f that takes a function and an int as arguments and returns a function. Let's see. Uh, that right there is a full function and an int as arguments and returns a function. No, this returns an int. Okay, a function named f that takes a function and an int as arguments and returns an int. That's what I believe it will be. Function named f that takes a function as the argument and returns an int. Yep, that's not it. So uh, j to be clear, f is a function. It takes two parameters. A function, right? A function of a specific type, a function that takes two ints and returns an int. And as its second parameter, an int. And then f returns an int. 
Hopefully that makes sense. Again, feel free to pause the video and, and stare at that for a second. Let's talk a little bit about memory and how data that we create in our program using variables is stored in memory. So over here, I'll keep track of the memory of our program and over here, I'll write some code. So let's say in our code, we write X colon equals five, right? So we're creating a new variable called X and we're giving it the value, the integer value of five. And then we're placing the value five in that memory, right? Stored as binary data within RAM. Now in our program, X, the symbol is essentially just a pointer. It points to this location in memory. So let's say on the next line of code, we update X and we say X equals two. So now we're reassigning the value of X to two. Now let's try something different. What if we create a new variable called Y and we initialize it to the current value of X, which in this case happens to be two. Well, in this case, we're actually going to allocate a new section of memory to store the value of Y and we'll initialize it to the current value of X, which is two. And the symbol Y now has its own location in memory. So we basically created a copy of X. Now this idea is really important to understand because sometimes in programming, we'll have multiple variables that actually point to the same location in memory. They can overwrite each other. And sometimes we don't. Sometimes we have copies of data, right? So now, for example, if I were to update Y, let's say I made Y equal one. At this point, X would be unaffected. X would remain two, but Y now becomes one, right? Because we have a copy. These two variables, X and Y, reference different locations in memory. So why does all of this matter? Well, in Go, variables are passed by value, not by reference. So let's take a look at this code snippet here. Top of main, we declare a new variable called X, we set it equal to five. And then we pass X into a function called increment. The increment function just adds one to X, right? Making it six. After that, we print X. And the weird thing is, that when we print X here, we still get five. And the reason for that is the increment function was operating on a copy of X. When we pass X in here to increment, increment gets a new copy of X, still equal to five. It increments that X to six. And then because we are not returning it, it essentially just gets thrown away. And then back in main, we still have this same X that's still equal to five. The correct thing to do here would be to have the increment function return X after making its modification. And up in main, we would write X equals increment X so that we could capture the return value from the increment function. So moving on to the assignment, it says it's critical in Textio that we keep track of how many SMS messages we have sent on behalf of our clients, fix the bug to accurately track the number of SMS messages sent. Okay, let me just try running this in its current state. And we're missing a return. Okay, I'm gonna re remove this, this uh, type return there and see what happens. Sent 430 messages. And it looks like here we have sends so far, sends to add, increment sends is doing nothing because sends so far is still printing as 430. Okay, I think I'm understanding. So let me put that back in. The assignment says alter increment sends so that it returns the result after incrementing sends so far. Alter the main function to capture the return value from increment sends and overwrite the previous sends so far value. Okay, cool. So this is pretty similar to the code snippet here. Basically, we need to return an int. So we're going to return sends so far. And then here, we need to reassign sends so far into the result of increment sends. Cool. So Again, here we'll still be operating on copies, but because we're going to return the copy and save it back into the original variable, we should be good to go. Let me run that. 
Yep, you've sent 455 messages. That looks correct. Functions in Go can have multiple return values. And when they do have multiple return values, the syntax for specifying that is just to wrap the return values in parentheses as well. So when there's just a single return value, we do not wrap that return value in parentheses, but when there are multiples, we do wrap them in parentheses. One thing I really like about Go is that it does not allow you to have unused variables. And because it doesn't allow you to have unused variables, and because it allows you to have multiple return values from a function, we kind of need a way to ignore some of the return values because there are definitely instances where a function returns two things, but maybe we only care about one of those things. For example, a point on a graph can be described by its xy coordinates, but maybe all we care about is the x coordinate. So here we can call the get point function and ignore the y value by using an underscore. And it's important to understand that the underscore is not just like a conventional name that we are going to ignore. It's actually ignored. The compiler completely removes it from our code. So moving on to the assignment, here in Textio, we have obviously first names and last names for all of the users that we we're able to send messages to. Well, when we welcome someone to Textio, we don't need their last name. So let me go ahead and try to run this code. And you'll see we'll actually get a compiler error that says last name declared and not used. Like I said, Go does not allow us to have unused variables, which I think is kind of an awesome uh, little bit of the tooling. It helps keep our code very clean and concise, easy to understand. Um, so we need to explicitly ignore that last name with an underscore if we're not going to use it. Let me try running that again. And that looks good to me. In Go, we can name our return values, and if we do, it actually alters the behavior of the function just a little bit. Let's take a look at this function, get chords or get coordinates. It returns two integers, and we've named the integers x and y. And by naming them, we've actually initialized at the top of the function the, the variables x and y, and they're initialized with their zero values. So in the case of an integer, literally just the number zero for both of them. The other interesting thing about naming our return values is that if we use a naked return statement, a return statement that doesn't explicitly say, for example, return zero comma five, then the values of X and Y are automatically returned from the function. So this version of get coordinates is actually the exact same is this kind of more verbose version of get coordinates, right? Here we have not given the return values the names x and y, and instead we've initialized x and y to their zero values and then returned them explicitly. Now, a couple of recommendations. I would recommend using named returns when you want to document kind of what the intended purpose of each return value is. So for example, if you have a function that just returns three integers, that function signature could be pretty confusing. But if you have a function signature that says it returns three integers and they're named width, height, and length, that's a lot more interesting to the caller of the function. They understand the purpose of each individual return value much better. So I like to think of named return values as basically a built-in way of documenting what the purpose of all of your return values are, and you should generally just use them. On the other hand, this implicit or automatic return that you get along with um, named return values, I would typically advise against. You'd only want to use this in like very short, very simple functions um, because it harms readability, right? And I'm pulling this directly from the tour of Go. They also agree with me. Um, implicit returns or naked return statements, um, generally a little bit harder to understand. So the way I would write this function personally would be get chords, x, y, int, and then I would explicitly return x and y. So let's jump down into the assignment. It says one of our clients likes us to send text messages reminding users of life events coming up. Fix the bug by using named return values in the function signature so the code will compile and run as intended. Okay, cool. So this is the function we are interested in fixing, years until events. Looks like it takes a user's age as input and then returns or should return kind of the number of years until they're an adult, which is 18, the number of years until they can drink, at least in the US, which is 21, and the number of years until they can rent a car, which apparently is 25. Um, 
And it looks like we never want a negative number. So if, if any of these are less than zero, we just set them equal to zero. That makes sense. Once you're over 18, your years until you're an adult are just zero, right? You're already an adult. Okay, let me try running this, see what we get. Okay, undefined years until adult. All right, this makes sense, right? Because there's no colon here, so we're not defining a new variable. And the assignment said to use named return values. So let's go ahead and do that. So years until adult, years until drinking. I'm gonna format this a little better. And we'll do years until car rental. So again, this will declare all of these values with their zero value at the top. And then this naked return statement should return them in order. And just to make sure, adult drinking car rental, adult drinking car rental. Okay, we're in the right order. Let me run that. First test, so four years old, they'll be an adult in 18 years, can drink in 17, can rent a car in 21, that all looks good. 10, it's going down, 22, yep, this looks good to me. So as I mentioned before, explicit returns are probably better than implicit returns in most scenarios. Um, it just makes a lot more sense, right? So here in this function, get chords, x, y, int, so we're using named returns, but we're still explicitly returning x and y. This is how I would recommend writing most of your Go code. Um, this, this function here is doing the same thing, um, it's explicitly returning hard-coded values, though, instead of the variables x and y. And it's just important to understand that this effectively overrides the implicit return of x and y. So in this case, 5 and 6 will be returned. Again, that's why I recommend doing it explicitly, because when you see a return statement that has explicit values being returned, those are the ones that are returned. You don't have to do any guesswork. You don't have to scroll back to the top of the function to see which values are being returned. So now we're going to break that advice just for practice's sake. Um, the assignment says fix the function to return the named values implicitly. Okay, so here we have a problem in our code where we are basically explicitly returning zeros, which as we talked about overrides the implicit return. So my guess is if we look at all of these, yep, every test is returning zeros. If we just re remove that implicit return and run that, and it should work as intended. Yep. And then just to show you what I mean, like what I would recommend doing is this. It's bigger. Like that. That's how I'm gonna recommend doing it. And in fact, because boot dev just checks the output, this should work just fine with our tests. So I'm gonna submit it like this. Moving on to some questions about named returns. So it says, when should naked returns be used? And the answers are for large functions, for small functions, or for complex functions. And I would argue if you're going to use naked returns at all, which honestly I'd kind of just recommend against, then you should only use them for small functions. The more complex and large your functions get, the more important it is to be explicit and readable and document your returns with named returns and things like that. The next question is, when should named returns be used? So when there are many values being returned, when the function is simple, or when there are few parameters being returned. I would argue it's never really a problem to name your return values, but it's really important when there are many values being returned, especially if there are many values of the same type being returned, because then you can you know, essentially tell the caller of your function through your function signature what they should expect each value to represent. Let's talk about one of my favorite programming patterns or programming styles. Um, that is early returns or um, what they're also sometimes called as guard clauses. So an early return or a guard clause is exactly what it sounds like. It's just when we return early from a function. So this function divide if it's past a divisor of zero, then it returns early with an error. Otherwise, it goes ahead and does a kind of the division and returns uh, the results and a nil error. Now, we're going to talk about errors soon. You don't have to worry too much about how they work for now. Um, just understand that a nil error effectively means no error. So when we're looking at this divide function, we can understand that if the divisor is zero, we're going to return early 
and, and it would basically say we can't do this division because we can't divide by zero. Um, otherwise, we'll take the happy path towards the end of the function. Best practices when it comes to software engineering and how we write code change all the time, right? There's millions of developers all around the world writing code, and we all have different opinions. And kind of the uh, the common opinion about a certain style tends to change over time. Um, the interesting thing is, I think that these days, um, guard clauses and early returns are kind of looked at as a good thing. Um, this is clean code, right? This is a good way to write code. Certainly, most Go programmers think this way. Um, but it wasn't always that way. Um, there used to kind of be a heuristic that uh, developers used, which was you shouldn't ever return from a function in more than one place. So back when that was kind of the more popular way of doing things, you'd get kind of nasty if-else nested statements like this. Um, if you look at this function, get insurance amount basically takes a status as input, it returns an integer, and it only has one return statement. So it only returns from one place. But I would argue that doesn't necessarily make this function all that much easier to understand, right? We're initializing a variable up at the top amount, and then just in this big, nasty, nested if-else chain, we're kind of reassigning the value of amount uh, based on some conditional logic. Now, compare that with guard clauses. Right, so with guard clauses, instead of overwriting the variable amount and then returning it at the end of the function, we're just returning early with the proper amount at each step of the way. Now, both of these functions do the exact same thing. They have the same behavior, um, but I would argue that the one with the guard clauses is much easier to understand. So the question for this exercise is which is true? Guard clauses are unreadable, guard clauses are generally worse than nested if-else statements, or guard clauses provide a linear approach to logic trees. Okay, so it's definitely not um, these two, right? So I'm, I'm going to go with uh, provide a linear approach to logic trees. And really, all that means is rather than having to follow kind of a tree structure to look at conditional logic, we can just follow a straight line, right? Is it this? No, we move on. Is it this? No, we can move on, right? It, it allows us to break up kind of the cognitive load when we're, when we're reading code. So definitely a linear approach there. The next question is, what is a guard clause? So a bitwise or operation, an and operation in Boolean logic, or an early return from a function when a given condition is met? And it is an early return. Let's talk about structs. So structs are the first collection type that we're going to talk about in this course. A collection type is just a type that contains other types. In the case of a struct, a struct is just a collection of key value pairs. If you're familiar with Python dictionaries or JavaScript object literals, this is basically the same idea. So for example, we can define a car struct and we can say a car has a make, a model, a height, and a width. And each of those fields has its own associated type. So let's move on to the assignment. I think looking at the code is going to be the easiest way to understand structs. Okay, complete the message to send struct definition. It needs two fields, phone number and integer and message a string. And um, on these exercises, I always recommend kind of going and looking at the test suite. This is all the code. The way boot dev works, like all the code is here. Um, and we're really just testing standard output to see if you got the right answer. So you can see literally everything that's going on. Um, so here you can see where a message to send is going to be instantiated with phone numbers and messages. And here you can see where um, it's the uh, if fields are going to be accessed with the dot operator. So let me go ahead and run it in its current state. Um, we should get, yep, a compile time error where it's saying a message is undefined, phone number is undefined, right? So we need to add those to the definition. All right, phone number, integer, message, string. Let's go ahead and run that. And sending message, love to have you aboard to that big number. Okay, that looks good to me. Struct keys can hold any type, uh, not just primitive types like integers, strings, and booleans. Um, here you can see we've actually nested the wheel struct within the car struct, right? So we have the car struct from the last example, and we've added a front wheel and a back wheel, and they are each of type wheel. Right? And a wheel has a radius and a material. So we can actually nest structs within other structs. And then we also saw this just a little bit in the last assignment, but this is how we can instantiate a new instance of a struct, right? So 
This is the struct definition. We're saying this is what a car looks like. And then here we've created a new empty car called my car. And when you create it kind of with those empty, uh, those empty brackets, all of the fields inside of the struct will just be initialized to their default values, their zero values, right? So strings will be empty strings, ints will be zero. And then here we're using the dot operator to access fields, right? So my car dot front wheel, right? So we're accessing the front wheel key and then dot radius to access, access the radius within the front wheel and we're setting it equal to five. Again, with this syntax stuff, it's just best to get hands on keyboard and jump right into it. So let's get to the assignment. It says Textio has a bug. We've been sending texts with information missing. Before we send text messages in Textio, we should check to make sure the required fields have non-zero values. Notice that both the user struct, so that's this here, is a nested struct, or, or notice that the user struct is a nested struct within message to send. Okay, so message to send has a message, which is a string, and then a sender and a recipient, and both of those are of type user. Okay, that makes sense. A user is the sender, a user is the recipient, and then there is a message. Cool. Complete the send the can send message function. Okay. It should only return true if the sender and recipient fields each contain a name and a number. If any of the default zero values are present, return false instead. Okay. Cool. So can send message. This is essentially a function that's going to validate a message to send to see if it actually has data inside of it. So um, if I run the code right now. It's always returning true, right? So you have an appointment tomorrow, you have an event tomorrow. I'm Susie Saul. Ah, see, there's a phone number missing there. That's a problem. Looks like there's a phone number missing there. That's a problem. Okay, let's see. So sender and recipients contain a name and a number. So if m to send dot Sender and recipient sender container name and number dot name is empty or false. All right? And then if ems dot is gonna be recipient is empty, also return false. So we're just gonna do some guard clauses here. And then sender and recipient, and now we're interested in the number. Number is an integer, so if it's zero. Cool. So we're just, we're just basically doing a, a very simple validation to make sure um, that names aren't blank and numbers are not blank. So let me run that. Okay, so this one has all the information there and it's sent. Now this one has a number missing, can't send message. That looks correct. Okay, this is looking good to me. All right, next up we have anonymous structs. So anonymous structs are just struct instances that don't have a name. So uh, whenever you create a new anonymous struct in Go, you're, you're immediately instantiating a struct of a given type, right? The type of the struct doesn't have a name. So for example, here we have a struct with a make and a model. Now in the exercise previous, we remember we actually had this same exact struct but we'd given it a name. The name was car, right? Here, we haven't created a new struct definition. We haven't created a new struct definition called car. Instead, we're immediately instantiating a new instance of a struct called my car. This could be named anything, right? And it just has a make and a model field on it. So the only reason you would use an anonymous struct is if you have no reason to create more than one instance of the struct. So to be clear about what's happening here, we're creating a new variable called my car, and it has two fields. It's a struct with two fields, make and model, and we're immediately giving it a value of make Tesla model three. And this type, this specific struct type, doesn't exist anywhere else within our program. This is kind of a type that's just unique to this one instance um, called my car. It's not very common that you'll see kind of top level um, anonymous structs like this. More often you'll see nested anonymous structs, right? So rather than creating wheel as a separate struct type, 
we've just said, well, wheels kind of always exist within cars. I know that's not really true, but maybe within our program it's true. Um, so we just create a little anonymous struct um, within the greater car struct. Now, as far as best practices in writing clean code, my opinion is that you should generally favor um, named structs. You avoid anonymous structs unless you have a really good reason to use them. Uh, you'll really never go wrong with naming your structs. Okay, so the question on this assignment is, what is a good reason to use an anonymous struct? You're worried about security, you need your code to be faster, you're worried about user privacy, or it is only being used once. Well, the only thing even remotely related to how anonymous structs work um, is that it's only being used once. So if you're certain that you only want this type to be used one time, maybe you don't want someone accidentally reusing a type, um, then you might want to use an anonymous struct. Next question is, what's one advantage of using an anonymous struct? Anonymous structs make your code run faster, anonymous structs prevent you from reusing a struct definition you never intended to reuse, or anonymous structs can be compiled more quickly. Um, it's this reuse one. Um, one place that I have used anonymous kind of top level structs from time to time is in HTTP handlers. So if I know that a given HTTP endpoint will always return a, a, a specific JSON payload, then I'll use an anonymous struct to define the shape of that JSON payload. We haven't really talked about JSON in Go yet, but kind of spoiler alert, structs are how we structure JSON data typically. Next we have embedded structs. And embedded structs are not the same thing as nested structs. An embedded struct is basically where we take all the fields from one struct and kind of shove them into another one. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So here's our car struct that we've been using for our examples. Um, it's got to make in a model. Great. Here's our truck struct. Now you'll notice we've embedded the car type here but the car is missing kind of a name, a, a key in the truck struct. The bed size is the key, int is the type. Here we just have the type, which is car. So what does this do and how does it differ from a nested struct? Well, in the embedded struct, if we want to access the field model from a, an instance of a truck, rather than doing truck.car.model, we would just do truck.model because these fields of the car type are becoming kind of top level fields of the truck type. We're inheriting all of those fields from the car type. Now, I have to be careful with the word inherit, even though it is kind of a pretty good descriptive term for what's happening. Go is not an object oriented language because it doesn't support classes or inheritance in the class based sense. So if you're familiar with the idea of object oriented programming, just know that classes and inheritance aren't really what's going on here. Uh, this is you could almost just think of this as a shorthand for kind of retyping this make and model into the truck struct. It's, it's almost just a syntactic sugar um, so that we don't have to retype all of these fields. So let's take a look at some code um, and how we would use this truck struct. So I've created this new um, instance of a truck, call it Lane's truck, has a bed size, which is an integer, right? And it has a car here. Now you might look at that and say, that looks an awful lot like a nested struct. And the syntax for creating a new instance of an embedded struct is very similar to uh, the syntax for a nested struct. Essentially the key is just the same name as the type. This is kind of a quirky thing about um, composite liber literals. Uh, the embedded stuff looks like the nested stuff. However, when we are accessing the individual fields on um, Lane's truck using the dot operator, you'll see they're all accessed at the top level. It's not Lane's truck uh, dot car dot make, it's Lane's truck dot make, right? It's not lanes truck dot car dot model. It's just lanes truck dot model. So those fields are being brought up into the top level. It's just when we kind of instantiate the truck the first time that we need to do this sort of nested syntax. So let's hop into the assignment. It says at Textio, a user, which is a struct, represents an account holder. And a sender is just a user with some additional sender specific data. A sender is a user that has a rate limit field that tells us how many messages they are allowed to send. Fix the system by using an embedded struct as expected by the test code. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the test code. So it looks like the test code is creating some senders. 
and it's expecting that a sender has a rate limit and that it has a user, right? And this is looking like an embedded struct. And up here, you can see S is a sender and we're directly accessing name, number, and rate limit all at the top level. So I think all I need to do here is embed the user struct. In fact, let's run this without, without that, see what happens. Yep, we're getting some undefined fields. We'll embed the user type in there. And that's looking pretty good to me. I will mention, just to give you an idea of like when you use this in the real world, one place that I use it actively on boot dev is users have kind of public fields on boot dev and private fields. So public fields are um, stuff that we show on the leaderboard, things that kind of anyone can see about your profile, maybe your bio or your profile picture. Um, but users also have private fields, things like um, your hashed password, right? The, the password we store in the database. And I've actually embedded the private fields within the public user so that I can easily nullify them when I don't want to send private data uh, to a given web page. All right, let's go ahead and run this code. Let's talk about methods on structs or just methods in general in Go. Um, I know I told you Go is not object oriented and it's not, but if you squint really hard, structs in Go kind of look like classes in a language like Java, JavaScript, or Python. So methods in Go are just behavior or functions that we can define on a type. And more often than not, we end up defining methods on structs, although we could define methods on any type. So let's take a look at the syntax for this. So here we have a simple rectangle struct. Uh, it has a width and a height, right? Uh, and here we've defined an area method on the rectangle struct. So this is just a function, right? We're familiar with functions already. The only difference is that we've added this special parameter before the name of the function, which is again, just a parameter that comes into the function. Just, it's just a special parameter. Um, and in this case, it is of type rect, which is just a struct, and we've named it r. And then this function just returns r.width times r.height, right? So it returns the area of the rectangle. So why would we use a method on a struct? Well, there are reasons that we'll get to later when we talk about interfaces, um, but for now, it's mostly a syntactic thing, a syntactic sugar thing. If we have behavior that we want to define on a given type, then structs can be a really good choice. They give us this nice syntactic sugar, right? We create this new rectangle called R, and now we can just call r.area to get the area of the rectangle. It's kind of a nice way to do computed properties on a type, right? So we could have stored area as a separate number within the rect struct. The problem with that is now we lose kind of a single source of truth when it comes to the area. Right? If we store the area as say 50 and the width and height as five and 10, but then we update the height and forget to update the area, right now we have a bug in our code. So this is a great way to kind of have a one line accessor to get the area of a rectangle, but we don't have to actually store that area in our struct as kind of duplicate data. So let's get down to the assignment says, let's clean up Textio's authentication logic. We store our user's authentication data inside an authentication info struct. Okay, so that's here. It's got a username and a password. We need a method that can take that data and return a basic authorization string. The format of the string should be authorization basic username colon password, right? So this is the kind of standard basic authorization that's used in HTTP requests. The assignment says, create a method on authentication info called get basic auth that returns the formatted string. Okay, cool. So let's create a new, a new method. And we can kind of reference this syntax over here. So it's func, and we want the receiver to be an authentication info struct. So I'll just call it AI. Ooh, that's, that's actually confusing. Let's do auth, auth I, authentication info. And we wanted the name of the method to be called get basic auth and it returns a string, okay? And then we want to return this format here. So if you remember, we can use the format package to do that. So we'll return fmt.sprintf. 
Remember, sprintf returns the string rather than printing it to standard out or to the console. And we'll use that template. Username and password are both just strings. So we'll use percent %s for our formatting verbs. And then we can do auth i dot username first and auth i dot password next. Okay, cool. That looks correct to me. Let's run it. Perfect. Let's talk about interfaces. So an interface in Go is just a collection of method signatures. For example, take a look at this shape interface. So we have an interface, it's named shape, and it specifies two different method signatures. So area is a method that uh, takes no parameters and returns a float 64. Perimeter is another method that takes no parameters and returns a float 64. Now, any type that implements both of these methods and, and matches their method signatures will implement the shape interface, which really just means that we can think of it and treat it as a shape. So for example, let's take a look at this rectangle struct. So a rect has a width and a height, uh, both of which are float 64s. And again, this is just a, this is just a kind of standard struct. And it has two methods on it. Uh, one is the area method that takes no parameters, returns a float 64. Um, one is the perimeter that takes no parameters and returns a float 64. And because a rectangle implements both of these methods, we can think of a rectangle as a shape. A shape is just anything where we can kind of calculate its area and calculate its perimeter. And multiple types can implement the same interface. So for example, this circle struct, it has uh, different underlying data, right? Rather than a, a width and a height, we can represent a circle with just a radius. Um, but to calculate its area and its perimeter, the calculation is a little bit different, right? We're using pi, for example. Um, but the method signature is identical, right? We don't pass anything in because we have all the data we need on the circle struct, and we just return a float 64. So both circles and rectangles, because they implement the required methods, can be thought of as shapes or we could say they implement the shape interface. Let's get into the assignment. I think it'll all start to make a little more sense. So the assignment says the birthday message and sending report structs have already implemented the get message method. So let's take a look at that. So uh, birthday message is this struct here. Sending report is this struct here. They both have this get message method that returns a string. And they're just, it looks like the strings that they return are just a little bit different, right? The birthday messages get message uh, function returns this like, hi, blank, it is your birthday on blank. And a sending report says your blank report is ready, right? So they're just, they're just formatted a little, a little differently. Okay, so Simon says, first add the get message method as a requirement on the method interface. Okay, so we need to finish the message interface and add a get message method that returns a string. Okay, cool. So now this message interface, because birthday message and sending report both implement this method, we can think of both of those as messages. Next, it says complete the send message function. It should print a messages message, which it obtains through the interface method. Okay, cool. So. The, a message is an interface. So inside of the send message function, we don't actually know if we're dealing with, say, a birthday message or a sending report. We just know that we have access to a message. So really, the only thing we can do with it is call get message, which we know will return a string. And it says it should print a message. So we'll do fmt.println. We'll just print out the message. Cool. OK, now this is powerful. Right, let's go take a look at how this code is actually called. So we have this test function that also just takes a method, a message, and it sends that message, right? It's just calling our send message function here. But down here, and this is where it's most interesting, the test function is not passed like interface literals. That's not even like a real thing, right? A, an interface is like abstract type that represents other types. Instead, because the test function takes an interface, we can pass into it any struct that implements that interface. So for example, here on line 42, we're passing in a sending report. And then on line 46, we're passing in a birthday message. Those are two different types 
in a strongly typed language being passed in as the first parameter to a single function. But th the reason it works is because we're using interfaces. Okay, let's go ahead and run this, see what happens. Your first report report is ready. You've sent 10 messages. Hi, John Doe, it is your birthday. This looks great. This looks great to me. In Go, interfaces are implemented implicitly. And what that means is when we have a type, like in our last example, we had the rectangle type that implemented the shape interface. We never had to explicitly write anywhere on the rectangle struct that it was intended to implement the shape interface. Because it satisfied all the requirements of the shape interface, it just kind of automatically implemented it. And that's fairly unique to Go. In a language like Java, we might have to write something like this. Um, we can take a look at this little example here. We've got this employee interface and a contractor struct. If we wanted the contractor to implement the employee, we would need it to still fulfill the interface, right, by implementing all the methods, but we might need to also explicitly type something like implements employee, right? We'd explicitly say that we intend to implement that interface. In Go, it's done automatically. Let's hop into the assignment. It says, at Textio, we have full-time employees and contract employees. We've been tasked with making a more general employee interface so that dealing with different employee types is a little simpler. Add the missing get salary method to the contractor type so that it fulfills the employee interface. Okay, cool. So we have the employee interface. We have the contractor struct. Um, and if we look at the full-time struct, it looks like it already implements the employee interface. So we just need to add the missing method because right now a contractor has a get name but does not have a get salary. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll do employee get salary. It returns an int. And a contractor's salary is their hourly pay multiplied by how many hours they work per year. Okay, so be something like C dot hourly pay multiplied by c dot hours per year okay and just because i'm curious i want to go look at how a full-time salary uh employee works yeah so you can see the the way that a full-time employee their salary is calculated is, is totally different like their their salary is actually just stored probably because the way we think of full-time employees is like you know you make sixty thousand dollars a year you make seventy thousand dollars a year whereas contractors often get paid by the hour so it makes sense that they have a different calculation um, and then down here in the test suite um, this looks very similar to the last assignment where the test function is able to take as inputs any type of employee right so we can pass in both full-time and contractors here uh, let's go ahead and run that Jack, Bob, and Jill, we can see all of their salaries, even though Jack is full-time and Bob and Jill are both contractors. So that looks good to me. In Go, types implement interfaces implicitly because it kind of decouples the definition of the interface from the definition of the type. The type doesn't even really need to know that it implements a certain interface. And that's really, really cool because it means it's easy for a type to to implement lots of different interfaces. So the quiz question here is, how is an interface fulfilled? Answers are, a type has all the required interfaces methods defined on it, or a struct embeds the interface in its definition. And the answer is going to be, it has all the methods defined. The next question is, can a type fulfill multiple interfaces or implement multiple interfaces? And yes, why not? Another quiz question. Go uses the blank keyword to show that a type implements an interface. And the answers are fulfills, implements, inherits, and there is no keyword in Go. And the answer is that there is no keyword in Go. Interfaces are implemented implicitly. In the next question, it says, in the example given, the blank type implements the blank interface. Let's take a look. So example here, we've got the shape interface, circle struct, circle has an area method. So it looks like the circle type implements the shape interface. Like we talked about before, a type can implement multiple interfaces. 
It just needs to have all the methods for all of the different interfaces. For example, the empty interface, so that's this, this definition right here, this is an interface with no methods required, is actually always implemented by every single type in the Go programming language. Now, it's often not a very useful interface because you can't really do anything with an empty interface. You have no methods to call. Let's jump down into the assignment. It says add the required method so that the email type implements both the expense and printer interfaces. Okay, cool. So we've got these expense and printer interfaces, two different methods we need to implement. And we have this email type with an is subscribed Boolean and body string. Cool. All right, cost method. If the email is not subscribed, so if not e dot is subscribed, I believe is what the field was, then the cost is 0 0.05 times uh, the length for each character in the body. So the length e dot body. Now, remember, Go is strongly typed and we can't multiply an int by a float directly. So we need to cast this integer. Sorry, I think I highlighted those backwards. The length of the body is an integer. This is a float. So we need to cast the length of the body to a float. So we can we can multiply a float by a float. Um, otherwise, we'll return. Uh, it's 0 0.01 times that same thing, the length of the body. Cool. Uh, the print function should just print to standard out the email's body text. Easy enough. FMT.println e.body. Okay, so now our email struct implements both of these interfaces. And if we come down here to look at the test function, this is interesting. The test function takes an expense and a printer, right? So we can use both of those uh, methods there. And actually the email struct, so we're creating instances of emails here. We're actually passing it into test as both the expense and the printer, right? Because it makes sense. It implements both. Cool. Let me run that. Oh, what did I screw up? 0 0.05 times float 64 length. Value of type float 64 is not used. Let's see. 0 0.05 times float 64 length of e.body. What did I screw up? Value of type float 64 is not used. I forgot my return. Cool, let's try that again. Okay, so printing with cost 11 cents. Hello there, printing with cost $1. I want my money back. Yeah, that looks, that looks pretty good. Let's submit it. Up until this point, we haven't really been naming the arguments of our interface's method signatures, um, but we totally could. So if we take a look at this, this is the copier interface. It's a uh, copy method that it requires, which takes two strings and returns an int. Um, the interesting thing is when you look at this method signature, it's kind of hard to tell what the intention behind the interface is. It's like, great, it takes two strings, but what are those strings supposed to represent, right? So here we can take a look at what I would consider a better interface definition, where the copier interface actually has a copy method that specifies the source file is kind of the name of the first parameter, and the destination file is the name of the second parameter, and then bytes copied is the integer that's returned. So, you know, the functionality here is identical, but now we have much better, I, I, I mean, I would consider it documentation, of what the intention behind this interface is. So the question is, are you required to name the arguments of an interface in order for your code to compile properly? Uh, no, no, it'll work fine either way. Next question is, why would you name your interface's methods parameters, right? Like we don't need to, why would we do it? Um, execution speed, memory savings, or readability and clarity. Uh, it's going to be for readability and clarity. Type assertions. So. Type assertions are something you'll see every once in a while. I would argue they're probably not super common, but you will come across them. Um, and the whole purpose of a type assertion is so that you can take an interface and kind of cast it back into its underlying type. 
So in this code sample here, we can kind of assume that S is an instance of a shape interface. And at this point in the code, because it's just an interface, we don't know necessarily if it's a circle or maybe a square or maybe some other type. So what we do is we do a type assertion to cast it to the circle struct. And basically what happens here is on the left-hand side of the um, this uh, short declaration operator here, we get back the instance of the circle. So this is going to be an instance of the circle struct, again, the underlying struct um, behind the shape interface, if it was a circle, right? Because we, we can't be sure. If we had a shape, we're not sure if it was a circle or maybe something else. But this okay variable, this is going to be a Boolean. And if it's true, then it was a circle and we should have a valid kind of filled out circle struct. If OK is false, then we kind of have to discard the circle um, because we, we weren't able to parse out um, the shape as a circle because it wasn't a circle. So let's move on to the assignment. If it's an email, then it should return the emails to address and the cost of the email. If the expense is an SMS, then it should return the SMS's phone number and cost. If the expense is any other underlying type, just return an empty string and a 0.0, .0 for the cost. OK, cool. So we've got this get expense report. It takes an expense as input, and my guess is, yep, expense is this interface. So our job is to kind of try to cast it into the potential underlying types email and SMS. So first we do um, email, okay, uh, expense dot, and we'll cast it to an email type, if okay. So if it's an email, return the email's to address. So we uh, return email dot to address. There's that string there. And also it's cost. So email dot, looks like cost is a method. Email dot cost. Okay. Uh, next we can do S, okay. S, uh, e dot cast to an SMS. So if it's an SMS, we can return SMS's to phone number, to phone number. And the SMS dot cost, I believe that's also just, yep, just a method. Okay, and it says otherwise, if it has a different underlying type, return empty string and 0.0, .0 for the cost. Okay, cool. That feels at least like we followed the instructions. Let's see what we get. Not enough arguments in call to sms.cost. Let's take a look at sms.cost. Hmm. Have, want, what did I screw up here? Ah. Should be s dot cost. I, I named I named the struct the struct s. All right, let's try that again. Report the email going to John Doe will cost eleven. Email the SMS. Okay, cool. And invalid expense. Perfect. That I mean that feels right. I can come down here and check the test suite. Yeah, invalid. Okay, cool. Let's submit that. When we want to do a lot of successive type assertions in a row, there's actually a better way, and that's with type switches. So here's a syntax for a type switch. Uh, basically, we have an interface, and we cast it um, at the very top of the switch, and then we can actually check and kind of pattern match against different possible types. If none of the types that we've specified are the matching underlying type, then it will kind of fall down to the default case. So let's write some code and see how it works. Um, down in the assignment, it says, after submitting our last snippet of code for review, a more experienced gopher, or term for a Go developer, uh, told us to use a type switch instead of successive assertions. Let's make that improvement. Implement the get expense report function using a type switch. Okay, cool. So kind of the same thing though. If it's an email, we'll return a to address and a cost. If it's an SMS, then we should return a phone number and a cost, blah, 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 right? The difference is we're going to use a different syntax this time. Okay, so we're going to be using this switch syntax. So switch value colon equals e dot type. 
okay, open brackets, case. Um, we are interested in if the expense is an email. So case email. Now the interesting thing is with now within this case block, V is an email. So I can treat it like an email. So I can do return V dot, oh, what was it? To address, I think. Yeah. To address V dot cost. Case SMS return v dot to phone number i think it was to phone number v dot cost and default return uh i think it was empty string just zero values right empty string and zero dot zero okay cool let's see what happens with that oh am i forgetting nope i've got oh i'm indenting a little weird there we go. Let's run that. Cool. The MS SMS is going to be is going to this number with this cost. Got some emails and costs. Okay, that's looking good to me. Now that we've learned what interfaces are and how we use them, let's talk about how we can use them more effective and in a sort of idiomatic and clean way. If you forget all of the other advice that we're going to go over when it comes to writing clean inter interfaces, don't forget this one, and that is to keep interfaces as small as you can. The best, the cleanest, and the most useful interfaces typically just have one or two methods defined on them. Imagine a simple stringer interface. It has one method defined on it called string that simply returns a string. You can take that interface and implement it on basically any type, and now you have a super useful interface for logging out string representations of different types. There isn't a hard and fast rule about exactly how many methods you should be defining on your interfaces, but what you really should be doing is looking for kind of the minimal behavior necessary to accurately represent an idea or concept, right? So for example, here's a slightly larger interface from the standard library. Again, normally we'll see interfaces in the standard library with maybe just one or two or three uh, methods. This one has five, but this is kind of still the minimum um, amount or, or the, the, the minimal necessary behavior that we need to describe a file, like a file in your file system, right? We need a way to close the file. We need a way to read it. We need a way to seek to individual uh, kind of sections of the file. Um, so this is an example of a slightly larger interface, right? I would say five methods is definitely a on the larger end, um, but it's still a good interface because it's using as, as little behavior as it possibly can to describe an operating system file. So the question that goes along with this is, interfaces should have as blank methods as possible, and the answers are complex, few, and many, and the answer is going to be few. The next mistake that I've seen new Go developers make is when they write an interface that sort of knows about the types that they've intended to satisfy it. So for example, if you have a car interface and you've defined an is fire truck method on the car interface that returns a bool, you know, whether or not it's a fire truck, that's probably a mistake. You would actually just want to use a type assertion or a type switch if you really needed to figure out the underlying type. You should not make your interfaces aware of the underlying types. This also breaks rule number one, right? Because rule number one, we don't need to know if a car is a fire truck for like the minimal behavior of a car. I mean, you can see how this sort of design pattern would get out of hand very quickly because we might need to also define other Booleans like is pickup, is sedan, is tank, right? If you start catering to all of the underlying types of a given interface, your interface is going to be really bloated and become very, very large. So the question here is actually the reverse. It says it's okay for types to be aware of the interfaces that they satisfy. If it were flipped around, the answer would definitely be false. But because we're talking about the types being aware of the interfaces they satisfy, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Um, they don't need to be aware of them, right? Because again, in Go, uh, interfaces are satisfied implicitly. But I would argue to some extent they are aware of them because the developer had to go in some cases out of their way to satisfy the implementation of an interface. So I'm going to go with true on this one. So now this is the reverse question. It says it's okay for interfaces to be aware of the types that satisfy them. No, they should not be aware.
Finally, I just want to talk about how interfaces are not classes. Sometimes this can get mixed up, especially if you're coming from an object-oriented background. Um, interfaces are just a very different idea. Interfaces are not classes, they are much slimmer. Right? Classes have a lot of functionality going on. Inheritance is a fairly complex topic. Um, interfaces are honestly a, a, just a simpler idea. Um, interfaces don't have constructors or deconstructors that require that data is created or destroyed, right? So that's another way that they differ from classes that have kind of this in inherent setup and tear down uh, situation. Interfaces are not hierarchical, right? There's, there's no uh, hierarchical inheritance tree when it comes to interfaces. And the most interesting one is that interfaces define function signatures, but not underlying behavior, right? So this is actually a big difference between interfaces and classes. In a class, a child class can inherit behavior from a parent class, which can kind of dry up your code, right? Don't repeat yourself. In Go, that's not the case at all. An interface doesn't dry up your code. You still have to go implement all of the methods on all of the different types individually. Interfaces just allow us to use all of those types kind of in the same places. Later in this course, we'll get to talk about generics, which is a way to kind of dry up your code and funny enough, kind of uses interfaces um, under the hood or kind of as a part of the generics system to make that happen. So finally, the question is, interfaces allow you to define a method's behavior once and use it for many different types. Uh, that's false. Go has a very unique way of handling errors. Really quickly, let's review how JavaScript handles errors, and the way JavaScript handles errors is very similar to Python or Java. It uses a try-catch paradigm, um, and let's contrast that with how Go handles errors in its sort of unique way. Let's pretend that we have a function called getUser, um, and we'll start with JavaScript. So we have a function called getUser, and it returns a user, so we'll do const user equals getUser. And we have to wrap the get user function, the call to the get user function, in a try block because we know that the get user function can throw. Because let's just say, for example, uh, maybe the user doesn't exist. Okay, cool. So if something goes wrong, we add a catch block. And if this function throws, execution will stop. We'll enter the catch block and do whatever's in here. For now, we can just uh, console.log the error. Now let's take a look at what this function looks like in Go we do something like this. We do user error colon equals get user. If error does not equal nil, then we could print out the error and return so that we don't continue. And then down here, we could, you know, deal with the user object. So uh, use user here. And for consistency sake, we could say, use user here um, after the user object is created in JavaScript. Okay, so what's the difference? Well, let's talk about the first reason why I prefer Go's error handling to JavaScript's error handling. Let's pretend we need to go get some data for the user after we've already kind of retrieved the user successfully. So let's say we need to go get the user's profile picture. Well, in Go, all we would do is call the next dangerous function. Let's say get user pro profile and maybe it takes a user dot id as input right so we need to successfully wait for the user to come back and then we can go fetch its profile all right so this looks very similar we're doing another dangerous function get user profile and it returns a profile and an error if an error with the profile occurs uh, again we'll just kind of print out the error and return otherwise now we have a profile object Okay, what would we do in JavaScript? Well, in JavaScript, we can't just take this try catch and paste it down here and update some stuff. This will not work. If we do get user profile, user dot ID profile. The problem with this code is that user is only available within this try block. It's scoped to the try block. Right? So this user object here will be undefined. So the normal thing to do in JavaScript would be just be to take this line here and inject it within the try block, the original try block. 
right? So now I'm doing my second dangerous function after I do my first dangerous function. The reason I don't like this is that the logic for handling the errors is now all in one place. If I want to handle the error for the get user profile function differently or separately, um, then I want to handle the error from the get user function, I have to actually nest the whole try catch like this, right? So now user.id is accessible because I'm in the same try block, but I get a second catch block. So we kind of get this nasty nesting if we want to treat each individual error separately. And this kind of brings us to the second reason why I prefer Go's error handling, and it's that it forces us to think about each individual error that's passed back from a dangerous function. So again, in JavaScript, kind of the normal thing to do, unless you really needed separate error handling, would be to just kind of do all of your dangerous stuff in one large try block. The problem with this, in my opinion, is that it kind of, it doesn't encourage me to remember which of these functions is dangerous in the first place. For example, maybe this is a safe function and this is a dangerous function that can potentially throw an error, but looking at this code from um, kind of a calling perspective, I don't really know that that's the case. Whereas in Go, because a function returns kind of the valid data and the error with every function call, I know for a fact that the get user profile function can throw an error because it returns an error value. This will probably make more sense if I actually write out some of these functions. So in JavaScript, the get user function might look just like this. Function get user, uh, we could say uh, do some get user logic here. And then maybe it returns, you know, a user. Looking at the function signature, all I can tell in JavaScript is that this function takes no arguments. And the only way for me to know what it returns is to go find that return statement and see, oh, okay, it returns a user. However, in Go, I actually get two super helpful things in the function signature. And remember, the function signature is just kind of that first line of a function definition. So in Go, if I were to write the function definition for the get user function, it would be something like this. Func get user doesn't take any inputs, but it returns a let's say a user struct and an error, right? And then we have some kind of do get user logic here, right? So now just by looking at this function signature, I can tell that it returns a user and that it could possibly return an error as well that I need to go handle. Whereas again, in JavaScript, not only do I not get to see in the function signature what is potentially returned, but I also don't know that this function can throw. I have to kind of go digging deeper into the function definition to see if there's potentially something uh, dangerous going on in the meat of the function. So again, to reiterate, because this is actually a super important point when you're learning about how errors are handled in Go, the primary reason I like error handling in Go is that it forces me, as I write my code, to be kind of hyper aware of every potential error and make sure that I write code that handles it. So now that we understand what error handling in Go kind of looks like from a high level, let's dive into the details. Errors in Go are just values and specifically they're just interfaces. So the built-in error interface is an interface with a single method, the error method, and that method returns a string describing what went wrong. So how do we actually go about handling errors in code? Well, let's take a look at this function right here. So this is a function in the standard library. It's called ASCII to integer. It takes a string and attempts to convert it into an integer value. And potentially that can be problematic, right? Because you can write strings that aren't numbers under the hood. Okay, cool. So what do we do? We get back an integer and an error. And in essence, it's, it's, it's really simple. The error is either nil or it's not nil. If it is nil, that means everything went fine and nothing went wrong. So if the error is nil, it means there is no kind of string representing what went wrong because nothing went wrong. However, if the error is not nil, that means something did go wrong, right? So if the error is not nil in this case, then we'll print an error message and return from the function, right? So we're basically writing guard clauses 
that say something went wrong, let's handle this error and get out of here, right? Enough talk, let's write some code so you can see what I mean. Let me expand this so it's a little easier to see the code. Okay, the assignment says, we offer a product that allows businesses that use Textio to send pairs of messages to couples. It's mostly used by flower shops and movie theaters. Okay, great. Complete the send SMS to couple function. So that's this function here. It should send two messages, first to the customer and then to the customer's spouse. So use send SMS to send the message to customer. If an error is encountered, return 0.0, .0 and the error. Uh, do the same for message to spouse. If both messages are sent successfully, return the total cost of the messages added together. Okay, I think I understand what's going on. So we're basically going to send both of these messages one after the other. Um, if any errors happen, we kind of abort early and return the error. Okay, so uh, send SMS takes a message as input. So first we'll say uh, send SMS and we'll send the message to the customer. And send SMS returns a float 64 and error. So we'll say, um, I think it's the cost. Return the total cost. Okay, yeah, so cost, error, send SMS. All right, if error does not equal nil, so if there was a problem sending the SMS, uh, return 0.0, .0 and the error. So return 0.0. .0. right? Because this function send SMS to couple returns the total cost and an error. So we're saying if we failed to send the SMS, then it costs nothing and we'll return the error that describes what went wrong. Otherwise, we'll do it for the message to spouse. So we kind of are just going to do this exact same thing. So I'm going to say cost for, SM uh, for let's say, customer, cost for spouse, and we'll be sending the message to the spouse. Cool. All right, now if we get to the bottom of the function, that means nothing went wrong. So we can return cost for customer plus cost for spouse and nil, right? Because if we get down here, nothing went wrong, so we don't have an error to return. Okay, let's go ahead and run this code and see what we get. And I wanted to scroll down and take a look at some of these test cases. Okay, message for customer. Thanks for coming into our flower shop. Message for spouse. We hope you enjoyed your gift. Error, can't send texts over 25 characters. Okay, cool. So, I mean, if we look at the send SMS uh, function, it actually throws an error, or I shouldn't say throws because we don't throw in Go, right? But returns an error value that says can't send texts over blank characters. So that looks correct to me. Um, here we've got message to customer, message to spouse, total cost. Okay, this is looking pretty good to me. I'm going to go ahead and submit that. We talked about how error handling in Go is all built around the error interface. In fact, let's just review that really quickly. Uh, this error interface is really just an interface that wraps a method returning a string. Because if you think about it, at the end of the day, an error is just a kind of nullable string. Either it's a string representing what went wrong or saying what went wrong, or it's nothing because nothing went wrong. So being good at handling errors in Go has a lot to do with being good at formatting strings or formatting useful error messages. So let's review how we format strings in Go. Most formatting Go is built around kind of these formatting verbs that are defined in the format package, the FMT package of the standard library. So for example, the sprintf function returns a string where it interpolates the values passed into the function after the formatting string into the formatting stream, uh, string where, where the verbs exist. So for example, this first percent V is replaced with name. The second percent V is replaced with age. Percent V is the verb we use for sort of the default format, right? If you format an integer using percent V, then it kind of just prints the integer in string form. Um, but there are other ways that we can format stuff. For example, the percent F verb is used to format floats. And you can actually specify how many decimal places you want to show up in your output string by kind of prefixing the F portion with a 0.2 for two decimal places, or say a 0.1 for a single decimal place. So let's jump right into the coding assignment. Assignment says, we need better error logs for our backend developers to help them debug their code. 
complete the get SMS error string function. So that's this one right here. Um, it should return a string with this format. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to jump right ahead. So it should return. Return fmt.sprintf, right? Because we're trying to format a string. Uh, this format. Let me expand that a little bit. Okay. So return a string with that format. Uh, cost is the cost of the SMS. So I'm going to replace cost here with the cost formatted to two decimal places. So percent point two F, right? For two decimal places. And replace recipient with the stringified representation of the recipient's phone number, which is this string here. So percent V. Um, it's important to point out, I could also use S here to format a string, but V and S do the same thing effectively um, when you're working with strings. And then we need to pass in as parameters the values that we want to format or that we want to interpolate into the string. So it's going to be cost and recipient. I'm going to dedent that because that is some crazy formatting. Okay, that looks better. All right, SMS that costs percent point two F to be sent to percent V. This looks good to me. All right, I'm going to go ahead and run that and see what we get. Ah, right, can't forget to import the formatting package. Let's run that. Okay, SMS that costs 1.40 to be sent to the string cannot be sent. Awesome, this looks correct to me. I'm gonna go ahead and submit that. Let's talk about building our own custom error types. So remember, the error interface is an interface. In fact, let me jump back and show you what it looks like again. So it's just this interface here. And because it's an interface, that means we can build our own types, like this user error struct here, that implement that interface, which means they can be used as errors. And remember that the error interface just has one single method that we need to define, right? The error method that returns a string. And as long as we have that, then our type can be used as an error. So for example, we could create this user error type that stores a name, and then we can use it as an error to format an error message that contains the name of the user's account who had an error. So for example, in this snippet here, we have a send SMS function. And if we're not able to send a message to a user, we can actually just return that user error struct with the user's name. And again, that is an error. We can return that struct as an error type because it implements the error interface. The caller of this function would then just treat it like any other error. The reason this is useful is that we can store structured data within our errors. So if we want to format them a specific way, we have access to sort of dynamic data like a name. Let's write some code that uses this concept. So the assignment says, our users are frequently trying to run custom analytics queries on their message deliverability metrics, right? So we're sending lots of messages. We wanna know, are these messages getting delivered? They end up writing a bad query that tries to divide a number by zero. It's become such a problem that we think it would be best to make a specific type of error um, for dividing by zero. Update the code so that the divide error type, so that's this error type here, or rather this struct here, implements the error interface. Its error method should return a string formatted in the following way. Cannot divide dividend by zero. Okay, let's write that method. So it's going to be a function on the divide error type. So I'm going to name it DE, which is a, a divide error. And the name of the function must be error. Takes no arguments and returns a string. Right? So that's, that's the function signature we need to use um, to implement the error interface. And then we're going to return a string and we're gonna to need to format the string. So we'll use sprintf. Uh, the format package is already imported. And this is our template. And dividend, in this case, is a float 64. And uh, you, it says here, dividend is the actual dividend, use the percent V verb. So percent V, okay. So we're just gonna kind of do the default formatting for a float 64. And let me indent all this so that it's kind of readable. Or dividend is the actual dividend of the divider. Okay, so we'll do de dot 
dividend. That will interpolate there. Okay, that looks correct to me. I think we've implemented the error interface properly. Let's go ahead and run that. Uh-oh, I forgot my comma. Um, this is kind of a, an interesting quirk of the Go programming language. Um, if you add a new line after the last parameter to a function, you have to put a comma. So this would work, right? And this would work, but this does not work, right? That's what I did the first time. So just kind of something to watch out for. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, dividing 10 by 0, cannot divide 10 by 0. Dividing 10 by 2, quotient 5. Dividing 15 by 30, 5. Quotient. Okay, this is looking like it formatted properly. Let's submit that. So we've got a quiz question. It says, what is the underlying type of an error? Is it an interface? Is it a struct? Is it a string? Well, it could technically be a struct or a string, right? Like we saw in the last, uh, the last assignment, but the most correct thing would be to say an interface because it must always be an interface, right? It must always implement the error interface. It could also be a struct or a string, um, but it will always be an interface. Next question is, can a type be an error and also fulfill another interface? Well, errors are just interfaces, and we know that types can fulfill any number of interfaces as long as they have all of the required methods. So yeah, there's no problem with this. Let's talk about the errors package. So the standard library in Go has an errors package that exposes a few useful functionalities, but the one we're most interested in right now is the errors.new function. So the useful thing about the errors.new function is it allows us to create a new error from just a string. So we don't need to kind of, you know, define a new struct or a new type and then have it explicitly implement the error interface. That can be a lot of code if all we want to do is kind of return an error with a very specific string. Let's go ahead and use it. The assignment says Twilio software architects may have overcomplicated the requirements from the last coding assignment. Yeah. All we needed was a new generic error message that returns the string no dividing by zero when a user attempts to get us to perform the taboo, right? The taboo of dividing something by zero. Complete the divide function, use the errors.new function to create an error when y equals zero that reads no dividing by zero. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. Basically, if y is zero, which means that the, the number that we divide by would be zero, which is obviously a huge problem in mathematics, you're not allowed to do that in Go or most programming languages that I'm aware of. Um, so we need to return an error here uh, so that this operation never happens. So we'll return errors.new. Looks like the errors package is already imported for us. And we just need to return an error that says no dividing by zero. Okay, let's go ahead and run that and see what we get. Oh, I screwed up. This function returns a float64 and an error. So we should return a zero value for that first value when we're returning a non-nil error. Let's go ahead and run that. Dividing 10 by zero, no dividing by zero. All of this looks good to me. Let's talk about loops in Go. So if you are familiar with loops in other languages, loops in Go syntactically are very similar to say loops in JavaScript. Uh, the main difference is just that we don't use the parentheses around uh, kind of the, the signature of the for loop, um, which again is very similar to how if statements in Go work. We're basically just dropping those uh, parentheses syntactically. Um, the initial portion runs at the beginning. So for example, in this uh, snippet of code where we are looping over the integers zero through nine, um, in the initial section, we're just initializing a variable i and setting it equal to zero. Um, in the condition section, uh, we're checking and making sure that i is less than 10. So at the end of every uh, kind of iteration of the body, which in this case, we're just printing i in the body, um, we're going to check and make sure that i is less than 10. If it is, we'll continue on to the next iteration of the loop. Otherwise, we'll be done. Um, and then at the end of every iteration, we'll also be running this after section. So we'll be incrementing i. And that happens before uh, the condition is run. So for example, if we increment i to 10, and then i is no longer less than 10, we will not continue on to the next iteration of the loop, which is why this prints 0 through 9 and not 0 through 10. Let's jump right into the assignment. It says, at Textio, we have a dynamic formula for determining how much a batch of bulk messages costs to send. 
So we need to complete the bulk send function. It takes a number of messages as input and returns a float 64, um, which it looks like will be the total cost of the batch of messages. Okay, each message costs 1.0 plus an additional fee. The fee structure is, so it's gonna be first message is 1.0 plus zero. So zero is the fee. Second message is 1.0 plus 0.01. Third message is 1.0 plus 0.02. Okay, cool. And then our job is to use a loop to calculate the total cost of all of these messages for you know the number of messages that we've been given. Okay, let's let's just start writing some code. So total cost, I'm gonna just start it out at 0, 0.0, and then we'll use a loop for i colon equals zero uh, to do like num messages iterations. So uh, you know a number of iterations equal to num messages. So uh, start i at zero. Uh, and then we'll do i is less than num messages and i plus plus. Okay, so this uh, kind of body of the for loop should execute num messages times. And we're gonna want to add to the total cost, so plus equals, um, and we're gonna use this formula. So it's gonna be 1.0 plus this fee. And how do we calculate that fee? Well, it looks to me like it is 0.01 times the basically the message number right so for the first message at index zero i equals zero um it's going to be a fee of zero so if we just use i this should work because if i is zero and we multiply that by 0 0.01 anything multiplied by zero is zero right so we'd get 1.0 plus zero for the second message i should be one so we'll get one plus 0 0.01 because anything multiplied by one is itself um, and so on and so forth. Um, that's looking correct to me. At the end of the function, we'll just return uh, total cost. Cool, let's run that. Oh, untyped float constant, truncated to int. Okay, so i is an int and we cannot multiply an int by a float 64. So I'm gonna cast um, i to a float 64. Let's try that again. And take a look at some of these numbers. Okay, cool. So the cost for 10 messages is 10.45 and that sounds about right right because each message costs one plus this like fractional part that grows over time so like the 10th message would have cost like 0 0.10 and it would decrease over time so that looks about right to me 50 messages yep okay i'm gonna go ahead and submit that one interesting thing about for loops in Go is that each section of the for loop, the initial, the condition, and the after, are actually optional, and we can omit any of them. So, for example, if we omit the condition, then the for loop will just run forever. So let's see why this might be useful. Um, let's jump into the assignment. The assignment says complete the max messages function. Given a cost threshold, it should calculate the maximum number of messages that can be sent. Um, and then it looks like the fees for each message are going to be identical to the last assignment. So let's go ahead and just get started. Um, so max messages, we have a threshold, a cost threshold, right? We want to see how many messages we can send um, while keeping the total cost under the threshold. So I'm gonna create a total cost variable and set it equal to 0.0. .0. And then this is gonna look really similar to the last assignment, um, but basically we'll set i equal to zero to start. Um, I'll skip the condition for now because we don't know to what number we're kind of looping up to, right? We're trying to calculate that. So I don't know where to stop yet, um, but I do want to increment i with every uh, iteration of the loop. And then I basically want to um, update the total cost by adding to it um, and use uh, this formula over here, right? So it's going to be 1.0 plus 0 0.01 times times i, which I need to cast to a float 64. Okay, so that formula is looking, again, identical to last time. Now, if I want to return the the maximum messages that I can send while keeping the cost under the threshold, then basically I need to check and say if the total cost is greater than the threshold, then I should return i. Does that sound right? So for example, let's say that right off the bat, the threshold were, I don't know, say negative one. Right, so I'm not allowed to send anything. I would want to, in that case, return zero, right? Because I can't send any messages. So what would happen? We'd enter the loop. 
I'd calculate the total cost for the first message, which would be 1.0. And then because the total cost is already higher than the threshold, I would return I, which would be zero. So that works, right? However, if the threshold were a little higher, let's say the threshold were 1.5, uh, then what would happen is we do that comparison. The total cost would be less than the threshold. So we'd continue to the next loop uh, iteration of the loop where I would be incremented to one. And then on that next iteration, we'd go over. Okay, so this is looking good to me. Let me go ahead and run this code. Okay, so with a threshold of 10, I can send nine messages without going over the threshold. That sounds right, right? Because I have like nine and some fractional part. Let's go ahead and submit it and see. Most programming languages have support for a while loop. And really a while loop is very similar to a for loop, except it doesn't have that kind of initial and after statement. It, it just runs until some condition is no longer true. Now, because of this similarity, the authors of the Go programming language decided to not include an explicit while loop with a while keyword. Instead, the for loop is a while loop where just basically both those side um, kind of sections are omitted and we just have a condition that follows the for keyword. So in other words, if we have a for keyword and then a single expression, then it is a condition um, that while true will continue to kind of run the body of the loop over and over and over again until the condition stops being true. Let's take a look at an example. Um, here we have a variable called plant height. We start it uh, equal to one, and we've done this outside of the for loop, right? And then within the for loop, we just have one section where we're comparing the variable plant height to the number five, right? And while it is less than five, we'll print this message, and then at the end of the loop, we'll increment plant height. Now, you might notice this looks just like a for loop where we've essentially taken the initial statement and moved it up outside of the for loop body, and we've taken the after statement and moved it within the for loop body, and that is what we've done, right? But it's to demonstrate that this is valid syntax. Let's jump right into the assignment. Okay, so the assignment says, we have an interesting new cost structure for our SMS vendor. So. At Textio, we have a vendor that we have to pay to send text messages through, right? So we're a software service that makes sending text messages easy, but we do have to pay some kind of uh, maybe hardware service that actually does the sending of uh, the text messages kind of over the wireless network. Okay, um, they charge exponentially more money for each consecutive text, text we send. Let's write a function that can calculate how many messages we can send in a given batch, uh, given a cost multiplier and a max cost in pennies. Okay, so given a cost multiplier and a maximum cost, our function will return basically the number of messages that we're allowed to send um, that's under that, that max cost. So it says, in a nutshell, the first message costs one penny. Okay, actual cost in pennies starts at one. And each message after that first message uh, costs the same as the previous message multiplied by the cost multiplier. Okay, so that's happening here. Um, it gets expensive. Uh, there is an infinite loop in the code. Okay, so on line 10 here, we have this four with no body and then an open curly bracket. Um, let me show you what happens when we run that. Our code's gonna sit and run and execute the body of that for loop over and over and over and over with no exit condition. Uh, this is obviously a problem. We don't want uh, an infinite for loop there. So our job is to exit before incrementing max messages to send if the cost of the next message would go over the max cost. So all we need to do is check and only execute this loop while the actual cost is less than or equal to the max cost in pennies. Um, and we're going to have to cast, looks like, so this is a float, this is an int, so we're going to cast this to float 64. Now this should work because max message to send starts at zero. So assuming the actual cost is less than the max cost, then we go ahead and increment. Say we can send one more message and then we take a look at the next cost. And if the next cost is still less, then we'll essentially get to add another message. So we'll keep kind of looking ahead and calculating the next cost right? And as soon as the next cost goes too high, we stop. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and run that. Cool. 
So with a multiplier of 1.1 and a max cost of five, we can send 17 messages. That sounds about right, right? The actual cost starts at one. The max cost is five. Multiplier of 1.1. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, so the multiplier goes up, max cost goes up. Now we can send nine messages. That all looks good to me. Let's talk about the modulo operator, how it works in Go and kind of how it works uh, generally. So the modulo operator is a percent sign. So it looks like this, right? And the modulo operator essentially calculates remainders, remainders. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's jump into an example. Uh, let me switch colors. So four, four divided by three in sort of a normal uh, floating point division uh, equals like 1.33333 forever, right? Um, we have this fractional part. However, that's how math works normally, and that's how math works in floating point division in a language like Go. If we're doing integer division, then we can't have a floating point result. So the result of four divided by three in integer division is actually just one. It's essentially the number of times that three can be divided evenly into four, and then we chop off the remainder. The interesting thing about the modulo operator is that four modulo three doesn't return the number of times that three can be divided evenly into four. It returns the remainder after that division. So actually in the case of four modulo three, the remainder is also one. So it's the same, but for example, five modulo three is two and six modulo three is zero again, because three divides evenly into six, right? Six integer division by three is two, right? Because three goes evenly into six twice, but the remainder is zero. That's why six mod three is zero. Let's just do a couple more examples. Feel free to pause the video um, in between when I give the question and provide the solution um, so that maybe you can practice a little bit. Okay, so let's do 12 mod four. We'll do, in fact, maybe I'll just write out all of the problems first. Let's do 16 mod five. Let's do 22 mod eight. And let's do 27 mod six. I think those will be, those will be good. Okay, 12 mod four. So does four divide evenly into 12? Uh, yes, four times three is 12, right? So the remainder is zero. All right, how many times does five divide evenly into 16? The answer is three, right? Five, 10, 15. And the remainder would then be one. How many times does eight go into 22? Eight, 16, 24. So 24 doesn't work, so it's gonna be 16. And then 22 subtract 16 is six is the remainder, right? And then 27 mod six, um, six goes into 27 four times, six times four is 24, so a remainder of three. So an important thing to note here is if you're trying to figure out if a number divides evenly into another number, then you can just check if say a mod b equals zero. Right? If A mod B equals zero, then that means B divides into A an even number of times. So A is a multiple of B. So in Go, the module operator is just that percent sign, right? So seven mod three, um, this expression is going to evaluate to one. We'll also need to know about the logical AND operator and the logical OR operator, which are double ampersand and double bar uh, respectively. The logical AND operator operates on two Boolean values and only returns true if both sides are true, right? This and that. The OR operator just needs at least one side to be true, right? In order for the entire expression to evaluate to true. Let's jump into the assignment. It says we're hiring engineers at Textio, so it's time to brush up on the classic FizzBuzz game. Coding exercises have been dramatically overused in coding interviews around the world. Complete the FizzBuzz function that prints the numbers 1 to 100 inclusive, each on their own line, 
but substitutes multiples of three for the text fizz, multiples of five for buzz, and multiples of three and five for fizz buzz. Okay, so I'm gonna do a for loop for i colon equals zero, i is less than 100, actually less than or equal to because it's set inclusive, right? i plus plus. Okay, um, we need to think about the order in which kind of these things can happen. So we're checking for multiples of three, multiples of five, and multiples of three and five. So we actually should check for multiples of three and five first, because something could be that and one of the other two conditions, right? It could be a multiple of three and five, and just a multiple of three. That makes sense. Maybe it'll make sense when I type it out. So if I mod, three is zero, and I mod, mod three is zero, oops, not three and three, three and five, then we'll print this buzz, right? Else if I mod three, zero, then we'll just print, is else if i mod five is zero we'll just print buzz otherwise we'll print i right if they're both multiples fizz buzz if it's just three fizz if it's just five buzz okay let's try that Cannot forget to import the formatting package. Okay. Let's see. Fizz buzz, one, two, fizz, four, buzz, five, fizz, seven, eight, fizz, buzz, one. Oh, haha. <laughs> one through 100, that would have been close. I almost didn't follow instructions. I was like, why do we have a fizz buzz up front? That doesn't, uh, that doesn't make sense. Okay, cool. So one, two, fizz, four, buzz, right? Five is a multiple of five. 10 is a multiple of five. 15 is a multiple of five and three. So this is looking correct to me. I'm gonna go ahead and submit that. So in the last assignment, we kind of uh, did a if else chain within our for loop, but there's another way that we can write guard clauses within loops um, so that we don't have to necessarily do that if else chaining. Um, if we don't want to. Uh, the continue keyword stops the current iteration of a loop and continues to the next iteration. So continue is a powerful way to use guard clauses, right? So we write our for loop, and then if some condition happens, um, we can kind of bail out of the body of the for loop early and just continue on to the next iteration. The break keyword is similar in that it stops the current iteration, but instead of continuing on to the next iteration, it just ends the loop entirely. Moving on to the assignment. It says, as an Easter egg, we decided to reward our users with a free text message if they send a prime number of text messages this year, because Textio is, is run by a bunch of nerds. Complete the, pri the print primes function. It should print all of the prime numbers up to and including max. Max. It should skip any numbers that are not prime. Okay, so here's the pseudocode. Print primes max. So let's convert this pseudocode into real Go code. So... Um, for n in range two to max plus one. So we're gonna do four n colon equals two. N is less than max plus one. N plus plus. Okay. If n is two, if n is two, n is prime, print it. FMT dot print line n. And we need to continue, right? Continue to the next iteration. We're basically saying, okay, this n is prime, we'll print it, and then we can move on. All right, if n is even, so if n mod two is zero, right? That's an easy way to check if something is even um, and not make your way onto our programmer humor. <laughs> um, if n mod two is zero, and is not prime, skip to the next end. So uh, we do not print and we just skip, okay? Next, we do a nested for loop here for i in range. So for i colon equals three 
to the square root of n plus 1. Okay, this is actually interesting. I could use the math.square root function here. That would be a valid way. But if I want to stay in integer land, which I think I do, I can do... Um, I can instead square i, so i times i, oops, i times i, and see if it's less than n plus 1. Right? Does that make sense? So instead of doing i is less than the square root of n, I can do i squared is less than n. Right? That, that makes sense to me. Cool. Um, cause basically we're just saying we only need to check up to the square root of N. We know that if we go higher than that, um, but like we don't care about numbers higher than the square root. Um, cool. Next one is I plus plus. If I could be multiplied into N. So if N mod I, oops. If, if I goes into n evenly, so if that results in a zero, n is not prime, skip to the next n. Okay, so I can't continue here because if I continue here, I'll just skip to the next i and I want to skip to the next n. So I think what I do here is I do something like is prime true here, I set is prime is false and break. And then at the end of the for loop, I can say if not is prime continue. Okay. Okay. Uh, if n is not prime, skip to next n. Yeah. So we'll break out of this loop. Right? We'll break out of this loop. And then we'll continue. Cool. Now, I just want to be clear. There are other ways to write this function. I'm kind of, uh, on purpose, using lots of continues and breaks uh, so that we can get some practice with it. Cool. Um, N is prime printed. So if we get all the way to here without any of these kind of guard clauses being triggered, then N is just prime. So fmt.println N. Let's run that and just sanity check um, our code. Prime's up to 10. Two, three, five, seven. Yep, right? That's two is a prime number. It's kind of like the only even prime number. And nine is an odd number before 10, but it's not prime because it's evenly divided into by three, right? Maybe I should have even explained what prime numbers are in the first place in case you're not familiar. Um, there is... Uh, there is a link here if you want to go read more about them. But basically, a prime number is any number where the numbers that multiply evenly into it are anything except one in itself. So if it has any multiples or if it has anything that multiplies into it that isn't just one and itself, it's prime, right? So seven, you can't, you can't multiply two into seven. You can't multiply three into seven. You can't multiply four into seven, right? Um, so it's prime. Um, let's just uh, look at a couple more of the exa examples. So up to 20, we got two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, 17, 19, right? Again, we're skipping 15 because it has the multiples three and five. Prime's up to 30, um, again, skipping 25, um, and also skipping 27 because nine divides evenly into 27 as, as does three. Cool. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. And then just kind of as, a, as an explanation of, of why this pseudocode works, we're skipping even numbers because they can't be prime, right? If, it, if two divides into something, it's not prime. Um, we only check up to the square root because anything higher than the square root has no chance of multiplying evenly into n, right? So like, for example, take the number 16. Its square root is four. Nothing over four could possibly evenly divide into 16 that the square root couldn't, right? So like, for example, eight divides evenly into 16, but that's only because four and two already do. Okay, uh, we start checking at two because one is not prime. One's kind of a special case number. Okay, so this is looking correct to me. I'm gonna go ahead and submit it. 
Let's talk a little bit about how arrays work under the hood. So if you're familiar with the idea of arrays from JavaScript or lists from Python, arrays in Go are similar. You can think of an array as just an ordered list of items. So we usually denote arrays with square brackets. And an array of, say, three integers might be something like two, three, one. Right, so we've got three integers stored in our array. The first thing is the integer two, it's stored at index zero. The next one is a three, it's stored at index one. And finally, we have a one stored at index two. Now, here's the big difference between arrays in Go and arrays in JavaScript or lists in Python. In Go, arrays have a fixed size. So the type of this array would be three, int. Okay. So inside of the square brackets, we kind of indicate the size of the array. And then after we indicate the type of thing in the array. So this array's type is an array of three integers. In languages like JavaScript, or again, like lists in Python, arrays are kind of dynamically resized. They don't have a fixed size. You can add things onto the end, you can push stuff onto the beginning, but in Go, arrays are always fixed. So to show you what this looks like in code, um, basically we can create a new array of 10 integers, like this. It will initialize all of the indices in the array to the zero value. So this would be an array of 10 zeros, basically. Um, if we know what we want to store at each index in the array, then we can use an initialized literal here. So we're saying we have an array of six integers, and in the first index I want a two, and then a three, and then a five, and so on. So let's jump into an assignment and see how this works. The assignment says, when a message is not responded to, we allow our clients to have up to two additional messages that are sent as nudging reminders. Get message with retries returns an array of three strings where index zero is the first message. If the first message is not answered by the recipient, we send the second and then we'd send the third. Update get message with retries to return the three following strings in an array. Click here to sign up. Pretty please click here. We beg you to sign up. Okay, cool. So this is pretty straightforward. Here we're just going to return an array and you can see the return type up here. It's a string array of size three. So we just need to create an array literal and return it. And in this case, we want an array of strings of size three. So array string size three, and we can use these curly brackets um, to be kind of where we put the string literal. So the first string is going to be, click here to sign up, right? This is the first message that's sent. Pretty please click here. And we beg you, we beg you to sign up. And then just remember that in Go, you do have to put that last comma um, if you're going to use a new line. Okay, um, pretty straightforward, right? Let's see how that works. Sending, sending to Bob, click here to sign up, they responded. Sending to Alice, click here to sign up, pretty please click here, they responded. Okay, this is looking, this is looking good to me. Gonna kinda get a peek at the uh at the test suite. Cool. Let's submit it and see how we did. So we've talked about how arrays are fixed in size, and you might be wondering, well, that's not very useful. Why would I care about an ordered list of things if I can't even add to or remove from the list? Well, that's where slices come into play. So let's draw out a simple array. I'll do it in yellow. Let's just say it's storing some numbers. So we might have some numbers like six, three, two, six, five. And I'll draw the indices. Let's do that in pink. So the index of the first item is zero, and then one, two, three, four, right? And the size of the array is five, which in Go, we would write like, like this. We would say we have an array of five items and they are integers. Okay, cool. So we understand what an array is, but what's a slice? Well, slices in Go are written with this syntax, open close bracket, int. 
and you'll notice that the size is missing. Okay, so a slice is a dynamically sized, flexible view into an array. So slices are built on top of arrays. So that means, for example, that I could create a slice that just looks at this kind of middle portion of this array. If I were to write this in code, I would basically say if this array is named A, so A is this yellow array here, if I want to create a slice on top of that array, then I could write B colon equals A from, we're using square brackets here, index one up to, but not including index four. Okay, so the first, the first number is inclusive, the second number is exclusive. And now B is this slice of kind of just that middle view of the array. And here's the important thing to understand. In Go, we actually almost never deal with arrays directly. 99 times out of 100, you'll just be working with slices because slices provide a much better developer experience. They're built on top of arrays for kind of memory management reasons, which we'll talk about in just a second, but you really want to be working um, for the most part with slices because you don't have to worry about that fixed size problem. So just to review slices sort of in code, um, we can create an array literal like this, right? This is an array because we have, we have the uh, size of the array there, six integers. And then we can create a slice on top of the array like this. Cool. Um, let's jump into the assignment so you can kind of get a feel for how this all works. Okay. The assignment says, retries are a premium feature now. Textio's free users only get one retry message while pro members get an unlimited amount. Complete the get message with retries for plan function. It takes a plan variable as input. That's a string, matches up to one of these. Um, if the plan is a pro plan, return all of the strings from get message with retries. Okay, cool. So get message with retries, it looks like returns an array of three strings. Okay, let's just jump right into it. If plan is plan pro, then we'll return all messages, right? Return all the strings, yep. And a nil error. Otherwise, if the plan is plan free, return the first two strings, right? The, the original string and kind of the, one, the first retry message. So return all messages and we're going to slice it from index zero up to, but not including index two. So it'll be indexes zero and one, right? Two, two strings. And then we'll also return nil. And finally, if it's neither of those, return an error that says unsupported plan. So return nil errors dot new unsupported plan. And nil um, is just kind of the zero value of a slice. Cool, um, this is looking good. We need to make sure we import the errors package. Let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. Oof, we got an error. Cannot use all messages, variable of type array size three string as slice of string. Okay, cool. So we have an array, all messages is an array, not a slice, right? So we actually need to slice this to change its type but we want all of the values inside of the array. So we're just gonna use this colon syntax to get access to everything in the underlying array. Let's run that again. Cool, sending to Osgur, click here to sign up, pretty please click here. So that's two, two messages with no response. Um, and I'm guessing because, yep, Osgur's on a free plan. Jeff is, Jeff is on a pro plan. So he gets all three messages. This is looking correct to me. These next few questions will reference kind of excerpts from the Effective Go book, which is definitely a book I recommend reading, although it is a bit out of date. It was written a while ago, um, and the authors have basically made the decision not to update um, the book over time, kind of keeping it as a snapshot. So it has a lot of great stuff in there, and Go has very strong backwards compatibility, so it's still a great read. Um, just kind of be aware that it hasn't been updated um, in a while. Cool. Um, that said, everything we explained here, I'll obviously provide uh, context um, for. So 
The thing that's important to understand in this section is that slices are references to kind of what goes on underneath the hood with arrays. So what that really means to you as a developer is when you use slices, and more specifically when you pass them around, say, into a function, you're actually passing a reference, which means if you change the values in that slice within a function, the caller the person who called your function, or I should say the bit of code that called your function, will actually have access to those changes. It will see those changes, even if you don't explicitly return the slice again. Now, this is different um, from sort of normal primitive values, which are passed by value. You might remember us talking about passed by value earlier in the course. Typically, if you pass in, say, a string or an integer into a function, and then within that function, you change it, the caller won't see those changes. You have your own copy of that data. That's That does not hold true with slices. So just understand that when you pass a slice into a function, it might get modified. Okay, cool. Um, so which references the other is the question. Do arrays reference slices or do slices reference arrays? And the answer is that slices reference arrays. The next question is, can multiple slices point to the same array? Is that true or false? Multiple slices point to the same array. Um, that is true. Remember, slices are just kind of a view into an array. So it makes sense that you can have multiple views into the same underlying array. So multiple slices can point to the same array. Now, here's that question um, that we talked about earlier. A function that only has access to a slice can modify the underlying array. The answer to this is that is true. Even if the function doesn't return that slice, it can modify the values in the underlying array. Let's talk about how slices work, um, kind of specifically how they work in relation to your computer's hardware or your computer's RAM. Now, RAM just stands for random access memory. It's where variables are stored. The best way to think about RAM is just a mapping of addresses, so address, to data. Right? It gives us a place to store stuff. So, for example, at address 0, we might have some data that represents, I don't know, the number 4. right? And then at address 1, we might have some data representing the number 5. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. But you get the idea. We have addresses, and we have data associated with that address. Slices and the arrays that they are built on top of are stored in contiguous memory. Basically, what that means is a slice or an array is an address in memory where the slice or array starts. So for example, at address zero, we might say this is the start of a slice. And the slice actually continues for the next you know, several uh, kind of bytes of data. Let's say that it's a slice of length three, so it actually would reach across all three of these addresses. So if you have an array or a slice um, and its address is zero and its length is three, then you know kind of how many uh, stores of data in memory um, your slice or array will use. Now, this is primarily important for performance because all of the data is stored next to each other in memory, it's gonna be faster to kind of iterate over all of the values in our slice. If we stored each index in kind of random places in memory, it would take a lot longer to go collect all of that data just you know, from a hardware perspective. However, there is a downside to having to store all of our memory um, kind of next to each other. Let's pretend that we have this slice or this array that starts at address zero and has a length of three. So it's using kind of these three addresses in memory or these three bytes of memory. And let's say here at address three, we're storing a different value. Maybe we're just storing, I don't know, the number six, um, but this is a different variable. This is some other variable. The problem is if we want to expand our slice, say add another value to it, we're going to run into the next thing in physical memory. That's a huge problem. We don't want to overwrite some other variable just because we're growing our slice. So this is why arrays are fixed in size. If we just can't grow them, then we'll never have this overwriting problem. 
So the, the question, of course, is how do slices do it, right? So, well, slices are built on top of arrays. And basically what happens is I can draw this out for us. When we want to grow a slice whose underlying array has run out of room, right? So we have our slice um, built on top of this length three array, and we want to grow it into a length of four. What happens under the hood, and this all kind of happens without you seeing it as a developer. You'll, you'll see later when we get to the syntax, it's actually really simple. Um, what happens is this data is copied into a new location in memory. So we just take this four, we put it over here, five over here. Uh, actually, I'm gonna use the same colors. That would probably be easier to understand. So four comes over here, five comes over here, three comes over here. And then let's say that we, um, we know we want to grow our slice significantly. So the new underlying array let's say we'll have a length of six now. So it had three here. Now the new array has allocated, pre-allocated, right? We've essentially reserved memory for up to six spaces. Let me draw all of that out. Cool. And these addresses over here are gonna be totally different, right? Maybe it's address 15, address 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Cool, so all the data from the old array gets copied over, and now we're able to expand our slice, our slice to a length of four, right? So here, our slice was length three, and the underlying array was length three. Now we've copied over the data, we've created a much larger underlying array, and now we have a slice of length four. Maybe we wanted to append, say, the number two to the end of the slice. So again, as the developer, you're not going to have to do all of this array management manually, but it's important to understand that this is what's going on under the hood because it has performance implications. Copying data isn't super efficient. If you're copying data from one section in memory to another um, over and over and over again, it can slow down your programs. So now that we've covered all of that memory stuff and how it works under the hood, what does that mean in code, right? Well. This is how we can create a slice without explicitly creating an array under the hood, right? So this will automatically create an array under the hood for us if we use this syntax. So this is basically saying, I want a new slice of integers. I want its initial length to be five. So the length of the slice, right? The length of the view into the array will be five and the capacity will be 10. So the capacity is kind of the total space that we have to grow the slice until we need to allocate a new array under the hood. So you could almost think of this capacity as just the length of the underlying array. Now, I told you that you don't need to think about the size of the underlying array, and that is true. Typically, you'll actually use this syntax where you don't even specify a capacity. So if you do not specify a capacity, it defaults to the length. So the kind of length of the underlying array for a slice of integers with length five will just be five. And if you grow it past that, the memory copying will happen and you'll create a new underlying array. Now, you might be thinking, oh, that's terrible for performance. In reality, it's not that bad. The only reason you would start to kind of futz with specific capacities and optimizing your memory copying is if you're having performance problems. Generally speaking, the convenience of keeping your code simple and easy to understand is going to outweigh kind of the performance cost that it'll have. It's a, it's a very small one, generally speaking. And then it's also just worth pointing out that we can also create slice literals, right? So this just creates a new slice of length three um, and initializes these three values into that slice rather than what would happen up here, which is th that we create kind of all of the zero values um, to fill out the slice kind of of the given length. So this would be a slice of five zeros, right? And then to just point out two more things regarding syntax, there is a built-in length function that returns the length of a slice and a built-in cap function that returns the capacity. So now that we are experts on slices, let's jump into the assignment. It says, we send a lot of text messages at Textio and our API is getting slow and unresponsive. So I just mentioned how you probably shouldn't worry about performance. Well, here's a case where you should worry about performance, right? You shouldn't worry about performance until, well, it starts to become a problem. So we're starting to have a problem with um, this memory copying being slow. 
So we've been asked to pre-allocate our slices. It says, um, if we know the rough size of the slice before we fill it up, we can make our program faster by creating the slice with that size ahead of time. All right, so complete the message get message costs function. It takes a slice of messages and returns a slice of message costs. Float 64s, right? Reallocate a slice for the message cost of the same length as the message slice. Let's go ahead and start off with that. So costs. We'll make a new slice, and it's going to be a slice of float 64 and a length of length messages. Right? Same, same length. Cool. Um, now we want to fill the cost fill the cost slice with cost for each message. So let's go ahead and iterate over each message. So for i colon equals zero, i is less than length of messages, i plus plus. Let's get the message at that index. Messages at zero. Oh, not a zero. Excuse me. At i. Okay, the cost in the cost slice should correspond to the message in the message slice at the same index. The cost of a message is the length of the message multiplied by 0 0.01. So cost equals the length of the message multiplied by 0 0.01. That's going to need to be cast to a float 64. Perfect. Cool. And then we just need to save that into the costs slice. So costs at i equals cost. Right? correspond with the same index and we know that that um, that index already exists because we pre-allocated it to the correct size cool so now we can just return costs let's go ahead and run that and see if these make sense okay these costs line up with the length of the messages so this is looking good to me Let's review the difference between the length and the capacity of a slice. Sometimes this can be a little bit confusing. The length is the thing that you're going to care about most often. The length just tells you how many things are in that slice, right? If I have five items, then the length of the slice is going to be five. The capacity, the capacity of a slice reports the maximum length the slice can assume, right? Before it gets kind of reassigned into a new array. So capacity is really, again, only something you're going to care about if you're worried about performance, but the length you'll be concerned about just for kind of normal business logic reasons, right? Just because you want to know how many things are stored in your slice. So to answer this question, it says, what does the cap function return? Answers are the last element of a slice or the maximum length the slice of the slice before reallocation of the underlying array is necessary. And the answer is going to be the maximum length. The next question is, what does the length function return? Current length of the slice or the maximum length of the slice before the reallocation is necessary? And the answer is going to be the current length of the slice. And we haven't really talked about this yet, but I'll just kind of inform you as we answer this question. It says, what do length and cap, the, the two functions, do when a slice is nil? Do they panic or return zero? And the answer is that they return zero. They are safe functions to call. Um, they won't make your code panic and error and crash, right? Um, I don't know how much we've talked about panicking up to this point in the course, but panicking just means runtime error that's unrecoverable. Unrecoverable. Um, generally speaking, you don't want your code panicking and you want to write your code in such a way that it can't panic. Um, so again, length and cap here um, are safe. They will never panic if um, a slice happens to be um, the zero value, which is nil. Time for some variadic functions. Um, this sounds like a really complex thing, but we've actually been using variadic functions up to this point in the course because the s print f, print f, print line, all of those functions are actually variadic. So a variadic function receives the variadic arguments as a slice. Let's take a look at the syntax. So here we have a sum function and its function signature is just maybe a little bit different than you're used to. Basically, we have this nums uh, parameter, which is of type dot, 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 int. Now, here's the thing. Dot, 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 int, as far as the function definition is concerned, is just a slice. We treat this just like we would if it said, you know, square brackets, int. It's, it's just a slice of integers. 
So you're probably sitting there thinking, well, why can't I just use a slice of integers? Why can't we just keep it simple? Why do we have to do everything differently? Ah, okay. Well, uh, don't don't worry too much. Um, the difference is on the callers side. So the function definition is the same, whether you use dot, 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 int or square brackets int. But if you use a variadic function, then the calling code, so the code that uses the sum function can actually pass in kind of any number of arguments and they'll come into the function as a slice of integers. So here we could call, for example, sum one, two, three, and the sum function gets a slice of integers with you know the values one, two, and three in the first three indexes of the slice. Um, this means that the caller could also call sum one comma two, right? And we'd have a slice of length two. So it kind of just gives the caller of the function a different syntax um, and specifically kind of a more flexible syntax uh, for how they're able to pass in sort of a dynamic number of arguments into the function. Now, again, we've already been using variadic functions. You probably remember <laughs> the print line function, right? This is how we print text to the console. Um, it's a variadic function, dot, 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 interface, right? So it can take any number of arbitrary inputs and it sort of prints them all out with new lines in between each element. Now, along with variadic function definitions, we also have another operator called the spread operator. And the spread operator is kind of like the inverse of a variadic function. By using the spread operator, we're able to take a slice of values and pass them into a variadic function. So this isn't the intended use case 100% of the time. Otherwise, you just define your, your function to take a slice of strings and you'd pass in a slice of strings. But if you do have a function that is already variadic and you want to pass in a slice as the variable part, then you can use this spread operator, this trailing dot, 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 to sort of spread out, in this case, this name slice into the variadic function. Let's get our hands dirty with this. So it says, we need to sum up the costs of all individual messages so that we can send an end of month bill to our customers. Complete the sum function so that it returns the sum of all of its inputs. Cool. So this is gonna be very similar to this sum function, right? The, the difference here is that we're using float 64s and we're going to write it from scratch uh, so that we get our own our own crack at it. Okay, so first things first, uh, let's create kind of the default sum, which is going to be 0 0.0.0. 0 .0. So uh, let's say total. Now remember, we can treat nums as just another slice of float 64s. So for i colon equals zero, i is less than length of nums, i plus plus, total plus equals nums at i, right? Return total. Cool, pretty straightforward. Um, let's go ahead and run that. So summing three costs, bill for the month, $6, five costs, 15, 10 costs, 55. Do these match up? Looks like, yep, that should be six. Six plus four plus five, that's six plus nine, that's 15. Yep, this is looking good. I'm gonna go ahead and submit that. Now I told you that resizing slices is possible. We just haven't really done it yet. Um, that's what the append function is for. So the built-in append function is actually a variadic function, but it allows us to just add new things to the end of a slice, and it automatically takes care of adjusting the length and the capacity of the slice accordingly, right? Allocating new underlying arrays as necessary. Now, here are your syntax options for using the append function. If you just want to append one thing, then you'll use this top option. Let's say we have a slice called slice. We want to append a variable called one thing to it. Basically, we call the append function, we pass in the slice we want to append to as the first uh, item, we pass the variable that we want to append onto the end as the next thing, and then we reassign back into that same slice. Now, because append is a variadic function, we can append multiple things, right? So um, if we want to append the first thing and then the second thing after that, 
um, we could do it like this. And obviously we could also use the spread operator if we want to. To be 100% honest though, 99% of the time you'll be using this first one because you'll just be appending items one at a time. Let's hop into the assignment. It says we've been asked to bucket costs for an entire month into the cost that occurred on each day of the month. So complete the get costs by day function. It's return a slice of float 64s where each element is the total cost for that day. Okay, so we have like this giant list of costs and we need to kind of uh, condense all the costs that happened on a specific day into one index for that day. Makes sense to me. The length of the slice should be equal to the number of days represented in the costs slice, including any days that have no costs up to the last day represented in the slice. Okay, cool. So if we have costs just for, say, the first month or the first day of the month and the fifth day of the month, then we should have um, kind of five indexes in our resulting array with kind of a non-zero value in the first and the fifth indexes zeros in the middle and nothing after that. Okay, here we've got an example. Um, given this input, so day cost, so a, we have costs on days on days zero, one, and five, this would be the resulting array, right? $4 on the first day, 5.2 on the second day, because we sum those, right? And then on that last day, we'd have 2.5. Cool, let's write the function. So first things first, we're going to need, um, we're going to need a slice to append into. So costs by day, we'll make a new, uh, a new slice of float 64. And here I'm just using the slice literal syntax um, instead of the make function. They're pretty dang similar. Now we're probably going to want to iterate over all of the costs. So for i colon equals zero, i is less than length of costs, i plus plus. Costs at i. Okay, so a cost is this structure here. And we can take a look at the day there. Um, we're going to need to figure out basically when we're a Ending to this costs by day slice and when we're just adding to an existing index. So I think the easiest thing to do would basically be to say um, if day is greater than the length of costs by day. Actually, it's going to be a four. So like while the day is greater than the length of cost by day. We're going to append cost by day equals append cost by day 0, 0.0, right? So in effect, this for loop here just says, if I've encountered a day that I don't yet have room for, I'm going to grow the slice by just appending zeros until I have enough room. So once we're done with that loop, we should be able to assign directly into the costs by day by basically saying cost by day plus equals cost dot value, right? Because it starts at zero. So then we can just add, we can just add the cost. And again, if, if the day is less than cost by day, then we just don't do this step. We just skip over this for loop. So that's looking correct to me. I'm gonna go ahead and return costs by day. And let's run that code. See what we get. Undefined day. What did I screw up here? Yeah, it needs to be cost.day, right? Access that field. Invalid operation, cost by day plus equals cost.value. So cost.value is a float 64. Costs by day is a slice of flow 64s. Right, because this is a slice. So costs by day at, at cost.day, right? Right, because our the slice that we're returning um, 
the indexes in each or the indexes of the slice represent each day in the month. So we need to index back into the day. Okay, try that. Whoa, what do we got? Panic, runtime error, index out of range, zero with length zero. Okay. What did we screw up? So, somewhere we are indexing into a slice where the value doesn't, like the, the, the index that we're indexing with is outside the range of the slice. So um, we haven't really talked about this. This is probably great that we ran into this bug. Um, if you try to index, which is this operation here, so like this is indexing into index five, right? But here we're indexing into cost.day, which holds an integer. Um, if you try to index into an index that is outside the length of the slice. So you have a slice of length, say three, and you try to access index six, then you'll encounter this error. That, that's what we're seeing here. So it looks like that's what we are doing. So for cost.day is greater than the length. Now let's think about that. If the day is five and the length is five, we're not going to do our growth. So I'm actually, I think I have an off by one error here, right? I actually, what I actually want to do is say, if the cost, if the, if the cost that day is greater than or equal to the length, right? Because an array or a slice of length four actually only has three um, kind of indexes i mean it has four indexes but they start at zero so like length four the indexes are zero one two and three right let's go ahead and run that again cool no more panic day one one dollar or day zero one dollar day one five ten day two two fifty let's see if that lines up with the test suite So here it looks like day zero should have one. Day one should have, yep, 5.1 if we add those together. And day three should have five point, what's it, 6.3? Yep, 6.3. Okay, this is looking correct to me. Slices can hold other slices, right? This kind of creates a 2D matrix um, of values, right? So for example, here, a 10 by 10 matrix of integers would look something like this, where the first slice is just a slice of slices. Hopefully that makes some amount of sense. If not, don't worry, we'll get into the assignment here in just a second. So it says, we support various graphs and dashboards on Textile to display message analytics for our users. The UI for our graphs and charts is built on top of a grid system. Let's build that grid logic. So this is super common in graphics development, right? We're kind of building on 2D screens. So we need sort of an X and a Y um, cell within a matrix, which is again, often represented as a slice of slices. The assignment says, complete the create matrix function. It takes a number of rows and columns and returns a 2D slice of integers where the value of each cell is I times J, where I and J are the indexes of the row and column respectively. Okay, cool. So create matrix, we get two integers representing how big we want the matrix to be, and we just have to return the matrix. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and start building that out. First, we need to create um, or initialize the matrix. So let's say matrix, slice, let's use make, make, slice, slice, int, All right? And we can just initialize it to a length of zero. It doesn't matter. We're going to grow it. And for i colon equals zero, i is less than length of rows, i plus plus. And then we're going to need an inner for loop, manage j, which is going to deal with the number of columns, columns j plus plus. Okay, so what do we do um, when we get to the first row? Well, the first thing we need to do is make a new slice to represent the row. So we'll say row make, and we can just do 
a, a single slice of integers. Again, row, uh, length of zeros is fine. Um, we could pre-allocate, but it probably doesn't matter too much at this point. Um, and then for each j, we're now going to append into the row. So we do row equals append row i times j, I believe was the formula, right? We want every cell to be the result of i times j. So the values will sort of grow out um, as the matrix gets larger and larger. Cool, so that's adding the, like this inner loop is adding values to each individual row. And then we just need to append the row to the matrix. So matrix equals append matrix row. And then when we're done appending all of the rows to the matrix, we can return the matrix itself. Go ahead and run that. Invalid argument, rows, variable of type int for length. Let's see what we got here. Where did I screw up this time? Right. I don't know why I'm checking a length here. Rows is just an integer. It's not a slice with a size. Let's try that again. Cool, creating a three by three matrix. Does that math check out? One times one is one, one times two is two, two times two is four. Yep, that looks good. Cool, let's submit it. I want to show you a common pitfall that you might fall into uh, when dealing with slices and how you can just outright avoid it. Um, this is something you should pretty much never do. When you want to append to um, other slice, in this case, you want to append elements to other slice, you should always reassign into the same slice. So this should read other slice equals append other slice element. You don't want to be appending um, kind of into one thing and reassigning into a separate slice. You'll run into some bugs. And we're gonna talk about how that works right now. So in this first example, we have these slices A, B, and C. And by the way, I would highly recommend coming here on boot dev so that you can actually kind of look and puzzle through what's going on in the code rather than just seeing it on the screen. Um, but basically we have these slices and when we append to them, we're, we're breaking the rule. Basically we're, uh, appending for example here, um, four onto a, but then returning the value the value returned by append, we are kind of saving it into a new slice called B, which again, you, you generally should not do. You should just save it back into the same slice, A. Um, but anyways, we're going along um, kind of doing that pattern. And at the end, you'll notice that no nothing too terrible happened. Um, basically, we ended up with an A with three zeros, B had four appended to it properly, and C had five appended to it properly. So you could kind of take away from this example, well, maybe there's nothing wrong. Maybe we can just kind of uh, break the rule and append into new slices. Seems like everything's working like I'd expect. And it's worth pointing out that we can even print out the addresses in memory of the slices B and C and see that the addresses are different. In other words, when we call this append functions where we append five onto um, you know, the slice A and save it back into the variable C, we can see that actually C is being kind of copied into a new location. So again, everything's kind of working as we'd expect. Now it's really in this example too that something very strange happens. If we look down here, we're appending onto J the value four, and then we're appending onto G here, the value five. But the interesting thing is that after we append five to G, if we print out J again, we can see that J was actually changed kind of under the hood, right? Up here, J had four in its fourth index. And then we never touched J again directly, but by appending onto G, we actually screwed up J. We mutated J. And the reason for that is because in this example, because of the way we've sloppily used the append function, 
G and J actually point to the same address in memory. So mutating G changed J. Now, I already mentioned that we were doing the same thing up here, right? We were using the same kind of sloppy use of the append function that I'm recommending to avoid, but we only had the bug in example two. And the reason for that is because the original slice in example two has a capacity of eight, while the original slice in example one had a capacity of three. So what that means is when we used the append function in the first example, once we went over the capacity, we allocated a new underlying array, which is why we got different memory addresses. And so when we mutate C here, C is in a different place in memory than B, so they're kind of operating independently, which is, again, what you usually want in your code. However, because the capacity was already large enough in example two, there was no need for the append function to create a new underlying array. So G and J point to the same, the same array in memory. Again, which means if we mutate G under the hood, we are just mutating J. So again, the way you can avoid all of this headache is to just not do this, right? Append onto the same slice pretty much every time, unless you have like some crazy specific reason not to do so, which like, I'm skeptical that exists. I certainly haven't run into it in, you know, many years of writing application code in Go. So the question for this quiz is, why is five the final value in the last index of array J, right? So why, why did we have a five here, even though we appended four? Um, and the answers are J and G point to the same underlying array. So G's append over row J. The Go team is trolling. I think that's obviously not it. Uh, and because append only works properly when the number of elements is less than 10, uh, that would be very silly. So it's it's definitely this middle one. We're overriding the same location in memory. Next question on the same topic is, why doesn't the bug regarding slices J and G in example two occur in example one as well? And the, the answers are because there are fewer elements and Go's runtime can't handle more than eight. <laughs> elements, that would be awful, um, or the array's cap is exceeded so a new underlying array is allocated, and, and that one is the answer. So the next question is how can you best avoid these types of bugs? Don't use the append function, always assign the result of the append function back into the same slice, or always assign the result of the append function to a new slice. Well, it's not using a new slice, that's how we got into this trouble in the first place, and we definitely want to use the append function, it's pretty useful. So again, always assign the result of the append function back into the same slice. You'll avoid a lot of headache that way. Finally, some syntactic sugar to help us iterate over the elements of a slice. You've probably been wondering for the majority of this chapter, Ugh, do I have to do this like i equals zero, i is less than the length, every time I wanna iterate over the elements of a slice. Other languages have syntactic sugar to make it easier, so does Go. So the syntax is pretty simple. Um, this is it right here. And basically by writing it this way, index at each iteration of the loop will be equal to the index in the loop, starting at zero, right? So zero, one, two, three, and then element is the value associated with that index, right? And then obviously slice here is the name of the slice. So range is really the interesting keyword that allows us to iterate over everything stored in a slice. To give a more concrete example, here we have a slice of strings called fruits and we can range over the fruits. And if we print I and fruit in this example, then we print zero apple, one banana, two grape, and so on. Let's jump into the assignment. It says we need to be able to quickly detect bad words in the messages that our system sends. Complete the index of first bad word function. Okay, so that's this. Um, it finds any bad words in the message. If it finds any bad words in the message, it should return the index of the first bad word in the message slice. This will help us filter out naughty words uh, from our messaging system. If no bad words are found, we'll return negative one instead. Use the range keyword. Okay, cool. So the bad words themselves are defined for us and passed into our function. And then the message itself is already broken up into words, it looks like, and passed in as an array of strings, right? So we can, I'm kind of just figuring this out by looking uh, looking down here. So we have an, a slice of bad words and a slice of words in the message. Hey there, John. Okay, cool. 
So um, let's start by iterating over all of the words in the message, right? Seems like a reasonable place to start. So for I word colon equals range message. And then we want to check and see if, if one of these words is equal to one of the bad words. So we're gonna use a nested loop actually. We'll do J bad word in range bad words, right? And then here we can say if word equals equals bad word, that means we found the bad word and we can return, we want to return the index, so we return I, right? That would be the index of the bad word. Otherwise, if we don't find a bad word, we'll just keep going. Um, in fact, we'll just keep going through all the bad words and then we'll keep going through all the rest of the words. And if we get to the end of everything without finding any matches, then we can just return negative one. Makes sense, right? Cool, let's run that. J declared and not used. Right. Um, so we've come across this syntax before. We can ignore variables with an underscore, right? Let's run that. Let's take a look at our test suite. Scanning message, hey there, John, for bad words. Index negative one. That means none were found, right? Which makes sense. We didn't have any. Scanning message, uh, oh, my, frick, for bad words. Frick is a bad word. Index three, okay, this is looking good to me. I'm gonna go ahead and submit that. If you're familiar with object literals in JavaScript or Python dictionaries, then maps in Go are essentially the same thing. Maps are just a way to associate a key with a value. So let's take a look at this example. We create a new map with this syntax here. We're gonna use this built-in make function and then pass in the type of the map. So map of string to integer. So we're mapping strings to integers. And we're going to say inside of the ages map, we're going to set the key John to the integer 37. So again, we're mapping that name John to the value 37. Rather than creating an empty map and then kind of adding key value pairs one at a time, we can also declare the entire map up front and use kind of this colon syntax to separate the keys and the values. And then we can also check how many keys, I guess keys and values, are in the map by using the built-in length function, similarly to how you would use it on a slice. Um, so in this case, we create a new map, we create two keys, each with their associated values, and then by printing the length, we'll just print the number two. So let's jump right into the assignment. That's usually the best way um, to get an idea for how all this syntax works. Assignment says, we can speed up our contact info lookups by using a map. Looking up a value in a map by its key is much faster than searching through a slice. So when we look up something in a map by a given key, that's going to be an instant lookup. If we had stored it in a slice, then we'd have to search through the entire slice sort of index by index looking for the value that we want. So maps can be a great way to make our code more efficient. The assignment says complete the get user map function. It takes a slice of names and a slice of phone numbers and returns a map of name to user structs and potentially an error. Okay, so let me expand our coding window here. Okay, so we're returning a map of string to user structs. Looks like the user struct is defined right here. If the length of names and phone numbers is not equal, return error with the string invalid sizes. The first name in the name slice matches the first number and so on. Okay, cool. So first things first, we're gonna have to create a new map. So we'll do um, user map, colon equals, and I'm just gonna create a literal, a new map literal. Actually, no, I won't. I'll, do, I'll use the syntax from up here. This works just fine. So we'll use the make function. So make map of string to user. All right, so that's now an empty map. And then what we're gonna do is check and make sure that these are the same length. So if the length of names does not equal the length of phone numbers, then we'll return nil. So nil is the zero value of a map. 
We could also return an empty map of the same type, but I'd say you should prefer nil um, for slices and maps and things. Um, and then the error should say invalid sizes. So errors dot new invalid sizes. And we'll import the errors package. Okay, cool. So if we get down to line 13 now, we should know that both of these slices, names and phone numbers are of the same size, which means we can loop um, like this. So for i starting at zero, and i is less than the length of, it doesn't matter because they'll be the same, right? Length of names, i plus plus. Then we can say name is names at i. And we can say phone number, phone numbers at i. Okay. And then we're going to want to insert values into the user map. So we'll do user map at the key. In this case, the key is the name, right? So key is the name. And we'll set it equal to a new instance of a user struct. So user. And the user struct has two fields, name, which will just, again, be the name, and the phone number, uh, which will just be this phone number here. Cool. So that should fill the entire user map with all of the names and phone numbers. And then by the end, we should just be able to return user map nil. Okay, cool. I think we got everything. Let's go ahead and run that and see what we get. So creating map, key, John, value, name, number, key, Bob, value, name, number. This is looking this is looking correct to me. Here we have creating map with invalid sizes. Um, if we take a look at the tests, uh, yep, that makes sense. The second test has two names, but three numbers. So I would expect it to get that invalid sizes error. Cool, let's, uh, let's submit that. So the primary way you interact with maps is just by setting and deleting uh, values at a given key, right? They're very associative, right? A value maps to a key, but there's no other ordering. Maps aren't ordered from, you know, index 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, like a slice is. Everything's unordered. You're literally just mapping values to keys. Okay, cool. So let's take a look at some of the different syntax that we can use to interact with maps. So we can insert an element by just setting the key equal to the value. Um, we can get an element out just by accessing it directly at its key. We can delete elements by using the built-in delete function where we're passing in the map itself and the key that we want to delete. Notice that we're not passing in the value at all. We're just passing in the key. And then we can also check if a key exists by parsing the return value of kind of this access syntax into two separate values where the first value will be the element itself and the second value is a boolean if the boolean is true then the element will be whatever element was stored to that key however if the boolean is false that tells you that that key didn't exist in the map and the element will just be the zero value for its type let's jump into the assignment so it says, in fact, let me, uh, let me resize this a bit. It says it's important to keep up with privacy regulations and to respect our user's data. We need a function that will delete user records. Okay, complete the delete if necessary function. Um, it takes a map of users and a name, which I'm going to guess is the key in the map. And it will return a Boolean saying whether or not the user was deleted and then an error if something went wrong. Okay, cool. So if the user does not exist in the map, return the error not found. Oh, interesting. So if we're trying to delete something and it's not there, um, that's an error. If they exist but aren't scheduled for deletion, then return deleted as false. So we'll, we'll, this will be false um, and there won't be any errors. Um, but if they exist and are scheduled for deletion, then we'll return uh, the deleted Boolean as true with no other errors. Okay, that's making sense to me. And then a note on how maps are passed into functions is that like slices, maps are actually passed by reference. So even though this function, delete if necessary, does not return a map, if we mutate this user's map, it will be mutated for the caller of the function. So that's how we're able to delete something from the map, even though we're not returning the map once we're done with it. So the first thing we need to do is just check and see if the name that we're trying to delete exists. So let's do this. If 
blank, okay, colon equals users at name, not, not okay. So uh, this is that kind of special if statement syntax, right? Um, where we're uh, actually ignoring the value itself. Um, we're just interested in that Boolean value telling us whether or not this, um, this key exists in the map. And if it does not, then we're gonna go ahead and return uh, return the error not found. So false, because we always do zero values for everything besides the error, and then errors dot new not found. And we'll make sure to import that errors package. Okay, cool. And again, I'm just, I'm just uh, using this syntax here right, to check if a key exists. Cool, moving on. Okay, so if we get past, uh, past that guard clause to line 12, then we know um, that the user exists. So um, at this point, Ah, oh, we need to check if they're scheduled for deletion. So I'm actually gonna switch up my syntax here. The user struct has the scheduled for deletion Boolean. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this on a separate line. And I will save that user. So I'll do um, existing user. And then we'll just do if not okay. So that down here, now I can use that existing user struct. So I can say if existing user dot scheduled for deletion. So if they exist and are scheduled for deletion, return deleted as true with no errors and delete the record from the map. So we need to use this built-in delete function. So we'll delete users name. And then we'll return true all right, so if they are scheduled for deletion, we'll delete them and report back that we deleted them. Cool. Um, otherwise, if they're not scheduled for deletion, return deleted is false with no errors. So return, false, nil. All right, that looks right to me. Let's go ahead and run that. Attempting to delete John, deleted John, attempting to delete Musk, not found. Santa not found attempting to delete K did not delete K. Okay, cool. So I mean all that look it looks like all the cases were covered. Let's just come down here and take a look. Okay, so we had a John and John was deleted. And then attempting to delete Musk, there's not actually a Musk in the map. So not found makes sense. Um, there's also not a Santa and Cade was not scheduled for deletion. So he did not get deleted. And then the final map still has those keys. That looks correct to me. In this next section, we're going to be covering some of the material from the Go blog. Now, I'm not going to read all of this out. Uh, that would be a little dry, but I definitely recommend reading this over if you have the time. Otherwise, I'm going to cover kind of the key points. So the first question is, what makes a type qualify to be able to be used as a map key? Okay, so any type can be used as a map value, but not every type can be used as a map key. And that's because map keys may be of any type that is comparable. So things like strings, booleans, um, numbers, all those can be compared for equality. What cannot be compared for equality are slices, maps, and functions. And kind of one of the reasons for that is slices and maps and functions, they're kind of just pointers to addresses in memory. So if you compare one slice to another slice, you're not really comparing the underlying values. You're actually comparing kind of where those two slices are stored in your computer's RAM. And because they're stored in different places, you'll actually get two slices with maybe the exact same values stored in them. Say slice one has the numbers one, two, three in the first three indexes, and the second slice has the same they might still be compared as unequal because they're stored in different addresses in memory. So, I mean, all that being said, long story short, you just can't use slices and maps and functions as map keys. So to answer the question, what makes a type qualified to be used as a map key? The type is comparable. This next question is interesting and kind of plays on the idea that we can nest maps um, kind of one inside the other, or we could do something that's arguably simpler. Let me show you what I mean. So here is an example of a map of strings that maps to another map, which maps from strings to integers. So like the first string kind of maps to the second string, which maps to an integer, if you want to think about it that way. 
if you're familiar with JSON objects, this would be like mapping JSON objects kind of down multiple uh, levels of keys. So in the example given in the Go blog, essentially what's being said is we're mapping um, two strings to a count. And so what that looks like in code is if we want to get access to the count, we actually have to go to the map, index the nested map with a, a key, and then index into that next map with another key before we get the value out. Now, this looks simple on the surface, but what actually happens is when you need, when you go down those nested levels, you actually can't be sure that the inner map exists. And so to avoid panicking, your code will actually panic, by the way, if you try to access a key in a map that is nil. So to avoid panicking, you have to check and make sure that those nested maps actually exist, which just results in a lot of extra code. So while nesting maps definitely works, and I've used it quite a bit, there can, in some instances, be a simpler way, which is to actually use a struct as a key. Notice that a struct was not named as one of the non-comparable types. Structs are comparable. So if you want to create a map that kind of has multiple keys that kind of combine together to form a composite key, then just create a new struct, right, with two values inside of it, and those two values kind of unique together create their own key. So this simplifies a lot of things where now we can have one map and we can use that struct key to create kind of uniqueness across two different values. This might be useful, for example, if you're trying to create a map that's unique for first last name combinations, right? You want Lane Wagner stored in two different fields, first name and last name, to be unique together. So to answer the question, which is simpler, to use a struct directly as a key or to nest maps? And um, the authors of the Go blog, and I would agree, argue that using a struct directly is gonna be simpler. Let's jump right into this next assignment. It says we have a slice of user IDs, okay? So those are strings. And each instance of an ID in the slice indicates that a message was sent to that user. We need to count up how many times each user's ID appears in the slice to track how many messages they received. Implement the get counts function. Okay, so that's this one. It should return a map of string to int so that each int is a count of how many times each string was found in the slice. Okay, cool, simple enough. So let's create a new map. So this will be the counts map. And it's going to be a map of string to integer. And then let's loop over all of the user IDs. So for blank user ID in range user IDs. And we're just we're going to ignore the index because we don't care about it. And the first thing we're going to do is check to see if um, a value in the map for the given user ID already exists. So count, okay, colon equals uh, user IDs, sorry, counts at user ID, right? Cool. Um, in fact, now, now, like, now that I type that out, I'm not actually sure that I need this because if I don't use this, this access will still work. It's just if, if the key didn't exist, count will be zero, which is fine. So actually, I don't, I don't even think I care. Um, cool. So we get the count. It'll be zero if it didn't yet exist. And then we just increment it by one. So count plus plus. And then we'll save it back into the map. So counts at user ID equals count. So we're just grabbing it out, incrementing it by one, and putting it back. That seems like what we want to do, right? And then at the end, we'll just return counts. Cool. Let's go ahead and run that and see what we get. Generating counts for 10,000 user IDs. Counts from selected IDs. 00, zero has 31. FF has 27. DD has 37. Okay. And if I look down here, it looks like the IDs are being generated randomly. Cool. So... Let's go ahead and submit it because this feels right. Cool, we're good to go. This next section is about a piece or an excerpt from the Effective Go book. 
Um, that is a book that I'd highly recommend reading. Um, some of the stuff's a bit outdated. They've made the decision not to continuously update Effective Go, but it is an open source book. You can go read the whole thing for free, um, and the link is right there. So go check that out if you're interested. Um, that said, you don't need to. I'll be talking through um, the parts that we care about here. So maps can have, at most, blank values associated with the same key. The answers are one, any number of, three, and two. Well, maps are associative, right? They map a single key to a single value, and you can't have duplicates of the same key in a map. That wouldn't make any sense, right? Then when you put in a key, you would maybe get back a slice? Like, that doesn't quite work. So the answer is maps can have, at most, one value associated with the same key. The next question says, attempting to get a value from a map where the key does not exist, returns the closest value, panics, or returns the zero value. Um, that's covered here in the section on missing keys, but basically to summarize, if you attempt to get a, I mean, we actually covered this in the last, um, the last coding assignment, but if you attempt to access a key in a map where the key doesn't exist, you'll just get back the zero value. So for example, if it's a map of strings to integers, and you access a string that doesn't exist, you'll get back as the value zero. And that's kind of nice just because accessing values in a map is a safe operation. Your code will not, will not panic. So to answer the question, it returns the zero value. And it's also worth pointing out really quickly that if the map doesn't exist, so not that the key that you're trying to access doesn't exist, but if the map itself doesn't exist, if it's a nil map, then your code will panic. So that is a dangerous operation. You wanna make sure you're always accessing values in maps that have been initialized. The next question is, a function can mutate the values stored in a map and those changes blank the caller. Affect or do not affect the caller. Now, the answer to this one is in this first section that maps like slices are references. So when we pass a map into a function, that function can change what's in the map and those changes will be visible outside of the function. This is different from primitives, right? Strings, integers, um, booleans, those are all passed into functions by value. If you mutate them within a function, uh, the, the, the caller of that function will not see those changes unless you return those values. But the same does not hold true for slices and maps. So to answer the question, uh, a function can mutate the values uh, stored in a map and those changes, they do affect the caller. The next question says, what does the second return value from a retrieve operation in a map indicate? So let's take a look at this code example here. So we've got this time zone map where we're accessing the map at a given, t uh, given key and it can return two values. The first value is the value associated with the key and the second value is a Boolean, right? We used this in the last coding assignment. So a Boolean that indicates whether the value at the key is a nil value, nope, that's not accurate. A Boolean that indicates whether the key exists, that's the one. Let's practice with some nested maps. So like we talked about earlier, maps can contain other maps as their values, not as, not as their keys, right? So let's jump into the assignment. It says, because Textio is a glorified customer database, right? I mean, we're sending SMS and email messages to a giant list of customers. We're basically just a big customer database. Um, we have a lot of internal logic for sorting and dealing with customer names. Complete the get name counts function. It takes a slice of strings, names, and returns a nested map. So this is going to be very similar to the last assignment we did. Um, but this time it's gonna be a nested map where the first key is all the unique first characters of the names and the second key is all of the names themselves. So this could be useful if for some reason we wanted to get access to all of the names that start with A very quickly. So to kind of visualize this, we've got this example. If the input names slice is this slice here, Billy, Billy, Bob, Joe, it would create the following nested map. So the first key is just a letter the second key is the full name, and then the value is um, the, the number of times that name showed up in the original list. And then it's worth pointing out here that the return value is a map of runes to a map of strings and integers. In, in Go, we often just represent individual characters as runes rather than strings of length one. It just gives us a little more um, kind of assurity in our type system. Okay, so let's start by creating a new top level map. So we'll call it counts and we'll make that full map. Now it's important to understand because 
this map contains maps inside of it, we will need to continuously initialize new maps. I'll show you what that looks like. So now let's just uh, loop over all these names. So for, um, we don't care about the index, name, and range names. Okay, so we've got a name. The first thing we need to do is actually check and see if we already have a map associated with the first character of this name. So let's get that first character. Let's do um, if, well, we probably need to do some safety checking. So like if length of name, actually the easiest thing to do would just be if name is the empty string, then we'll continue. We don't care about blank names. They, they, they don't do anything for us, right? So we'll just, we'll just skip them. Great, if it's not the empty string, then we can say first, Character is name at zero. Okay, so that gives us the rune at um, the first index in the name. And then what we can do is look up in our map. So counts at first, oops, counts at first character. Um, we can see if the inner map exists. So if it does not exist, not if, not okay. Let's just keep it simple. If it doesn't exist, we'll just initialize it. So if it does not exist, we'll say counts at first character equals, and we'll initialize the new inner map. So we just need a new map of string to integer at that first character key, right? Right. In fact, to be explicit, I'm gonna ignore the inner map there. So by the time we get down here to line 18, we should be 100% certain that counts at first character contains an initialized map. So then we can just simply do counts at first character at name plus plus, right? Because we've, we've made sure that the inner map exists and if the name key doesn't exist, it will return a zero, which we can then increment and save back into the map. So that should work just fine. And at the end, we can return counts. Cool, hopefully that makes sense. And we've got some test cases down here. Matthew, George, Drew, Philip, Bryant, and then a big list. Okay, cool, let's run it and see what happens. Whoops, cannot use first char variable of type byte as rune value, right? So when you index into a string, right? So name is a single string in Go, then it is a byte type, uh, but we want a rune type. So I'm gonna go ahead and cast it and run it again. Uh, generating counts for 50, the, for the first 50 names, count for M, Matthew is three, G, George is one, D, Drew is four. We don't have any panics, so these counts look totally plausible to me. Let's go ahead and submit it. It's time to talk about first class and higher order functions, which are just really kind of confusing, complex terms for a much simpler idea, which is functions as data. A programming language is said to support first class functions if it allows you to pass around functions just like you pass around any other variable, storing essentially an entire function as a value. And then a function that uses that first class function, so a function that accepts another function as a parameter or returns a function as a return value is said to be called a higher order function. Let's take a look at a concrete example. Okay, so here we have two functions, add and multiply. Um, these are very simple functions. You should be able to understand uh, what they do just by looking at them for a second. Um, but here we have kind of an interesting function. It's called aggregate. And it takes as input three integers, a, b, and c, and it takes as input an entire function, right? So it takes a function, and it, we're calling it here arithmetic, it's the fourth parameter to the aggregate function. And this function has a specific signature. 
this function, arithmetic, must take as its parameters two integers, okay, and return an integer itself. And then the aggregate function just returns an integer. So what does the aggregate function do? Well, it calls the function it was given twice. First, it calls it once with a and b, and then it calls it again with the result of a and b and c. So for example, if we call aggregate with the numbers two, three, four, and the function add, then it will add all three of those numbers together, right? Which would in this case print nine. And then we can also use that same aggregate function with the same numbers, two, three, and four, but this time pass in that multiply function. And here we'll get 24, right? Because we're multiplying um, all of the variables together instead of adding them. It's okay if this is a bit confusing, uh, if this is the first time you've worked with functions as data. Take a second to really kind of stare at this code and, and figure out these this crazy function signature. Um, it's actually not that complex once you kind of get past the scary syntax, um, but, but don't feel bad if you have to pause the video and, and take a good look. Let's get our hands dirty with this assignment. It says Textio is launching a new email messaging product, Mailio, <laughs> I guess. Uh, SMS and email, right? Um, fix the compile time bug in the get formatted messages function. The function body is correct, but the function signature is not. Okay, so this formatter function here looks like it will be a problem. Let's go ahead and run the code and see what kind of an error we get. So this is a compile time error uh, saying we have a syntax problem. And that makes sense because here we're, we're basically saying, well, the formatter input is a function but we're not saying what type of function it is. And that doesn't work because get formatted messages is going to use the formatter function. So it needs to know essentially what parameters it takes as input and what it's going to return, right? Uh, kind of like uh, the arithmetic function here takes two integers and returns an integer. Uh, we need to update this function signature to kind of inform the get formatted messages function, what this formatter function actually does. So if we look at the code, because we know the function body um, is correct, it looks like formatter accepts a message's input, which is a string, and it's going to return whatever should be appended to this formatted messages slice, which is a string. So it looks like it takes one string as input and returns one string as output. That kind of makes sense for a formatter function. Um, so we say it takes a string and it returns a string. Let's go ahead and run that and see what we get. Cool, at least it compiled. It says, thanks for getting back to me, which returned, thanks for getting back to me, kind regards. Okay, cool. So the add signature adds kind regards to the end and add greeting. Thanks for getting back to me. Hello, thanks for getting back to me. Cool, let's go ahead and run that. Awesome. So this might seem like an exercise in complexity, right? Like, why do I need to pass around functions as data? That just seems to add a bunch of well, needless complexity. And for the most part, you're right. You really should only use higher order and first class functions if you have a very good reason to do so. So the question is kind of what are the good reasons to do so? Well, first class and higher order functions are very often used for um, on the back end side of the stack, HTTP handlers. Right? So if you have some front end code that needs to reach out to a back end server and get some data, those handlers are typically first class or higher order functions because we need some code, right? The handler function to run like in the future. We don't want to call it now, right? We want to call it when something happens in the UI world, kind of on the, on the front end side of the stack, uh, they're often used in on click handlers. Right? So I write a function and I don't necessarily call it when my program starts, but I call it when something interesting happens, like the user clicks a button, right? When a button click happens, I want to call you know, this function. And so typically in code, we can represent that with a higher order function. We say on click, do this. And then we kind of give it the name of a function to call. And then just to review the definitions uh, very quickly, a first class function is a function that is kind of being passed around as data. And a higher order function is the function that's using that first class function, right? It's a function that accepts a function as input or returns it um, as one of its return values. So the question is, what is a higher order function? Um, it is a function that takes another 
function as an argument or, or returns a function. Um, but it's not a function that is first in this call stack or a function with superior logic. So the next question is, what is a first class function? Um, it is a function that is treated like any other variable, right? It's a function that we are going to pass around as, as data to probably be called sometime in the future. Function currying is kind of like a special kind of higher order function. It's a function that accepts another function as input. We're kind of familiar with that idea, but that also returns a new function as its output. So it's kind of a way of like enhancing a function with new behavior. It's kind of a weird concept to think about abstractly, so let's jump into this example. Okay, so here we have a function called self-math, and self-math is the curried function. It takes a math function as input that accepts two integers and returns an integer, and it returns a new function that only takes a single integer as input and returns an integer. And then what it does, again, it returns a function, right? That takes a single integer as an input and returns an integer. And it calls the math function that it was given with the same input twice, right? So we're kind of mapping a function that accepts two uh, different integers into a function that kind of forces both of those integers to be the same integer. So like, what does that do in practice? Well, basically we can use our self math function to convert a multiply function into a square function, right? So multiply takes X and Y and multiplies them together. This new square function that we created dynamically only takes a single value and multiplies it by itself, right? Um, same with the add function, we can kind of use the self math function to convert it into a function that just doubles its input. Right, so we square five, we get 25, we double five and we get 10. So when would currying be used in the real world? Uh, to be honest, I don't use it very often, um, but in backend server land, I do sometimes use it for middleware functions. So a middleware function is a function that basically changes the HTTP handler of a backend server. Um, and just as a spoiler, we will be covering this in the project at the end of this course. Um, but it's for kind of injecting some additional logic into a function. So say we have an HTTP handler that accepts as input a user ID and returns an entire user object with, you know, say their first name, their last name, that sort of thing. Um, a middleware function might do something like require an authentication token, right? So we can write all of our HTTP handlers that serve different data sort of independently. And then we can use a curried function to kind of require authentication logic on all of our HTTP handlers. Um, in fact, in Go, currying is very often used to handle the sort of middleware problem. Now, if all of that went straight over your head, again, that's okay. It's kind of hard to talk about um, something that we're not working on at the moment. So again, we're going to cover middleware and HTTP handlers in the project at the end of this course. So stick around for that. So jumping into the assignment, it says the Malio API needs a very robust error logging system so we can see when things are going awry in the back end. We need a function that can create a custom logger, a function that prints to the console, uh, given a specific formatter. Okay, cool. So this function, get logger, should return a logger, which is a function, right? It's a function that takes two strings as input and apparently prints them because it doesn't return anything. Right. And get logger takes as input a formatter, which accepts two strings as input and returns a single string. <clears throat> okay, so it says complete the get logger function. It should return a new function. Um, the inputs should be passed into the formatter function, the order they're given to the logger function. Okay, so let's start writing this. So we're going to return a function that takes two strings as input. Right? And I'm going to reference up here for the syntax we're interested in. So I'm gonna do A string, B string, right? And this function should return nothing. So we can just go straight into the body. And it says, this function prints the formatted inputs. So formatter returns a single string. So we can just do fmt.println. And we're gonna to need to, oh, we already have fmt imported, perfect. So we need to print the result of the formatter functions. It's going to be formatter, and we'll pass into the formatter A and B. 
right? So we're returning a new function, a logger, that accepts two inputs, formats them, given the formatter that we were given, right? And then just prints it to the console. Cool, let's go ahead and run that. Error on database server, out of memory, error on database server, CPU is pegged. This all looks good. Let's see how the test suite actually works. It looks like these are the formatters, colon delimit and comma delimit. And if you take a look at our messages, some are delimited by a colon, some are delimited by a comma. So that's how that is working. Very cool. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and submit that. I think this is correct. Time to talk about the defer keyword. Uh, this is a really kind of unique thing to go. Um, if you're familiar with any other programming languages, it's unlikely um, that you're familiar with something similar to the defer keyword. Um, at least I've never used it or used a concept uh, that is similar to the defer keyword in another language. Um, fairly go specific. Okay, so the defer keyword allows us to execute some function at the end of the current function or when the current function exits. The defer keyword is very often used as sort of a cleanup step. Um, for example, in this, in this function here, copy file, we open a source file from the file system and then we defer closing the file, right? So every time you open access to a file in the file system, you need to remember to close that file. Otherwise you're sort of wasting computer resources. Um, the problem is closing the file at the end of the function is a little tedious because we have multiple return statements here. So we'd kind of have to close it before both of them, if that makes sense. By using the defer keyword, we can just tell the Go programming language, hey, I want to call source.close right before the copy file function ends and just defers it kind of until the end. And it will only call it once um, no matter where the function actually returns from. On to the assignment. It says there is a bug in the log and delete function. Fix it. Let me expand this a little bit so we can see it. This function should always delete the user from the user's map. Okay, cool. So we're given a user's map. We're given a name. And we know that maps uh, are passed by reference. So if we delete a map, uh, it will be deleted in the caller's code as well. Um, it should return a log string that indicates to the caller some information about the user's deletion. Okay, so delete should always happen, and then the kind of uh, the appropriate log message should be returned from the function. That makes sense. Um, but it looks like there's a bug. Okay, so let's go ahead and run the code and see what we get. So initial users, Brianna, Elon, John, Cade, attempting to delete John, deleting Santa, deleting Cade. Okay, so. John's still there. The problem is that we're trying to delete John, but John's not actually getting deleted, right? So we need to fix that bug. And if we take a look, John is an admin. And here we are returning log admin, but we're not deleting admins. So so that's that's the real problem, right? The users should always be deleted. Now, here's the problem. We can do this. Um, this will work. If I run this, my guess is this should fix the bug. Yep, John is no longer there. He was deleted successfully. But this is kind of gross, right? We're calling delete three different times. Um, what if in the future we add another case and we forget, we forget to add the delete again? We'll have another bug. Um, well, what we could do, what we could do is just delete at the top once, right? But the problem is if we do that, we delete the user from the user's map too soon. And now this okay variable that's checking for existence so it can change which log is returned, like that logic won't work. It will just always be not okay. So we'll always just return log not found. So that's a problem. What we can do is defer the deletion. So this code says we'll call this delete function right before log and delete returns. So it, it's almost like um, the equivalent of, you know, adding this at every step of the way. So let's go ahead and run that, make sure it works. John's there, John's gone, perfect. And we have different logs getting returned. So that looks good, I'm gonna go ahead and submit that. 
This chapter is not called advanced functions uh, for no reason. Let's talk about closures. Closures are, um, I don't wanna like intimidate you and say they're really hard, but they're a little weird. So let's, let's take a second to understand uh, how they work. Okay, a closure is a function that references variables from outside its own function body. The function may access and assign to the referenced variables. So in this example, the concatter function returns a function that has a reference to the enclosed doc value. Okay, so concatter is a function. It returns a new function, right? And that's what's happening here. And it's enclosing this doc string within the function. So it's getting initialized outside of the function and then getting used within the function. And what happens is basically when we call concatter to, to make this new like concat function, we're saving a reference to this doc variable. So every kind of concurrent, not concurrence, every uh, subsequent call to this function that is returned We'll keep adding on, right? Plus equals word. We'll keep adding on to the same doc variable. So let's look at what that uh, kind of looks like in usage. So we're calling concatter and we're getting back this Harry Potter aggregator, right? That's what we're assigning this function. We're assigning this function into this variable. So Harry Potter aggregator is a function, right? It's, it's specifically, it's this function right here. Cool, and then we're gonna call it with Mr. And then we'll call it again with and and Mrs. Dursley, right? We're calling it over and over and over. And what's happening under the hood is we are appending those words, Mr. and Mrs. onto that doc variable. So at the end, when we finally print what's being returned, which is the doc variable itself, we get the full sentence, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet drive. Now, closures are one of those advanced things that you, to be honest, again, don't usually use in production code, maybe every once in a while, um, but they're very important to understand because it is very common to have kind of bugs surrounding closures. So if you don't understand what's going on under the hood, it can be really hard to debug a kind of complex code that might even be using closures by accident. So the assignment says, Keeping track of how many emails we send is mission critical at Malio. Complete the adder function. It should return a function that adds its input, an integer, to an enclosed sum value and then returns the new sum. In other words, it keeps a running total of the sum variable uh, within a closure. Okay, cool. So it's going to be very similar to this, right? So we'll start by creating a sum value. So sum colon equals zero, right? We're, in, we're working with integers, not floats. And then we need to return a function with the signature. So return bunk x int turns an int oh not not returns an x returns an int and then here we need to add x to sum right so sum plus equals x and then we need to return the new sum right and then if we go take a look at this test case let's see Okay, so we're adding these email bills with a bunch of different numbers. The test iterates over the bills. Ah, oh, okay, so we're creating two adders here. So we're creating a count adder and a cost adder. And then let me expand this. I'm gonna just make that basically full screen. So the test actually creates two different adders, two different instances of our adder function. Right? And one of them is going to count how many bills there are, and the other one will keep a running total of the cost of all of the bills. Right, So we're actually using our function twice for two different things, and they'll each have their own enclosed sum count that they keep track of differently. Right, The count will have its own, the cost will have its own. The count is simple, it just adds one every time. The cost will add the actual cost in pennies. Cool, let's go ahead and run this. So, um, and, and these values are getting interpolated into this message. So you've sent one email, costs 45 cents, two emails, 77 cents, three emails, 120 cents. It's like all of these are going up, that makes sense. I mean, we could even go verify, right? 45 plus 32, 77, that looks right to me. Let's go ahead and submit it. 
All right, we're on to a little quiz about closures. Can a closure mutate a variable outside of its body? Uh, yes, that's basically the entire point of a closure. Another little review question here. It says, when a variable is enclosed in a closure, the enclosing function has access to blank, a copy of the value or a mutable reference to the original value. Well, if it was a copy, then our sum never would have worked, right? Because we'd be working with a new copy of the sum variable every time. So it's actually a mutable reference to the original value. We've already been using anonymous functions kind of all throughout this chapter. Um, now let's kind of just talk about what they are. So anonymous functions are exactly what they sound like. They're just functions that do not have a name. They have no name. Um, Anonymous functions are really useful when you're kind of just one-off, maybe creating a closure, you're returning a new type of function. Um, if if you're not defining the function for like use across the entire program, but you're more using it as a value, using it as a first-class function, um, that's when you're gonna see anonymous functions used the most. So as an example, um, here we have an anonymous function declaration. Right, we're creating a new function, we're defining its internal logic, its, its function body, um, but we're not giving it a name, right? There's no name uh, for this function that we're passing into do math. It is an anonymous function. The assignment says, complete the print reports function. Call print cost report once for each message. Okay, let's take a look. Print cost report, looks like it takes as input a function, cost calculator. Great, okay. Um, call print cost report once for each message. Pass an anonymous function as the cost calculator that returns an int equal to twice the length of the input message. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. So, um, it says to do it once for each message. Yeah, so for message, range messages, call print cost report, print cost report. And print cost report takes a cost calculator, which is a function that takes a string and returns an int. It's said to use an anonymous function, right? So funks, uh, we need to actually define our x string int. We need to define the body um, that returns an int equal to twice the length of the input message. So x is a string. In fact, I'm gonna name this um, message. And we'll return the length of message times two, right? twice the length of the input message. And then print cost report takes a second parameter, which is the message itself, right? I think, am I, am I reading this correctly? Cost report takes the calculator and the message itself. Yep, because it's gonna, it's then going to call the cost calculator and then, and then print kind of a little report. Okay, cool. Um, that's looking pretty good to me. We don't return anything from print reports. Okay, let's go ahead and run this. So message, here's Johnny, costs 28 cents. Go ahead, make my day, 42 cents. You had me at hello, 38 cents. That's looking correct, right? There's 19, 28, not 19. What's half of 28? 14, 14 characters there. Looks good to me. Okay, let's go ahead and submit that. Let's talk about pointers. And in order to understand pointers, we need to um, talk a little bit about RAM or memory, right? Random access memory, which is basically the part of the hardware in our computer that stores data, right? Because pointers and variables are all about kind of how we store data in the memory of our computer. Let's start with something simple. Let's create a new variable in our program and let's call it X and we'll set x equal to five. Under the hood, what happens automatically when we create a new variable uh, and set it equal to five is somewhere in our computer's memory, that variable's value is going to get stored. So let's say, uh, for the sake of the example, that it's stored here in memory address 169. Now, memory in your computer, you can think of it as fairly simply a memory address that stores a value. So we've got kind of, you know, millions of different memory addresses in which we can store data and somewhere in memory uh, that value needs to live. So let's just say it gets assigned again automatically um, to address 169. Great. Now what happens if I create a new variable, let's call it Y, and set it equal to the current value of X. 
y actually gets a new copy of the value. So x lives here at address 169. y, let's just say, is going to live at address 170, and we get a copy of that 5. So down here in this table, this is where we're going to keep track of all of our variables. We'll say that x, so x is the variable name, lives at address 169, and it stores the value 5. Now y lives at address 170 and stores also the value 5. At its most basic, a pointer is just a variable that stores a memory address. So let's say, for example, that we create a new variable called z, and we set it to point, which is uh, which uses the ampersand. I can't draw an ampersand. <laughs> Pretend that that's an ampersand. Uh, the 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 a reference to x, right? It points to x. What that does is that we're creating a new variable called z. It's going to get a new address. Anytime we create a new variable, it's going to live in a new address in memory. Let's say it lives at address 171. But its value, instead of being 5, instead of being a copy of x, because we used kind of the pointer syntax or the reference syntax, the value is going to be the address of x. So we're going to store 169, which is the, again, the address of x as the value. And z is going to be a pointer type. So kind of the way the Go programming language works is it knows that z is effectively pointing to the value 5, right? Because its address is 171, which stores a pointer to 169. So we can look up the value 5 at address 169. So what this means is if we update the value that z points to, under the hood, we're updating x. So we can do things like pass pointers into functions, change the underlying value, and the value outside of that function is also changed, which again, in a language like Go doesn't happen normally, because typically if you pass a variable like x into a function and then change it, those changes are not seen outside of the function. You would need to return the updated value and then assign it into a new variable. So pointers basically allow us to change the value of something from within a function, right? From within a different scope. Let me show you what that looks like in a quick example. So remember that z stores the value 169, which points to this address, which stores the value 5. So if we want to update the value of x without having access to the original variable x, what we can do is use the dereference operator, which is an asterisk. We can dereference z. Now this dereference operator essentially follows this chain and finds the value, right? And we reassign into it, let's say the value six. So this becomes six, and this location in memory is updated now to hold the value six. So we've updated the value of x without even, without even using right, the name x. So now that we've kind of covered what a pointer is, let's look at just a little bit more of the syntax in code. So the type of a pointer is not the type of the underlying value alone. So if I want a pointer to an integer, um, I actually have to use this syntax here. I'm creating a new variable called p, and it's being initialized as a pointer to an integer. So a pointer is a specific type in Go. Now, to be fair, um, it's not super common that you're creating blank pointers, and the zero value for a pointer is nil. Um, more often than not, what you're going to do is have a concrete value, like this my string, hello, and then you'll create a pointer to that value by using the ampersand like we talked about. So in this case, the type of my string is string, and the type of my string pointer is a pointer to a string, which would be syntactically star string. There are kind of two primary reasons that you would use a pointer in the Go programming language. The first is the more common reason, which is you want to be able to pass a value into a function and change the value and have those changes kind of persist outside of the function, right? Because normally when you pass a value into a function, a copy is passed in. So if you want to pass in sort of the original value so it can be changed and updated, uh, you might use a pointer. 
The second reason is if you're very concerned about the performance of your program. Every time you create a copy of a variable in memory, you have to copy that variable in memory, right? Which takes some time. So if you're dealing with lots and lots of data and you're trying to be very performant, you can make micro optimizations and kind of use pointers on, uh, under the hood if you want to avoid all of that memory copying. Now, I will say that you usually won't want to do this up front because pointers are dangerous and they can lead to bugs if not used properly. So generally speaking, I would recommend against making those performance optimizations unless you really need them. Let's jump into the assignment. It says fix the bug in the send message function. It's supposed to print a nicely formatted message to the console containing an SMS's uh, recipient and message body. However, it's not working as expected. Okay, so let's run the code. And we get these kind of weird, weird looking values that are getting printed here in the two and the message fields. Now, this is hexadecimal. It's not binary, it's not decimal, it's hexadecimal. And this is the default formatting for a memory address. So we have these ampersands here, they're creating pointers to the underlying values. That's not what we want. It's not what we want here, right? That's why this looks disgusting. Uh, we need to dereference, or, or sorry, we need to remove the reference, so I guess dereference, um, we need to remove the ampersand so that we are no longer creating pointers. So run it again, and we get the values themselves, which is what, what we've been asked to do. Let's recap some syntax. Sometimes it can get a little confusing between the asterisk and the ampersand, what each of them mean and in what context. So when we're talking about the type of a variable in Go, a pointer's type is star and then you know the type of the underlying value. So a pointer to an int is star int. An ampersand is used to reference a value. So if we want to create a pointer to the my string variable or the my string value, then we use an ampersand. So the ampersand followed by the name of a variable creates a pointer to that variable. Now here's where it can get just a little bit tricky the asterisk is again used to dereference a pointer. So the asterisk is used in a pointer's type. It's also used as an operator to dereference a pointer. So when we say asterisk my string pointer, this refers to the underlying value. So we can actually change the underlying value, say by assigning it to, in this case, a new string. So in short, ampersands to create new references or new pointers to a value, and the asterisk is used to dereference a pointer and get back at that underlying value. Let's hop into the assignment. It says, complete the remove profanity function. It should use the strings.replaceAll function. So this is a, a built-in uh, function in the standard library in the strings package, uh, to replace all instances of the following words in the input message with asterisks. It should mutate the value in the pointer and return nothing. Do not alter the function signature. Okay, cool. So remove profanity takes as input a, a, a message variable, which is a pointer to a string. So because it's a pointer, we're going to be able to mutate it without returning anything explicitly. Okay, let's jump into it. So first thing we're gonna do is dereference the message pointer and store its value in a new variable called message value. And then we'll just update this um, by using that strings.replaceAll functions, so strings.replaceAll. We want to replace the values in message value. We want to, or I should say, we want to replace substrings from message value. Uh, we'll look for the word dang, and we'll replace it with four asterisks. And we want to do the same thing twice more with shoot, which has five letters. So let's add an asterisk and heck, which has four. So that should be good. Cool. Let's, let's run this. I need to import the strings package before I forget and see what happens. So in its current state, we actually did not update anything, right? Shoot is still there. Dang is still there. That's because we actually need to point the message 
pointer to a string back at the updated value. So we can do dereferenced message equals message value. Let's run that. Perfect. Let's submit it. Now we've got a pointer quiz. So the question is, what is the value of ampersand y after the code on the left executes? So we've got x set to 50. Y is a pointer to an integer. Okay, well, it's, in this case, it's just going to be 100 because we're explicitly setting it to 100 on the last line of the code. So that one was pretty easy. Now, this question is a little trickier. It says, what is the value of X after the code on the left executes? Well, X is set to 50. Y is a pointer to X. And then we dereference Y and set it equal to 100. So that's actually also going to be 100 because we're setting X through y, which is a pointer to x. I mentioned earlier that pointers can be dangerous, and that is definitely the case. Um, if a pointer points to nothing, then its zero value is nil, right? So this is the same for interfaces or errors, right? In Go, fairly often you'll be checking at runtime if a value is nil or not. And the thing about pointers is if you ever try to dereference a pointer, that doesn't point to anything, your code will panic. So pretty much any time you dereference something, you should be checking before you dereference it to make sure that the pointer actually points to a valid location in memory. So this assignment says, let's make our profanity checker safe. Update the remove profanity function. If the message is nil, return early to avoid a panic. Okay, so let me run it in its current state. And you'll see we get this nasty panic here. It says invalid memory address or nil. Okay, so what we need to do here is if message equals equals nil, return nothing, right? If we've been given an invalid input, we'll just bail early. Um, another way to do this, um, if the assignment expected something different, we could return an error here, right? We might do something like return errors.new uh, invalid input. I think that would also be a good way to write this function. Uh, but we've been asked to just do a naked return, so we will do that. Let's submit it. So let's talk about how pointers are used in conjunction with methods. So you'll very frequently see that methods actually take a pointer receiver rather than a non-pointer receiver. And typically that's done because the method will be making changes to the instance of the type itself, in this case, a struct, right? So we have this car with a color field and the set color method on the car is going to change the color, right? And so here, if we create a new car, we set the color to blue and then print it. You can see it's been updated to blue instead of white. Now contrast that with a non-pointer receiver. This acts like a normal function, right? We don't have a pointer, so we don't have a reference to the location in memory. So if we update, the car's color to blue, it actually just stays white. It doesn't persist that change. So that's why I say that it's uh, more common that you'll see pointer receivers on methods than non-pointer receivers, but, but you will definitely see both. So uh, the question is, which is more widely used in Go? And the answer is pointer receivers. Now, when it comes to pointer receivers, one thing that's important to understand from like a syntactic point of view is that even though the uh, the input on the left-hand side, right, the receiver is a pointer. When you actually call the method, you can call, in this case, right, the grow method, you can actually call it on just a normal value or a pointer. It will sort of cast the value under the hood to a pointer if it isn't one already, right? So C, in this case, is just a circle. It's not a pointer to a circle. But when we call C.grow, the pointer to the circle is passed into the method. So we didn't need to kind of explicitly, you know, cast C to a pointer to a circle by, you know, adding an ampersand right here. Okay, so with that understood, um, let's move on to the assignment. So the assignment says, fix the bug in the codes that set message sets the message field of the given email structure and the new value persists outside the scope of the set message method. Okay, so we've got this email struct. We've got the set message, uh, the set message method. If I run the code in its current state, We've got before message, this is my first draft, Sandra, Bullock, after looks identical. 
right? And if we go and take a look at the test suite, then we can see that set message is being called. This is my second draft. So we would have expected this message to say, this is my second draft instead of this is my first draft. And the reason it's not happening is because this function essentially doesn't do anything. This method does nothing because this is not a pointer to an email. Let's go ahead and run that again. First draft, second draft. Perfect. Let's submit that. Everything we've done up to this point in the course has been in the browser. We've been writing code right in our text editor on boot dev. Now we're going to break out of that environment and do some local development on our own machine. We're going to figure out how to use the Go tool chain to build real production Go programs. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about packages. We need to understand packages in order to build our own Go programs. Now, you've probably noticed that up until this point in the course, every coding assignment has had the words package main at the top of the file. That just means that we've been writing code within the main package. And that's actually really important. The main package is a special type of package. It's a package that runs as a standalone program. So anytime you're writing an actual application that you need to run, say on the command line or as a server, you'll be writing code within the main package. A package with any other name, so any name besides main, is a library package. And basically what that means is it's imported by other libraries and application code. So, so oftentimes it's just imported by a main package so that it can use it. If you're familiar with NPM from JavaScript or pip from Python, that's effectively what a non-main package is in Go. It's just some code that you can publish as kind of a standalone library that then other developers can use in their main packages in their actual applications. So let's take a look at an example here. So you're probably familiar with this style of code. It's what we've been writing uh, all throughout this course. We've been writing within the main package because we've been writing executable scripts, right? Code that actually runs and does something. And then we have this import statement where we've typically just been importing from the standard library, but the standard library is made up of library packages, right? Like the FMT package or the math slash random package. The interesting thing about the main package is that it always has a main function and that main function serves as the entry point to the program. So packages that are not main packages, they're library packages, will just export functions, named functions, to be used again by other libraries and application code. Only main packages will have a main function that runs when the program starts. So to jump into the coding assignment, it just says fix the bug in the code. So let's go ahead and run the code and see what happens. <laughs> Nothing happens, right? We were stuck in this infinite loop. Apparently, apparently this code compiles and then does nothing. It's kind of a weird behavior, right? Um, in order to fix this, all we need to do is update this to be a main package so that we get as output for our code, a runnable executable, a script that we can actually execute in the browser. So let's go ahead and run that. And we get starting Malio server, stopping Malio server, kind of as we would expect uh, based on uh, based on this code here. So I'm gonna go ahead and submit that. So we're familiar with main packages, but what about library packages? Well, by convention, a package's name is the same as the last element of its import path. So for example, the math rand or math slash rand package from the Go standard library um, has files that begin with package rand. So the rand package lives at math slash rand. Now, it's important to point out that the standard library actually has another rand package at crypto slash rand. So they're both kind of the rand package, but they have different import paths. When a package isn't part of the standard library, when, for example, you make your own library package, the import path is typically the same as the remote URL that you'd use to go look at that library's source code. So for example, 
in our fictitious Malio products, right? Part of the Textio conglomerate of messaging products. Uh, they might have their own GitHub namespace. It's slash Malio. So github.com slash Malio is their GitHub organization. And then maybe they create their own package or their own, excuse me, repository on GitHub called Rand. And that's where the repository for their Rand package lives. That's where the source code lives on the internet, right? GitHub.com slash Malio slash Rand. Now, that package's name, by convention, should be Rand, because that's the last section of the import path, but that's just a convention. They could, if they wanted to, change the name of the package to say uh, random, and then all of the files in their source code would say package random. Now again, it is possible to use a different package name, one that's not the same as the last section of the import path, but I highly discourage it. Um, it is best practice to just use the convention and keep everything consistent. Now, one last thing to point out here is that in Go, packages live at the directory level rather than the file level. So if you're used to say Python or JavaScript, you might be used to importing code directly from other files. In Go, if all of the code lives within the same directory, then it's part of the same package and you don't need to import and export code between files in the same package or in the same directory. So in Go, you would only need to import code if it lives in a different directory or a different package. And packages and directories are one in the same. You can't have multiple packages in the same directory. So the quiz question for this section is, what would be the conventional package name of a package with the path github.com slash wagslane slash parser? And the answer is going to be parser because it should match the last section of the import path. The next question on the topic of package naming is, given the import path of path to rand, path slash to slash rand, which of these is a valid package name? So notice it's not asking which is a conventional, it's asking which one is actually valid. We've got random, rand, spam, any of these path. Well, rand would be the conventional name, but actually any of these could technically be used. Okay, it's time to write some Go code on our local machines, and you're going to need three things in order to make it through the rest of this chapter. The first thing is you're going to need an editor. I'll be using VS Code, throughout the rest of this chapter to do all of our local development stuff. You can use VS Code or you can use something else uh, that you're more familiar with. If you do use VS Code, you'll probably want to install the official Golang plugin. The next thing you'll need is a Unix-like or SH-like terminal. So if you're on Mac or Linux, then the built-in terminal will work just fine. If you're on Windows, you have a few different options. Personally, I would recommend installing Ubuntu in WSL2. I'll link uh, in the description down below how to do that. Uh, but you will need to have a terminal in order to follow along with these instructions. If you choose to use something like the default Windows command line, you're going to have to change some of the instructions in the terminal uh, to kind of translate them to your own machine. The last thing you'll need is just to install the Go toolchain on your local machine. And I would recommend one of two different ways. The first is to use uh, the official download page. And the second is to use um, the Webby download script. Either of them will work. And I've linked them both on this page. So you can go check them out and get Go downloaded. Now, once you've downloaded and installed Go, the way you can test to make sure that everything is working correctly is to type Go version in your terminal. If you get back a valid Go version, of at least version 1.20, which is what I'm using at the time of recording this video, uh, then you should be good to go. Now I need to point out at this point that some people get confused and think this is Go version 1.2. It's not, it's Go version 1.20, which is the same as Go version 1.20, which is one version greater than Go 1.19 or Go 1.19. So make sure that you're not on Go 1.2, that would be very, very old. If you're having trouble getting Go installed so that you can use it within your terminal, uh, the first thing I'll have you do is definitely try closing your shell session and restarting it. Um, a lot of times that can help just getting Go into your path. Uh, if that doesn't work, then Googling around uh, can, can be one method to kind of try to figure out what's going on on your machine. It's really hard for me to kind of predict what issues you might have, especially considering the fact that Mac OS, Windows, and Linux can all be a little different. But what I will recommend is that if you are having trouble, jump into the boot dev Discord and ask a specific question about the trouble you're having, and we'll be happy to help you out.
So the question for this step, really just to confirm that we installed Go correctly and that we can use it, uh, it asks, what does the Go version command print? And if we check the output, we can see it says Go version, Go 1.20. So that's the that's the version of the Go toolchain we have. Uh, Darwin, I'm on a Mac. So this is like the core Unix operating system. And then AMD 64, which is my CPU architecture. So it's going to be this bottom one. So we've talked about packages and we've talked about how packages exist basically at the directory level in Go. Now we need to talk about modules. A module is a bigger idea than just a package. A module is kind of a releasable collection of Go packages. So sometimes it's just a single package, right? You have a single package, a single module, and you release it um, as one package. But other times you might break that main package up into sub packages and you'd release all of those packages together as one Go module. Now, a repository is not a unique idea to Go, but it's sort of even greater than just a module. A repository or a Git repository is just a collection of code that you kind of keep in source control all at the same level, and it can contain one or more modules, though it's actually really common for a single repository to just have a single Go module within it. So while one monorepo can have many different Go modules inside of it, I would argue that's not usually the case. Typically, you'll have one Go module living in one repository. That's not a convention. That's just the way I've seen it more often than not. So for the sake of example, let's assume a Git repository that contains a single module. And that means that at the root of the Git repository, we'd have a single go.mod file that looks something like this. The first line contains the path prefix for the entire module. So remember, a module can contain multiple packages, and every package in that module, its import path is going to be prefixed with the path of the entire module. Uh, the next line just specifies the Go version, um, and the last line will specify any dependencies that this module depends on. So to answer the question, what is a Go module? An executable main package. Um, no, that could be part of a Go module, but it's not a Go module itself. A collection of packages that are released together. That is accurate. A file of Go code. No, a module will contain many, many files of Go code. Um, or a library package. And again, no, not necessarily. You could have a module that's just a single library package, but a Go module can be many more packages than that, or it could be a main package, for example. So it's going to be a collection of packages that are released together. So we need to talk just a little bit more about these import paths. Now, if you're familiar with NPM from the JavaScript eco ecosystem, uh, Cargo from the Rust ecosystem, or PIP from the Python ecosystem, then you're probably familiar with the idea of a namespace for a third-party package. For example, I might make a package called leftpad, publish it up to NPM's uh, central repository, and now anyone in the world just knowing my kind of namespace name, uh, left pad, can download and use my code as a dependency. The interesting thing about the Go ecosystem is that there is no central location for third-party packages like npmjs.com in JavaScript land. Instead, the Go toolchain sort of works on top of Git and actually uses the import path as the remote URL and it looks to that import path for where it can go download code. So more often than not, you'll see modules with import paths that start with github.com or gitlab.com because that's where the code itself is hosted. An important exception to this rule that the import path is where you go to download the code is the standard library. You don't need to download standard library code. It comes packaged with the Go toolchain. So the question is, do packages in the standard library have a module path prefix? The answer is no. The next question is, what is an import path? And I know we've already talked about this, but I want to show you a more concrete example. So this is the github.com slash wagslane slash go dash rabbit mq github repository. So this is a GitHub repository that I maintain. It's just a little package for RabbitMQ users, a little Go client for RabbitMQ. So this is a library module and a library package. It's intended for other developers to actually import this code into their applications. It's not a standalone, you know, main package. So let's take a look at the file structure. 
at the very root of the repository, we have the go.mod file. Now this is that kind of simple standard setup where one git repository happens to have one go module or one sort of releasable unit of code. And if we take a peek inside, we can see that the go.mod file uh, specifies the import path, github.com slash wagslane slash go dash rabbit MQ. So this matches the URL of the Git repository hosted on GitHub. Now, here's the interesting thing. This module only has one package that's exported to the outside world, and it exists here at this top level. So you can see all of these Go files, consume.go, consumeroptions.go, they exist at the top level of the repository. So when you import this package to use it, you just import from this root path because the root package is what you're importing. There are no sub packages to import here. But let's pretend for a second that we did want to export another package in the same Go module. So we have our top level Go module, Go RabbitMQ, and the top level package that can be accessed at the same import path as the module. Let's say we added another directory. We could call it maybe networks, and inside it would be the networks package. If someone wanted to import that package, then they would take the import path for the entire module, github.com slash wagslane slash go rabbitmq, which points to the root package, like we already talked about, and they would just append another slash networks onto the end, right? So the module path serves as a prefix for any nested packages. So to answer the original question, what is an import path? Well, it's not an HTTP connection and it's not a RESTful server. It's a module path plus an optional package subdirectory. So we've talked about repositories, modules, packages, you've got Go installed. Now let's talk about how you can set up your local development environment. And some of this stuff isn't going to be necessary and I'll point that out, but I do want to show you how I've set up my machine um, and you can emulate the way I do it if you like that style. Now I need to mention the Go path. If you're Googling around trying to figure out how to set up your local development environment for Go, you will almost certainly come across old, outdated articles that talk about the Go path. In kind of any version newer than, I think it's 1.13, right? So we're on 1.20 now. Um, you can basically forget about the Go path. You don't need to worry about it. Um, you used to have to put your code in the Go path. Um, now the recommended way is actually to not put your code in the Go path. It can be a little confusing, but Again, generally speaking, you can just forget about the Go path, and if you find any articles that talk about it, they're probably outdated. The entire idea of Go modules is what replaced the old Go path. So the question is, do you need to put your code inside of your Go path? Um, the answers are yes, it doesn't matter, and no, in fact, you shouldn't. And actually, in fact, you shouldn't. So I've altered my window layout um, so that it's a little bit easier for you to see what I'm doing. I've got the boot dev instructions over here on the left, and then I've got VS Code over here on the right with my terminal at the bottom. Cool. So I'm just here in my file system. I'm not within the Go path. I'm just kind of in my personal workspace, um, and we'll just follow these instructions. It says create a new directory and enter it. So we'll make directory hello go. And let me just ls, show you the new directory was created, and we'll enter that directory. Cool. Now, inside of that new hello go directory, I'm going to create a new go module. So we'll do go mod init. And I keep all of my code on GitHub, so I'll do github.com slash uh, my username, because that's my namespace on GitHub, so wags lane, slash uh, the name of this project, which uh, we're just calling hello go. Cool, it says go creating new module. Um, now if I ls, I should see that new go.mod file. Next, let's go ahead and take a look at that file. So you can see it just created a new module, github.com slash wax lane slash hello go with the go version. And there are no dependencies yet. So there's no other sections to the go module file. So now that we are done with this step, the question is why does go include a remote URL in module paths, right? So this is a, remote URL in theory, right? When we push this up to GitHub, we'll push it up to this URL. Um, and the answers are to confuse new gophers, uh, to ensure that developers are using source control or to simplify remote downloading of packages. And it is definitely that last one. 
The next question on the same step asks, what is hello go in our case? The repository slash directory name or the module path prefix. And in our case, it's actually the name of the repository. So again, if we were to push this up to GitHub, um, GitHub is the name of the website where it's hosted. Wags Lane is my namespace on GitHub. And hello go would be the name of the directory that we are in and the name of the repository up on GitHub. And then this next question is just to make sure that we completed the step properly. What does the first line of go.mod contain? And it contains module followed by the module path. Now, so that VS Code will work properly with all my syntax highlighting with the Go plugin, I'm actually going to reopen uh, VS Code to that same directory, the hello Go directory. So we'll just be working within this module uh, for a second. And the instructions say inside of hello go, so now I'm inside of this hello go directory at kind of the top level of uh, my VS code window. Um, it says create a new file called main.go. So let's go ahead and do that. Conventionally, the file in the main package uh, that contains the main function is called main.go. Uh, paste the following code into your file. Okay, cool. So we should all be familiar with this code by now. Right, we've we've probably written code like this, uh, I don't know, almost a hundred times by now in the boot dev platform. Next, it looks like we're just going to run the code using the Go tool chains interpreter. So, go run main.go, and we get a nice hello world printed to the console. There are sort of two main ways to run Go code locally. One is with the go run command, like we just used. The other is to use the go build command, which we'll get into in just a second. And actually in general, I prefer the go build method. Uh, go run is really only suitable for when you're running uh, tiny little scripts like this one. And just to be clear about the difference, go run, so go run main.go runs the go code in the file that we pass in, right? In this case, main.go. And, and that's all it does. Go build actually builds a production executable, um, which is how you'll use your Go code in the real world. So I typically prefer building that production executable um, just because it's more accurately reflects how your code will run in production. So the question on this step is, does Go run build a production executable? And the answer is no. It just kind of one-off runs your code. It doesn't build any uh, production-ready artifacts. Now, at the end of this same step, we're asked to execute the go help run command in our shell. So go help run, um, which just prints out a bunch of help information on how to use uh, the go run command. And the question for the step says, uh, which can go run accept as arguments? And if we scroll to the top, so here's where I ran go help run. Uh, we can see the usage information and it says, run compiles and runs the named main go package. Typically the package is specified as a list of .go source files from a single directory, but it can also be an import path, file system path, or pattern matching a single known package. So which can go run accept as arguments, package names, file names. Um, it actually looks like it can handle both. Great, now we get to use go build. So you can, for the most part, just forget about go run. You probably don't need to use it um, all too often. So go build compiles go code into an executable program. So all you need to do is make sure that you're in the same uh, kind of main package that you want to build. So I'm here in the hello go directory. Um, I can ls to prove it to you. We've got the main.go file here, package main, func main, all that good stuff. Uh, we'll run go build. We don't even need to pass in package or file names. It just builds uh, the package of the current directory. So as you can see here, we have this new executable binary in our current hello go directory. Now, if you remember way back to, I think chapter one of this course, we talked about the difference between interpreted languages and compiled languages. And one of the amazing things about Go is that we build compiled executables that we can execute anywhere. So this hello go binary, we can now copy this, put it on another machine and run it without even needing to install the Go tool chain on that machine. This is compiled machine code. So we can now run this hello go program like we would any other executable dot slash hello go. And it prints hello world.
Now, I do want to show you a little tip here because every time you update your code, let's say I change this to Hello World 2, if I just rerun Hello Go, it still will just print Hello World, and that's because I didn't recompile my code. So a lot of new Go developers kind of forget to recompile their code, and they think they have bugs or their code's not doing what they expect. You have to recompile. What I'd recommend doing is just every time you update your code and want to rerun it, uh, you should build and compile, and you can just do it in the same step uh, by doing go build and then double ampersand dot slash the name of your binary. So this basically says compile my code. If that succeeds, run the compiled binary. And the question for this step is what was created after running go build? An executable file named main, an executable file named hello go, or a package named cmd? And in this case, it was an executable file named hello go. Right, we've got it right there. It just kind of defaults to the name um, of the directory. The next question for this step is what happens when you run a dot slash hello go? And I actually changed this to hello world too, but if we do it again after changing the code back, um, the options are program panics, hello world is printed or the code compiles, um, hello world is printed. And it's important to understand here, the reason we don't say the code compiles is because at this step dot slash hello go, all we are doing is running the compiled binary. We're not recompiling the code. The next command in the go tool chain that we're gonna talk about is go install. Now, to be honest, I don't use it a ton, but I still think it's important to understand because you'll see it around. Okay, so ensure you're in your hello go repo, then run go install. So I'm here in the hello go directory and we run go install. And next we navigate out of our project directory. So I'm gonna go up one level. And what it's telling me is Go has installed the Hello Go program globally. So the Go tool chain, when we ran Go install, basically compiled that code and then made it globally accessible to our entire machine. So now if I run uh, Hello Go, notice without the dot slash, because I'm not running a program in my current directory, I'm running now a program that's in my path it prints hello world. So now I can use this script that I built anywhere on my machine, which is just super useful um, if you're building kind of scripts for your own local productivity. So the question for this step is what does go install do? Saves local code to the remote source control provider, installs dependencies or compiles and installs the program locally. And the answer is that it compiles and installs the program locally. Again, you would really only use this if you're building scripts for your own personal use on your machine. The next question for this same step is code must be compiled with go build before running go install. It's true false. Now, if you were paying attention, you probably noticed the answer here, but we actually ran go install without a binary existing in our current directory. So if I go back into the hello go directory and run go install, You'll see there's actually no hello go binary that exists here um, and it works just the same. So the code does not need to be compiled with go build first. All right, so we've created a main package and a executable program. Uh, now we're going to build a library package, a custom library package. So uh, what we're supposed to do is create a sibling directory at the same level as the hello go directory. So I'm in the hello go directory currently, I'm going to go up one level and Let's see, so we've got hello go in here. I'm gonna make a new directory called my strings. And then we'll go into my strings. And here we need to initialize a new go module. So I'll do go mod init, github.com slash wags lane slash my strings. And that module is created. Now to get my VS code tooling all working properly again, I'm going to just reopen VS code to that level. So we'll go back and find the my strings directory and open directly into that directory. Okay. Next, we create a new file called mystrings.go. So this is the go.mod that we created with the go mod init command. And now we're creating a new file called mystrings.go. And we want to paste the following code. Okay. So package my strings, that's the first thing to notice, right? This is not a main package. So we won't be able to build this package as a standalone executable. This package will be kind of the intention is for us to use it in our other hello go package. The other thing to notice about this code, aside from the package name, is that 
there is no main function here. Again, because it's not an executable program. We're just going to be exporting functions that can be used in our main package. Let's talk a little bit about this reverse function. So this is the only function in the mystrings package at the moment. And, uh, you know, theoretically it reverses a string from left to right, although I haven't tested it. Um, but the important thing is that we need to capitalize. We need to capitalize the first letter of the function's name. And that's because in Go, that's how we export a function. If it were little r, then this function would not be able to be used outside of this package. But we want to export it because we want to be able to use it in our main package, right, in the hello go directory, um, and, and kind of import this logic and use it. Now, we're told to run the go build command here in this directory, and you'll notice it doesn't actually seem to do anything. There, again, there was no executable file that was built because this is not a main package. Um, but it is worth pointing out that go build is still a useful command because it checks for compile time errors. So for example, if I uh, create an invalid token here and then run go build, uh, we will get compile time errors. So it is um, still kind of useful just to make sure that this code compiles. So the question for this step is, what was the output of the go build command in the library package? Um, was it an executable program or was the compiled package silently saved to the local build cache? Well, we didn't get an executable package, right? Uh, this is not a main package, so we don't get um, a nice runnable executable. I instead, it is silently saved to the local build cache so that it can be used later in an actual executable program. And then the next question is, why is the function capital R reverse instead of lowercase r reverse? And it's uh, lowercase names aren't exported for external use or conventionally uppercase names are used in Go. Uh, the answer is that lowercase names are not exported. So by convention, functions can have either a lowercase name or an uppercase name, and uppercase names are exported from the package. So this next question is, does a package in a folder named date parser need to also be called date parser, right? Does the package need to be date parser? Now you'll notice that we created a directory called my strings and a package called my strings. And if you remember back to earlier in this chapter, we talked about how by convention, that's the best way to do it. It's not necessary, um, but it is, it is the convention. Okay, so now let's use our reverse function back in the main package in the hello go directory, right? So it says uh, modify hello goes main.go. So I need to reopen, I'm going to open VS code back into the hello go directory. It says modify hello goes main.go file. Okay, so we'll use parentheses here so that we can do some multiple imports. And we'll be using the import path that matches the module name of our my strings package. So in my case, it was github.com slash wags lane slash my strings. And then here we just copy this code from the instructions. And in fact, let me space this out so we can see it just a little bit better. Okay, cool. So we've imported the my strings package and then down in our code, we can use my strings, which is the name of the package dot reverse to call that exported function. Okay. Now, because we've added a dependency, we need to update our go.mod file. So edit the hello goes go.mod file to contain the following. This is the important part down here. So we need to add replace example.com username my strings with dot dot slash my strings and require example.com slash username slash my strings version zero. Now I do need to update this, right? Because I didn't use example.com, I used github.com slash wags lane. Now what's going on here? right? Go's dependency management is very heavily based on Git and remote URLs. So normally what you would do is take your MyStrings, MyStrings package and push it up to GitHub and then import it from there. And, and sort of all of the Go packages in the world that require the MyStrings package will point up to that remote location, that remote server. What we are doing here with this replace and require, well, specifically the replace, is we're kind of doing a little hack 
to get things to work locally without having to publish to Git. So we're basically saying, I want you to take this string, this import path, right? GitHub.com slash Wagslane slash my strings, and don't go look for it out on the internet. Instead, just resolve it to this path, dot, dot, slash my strings, right? And now because, well, I should probably get back into the hello go directory, right? Dot, dot, slash my strings. This is the directory containing the my strings package, right? So we're basically just saying replace this with my local uh, file system. We're telling Go how to find this package on our machine. So now that we've made those changes, uh, we can build and run this program again. So go build dot slash hello go, build and run. And it looks like it's working correctly. This, this function is supposed to reverse the string and we get this nasty little delrowole. And the question is just asking us what was printed and that's what we got. On the same step, this next question asks, how does the Go toolchain know where to find the imported code? NPM hosts the files publicly. It downloads it from Google's servers. We use the replace keyword in the go.mod to point it to the relative location of my strings, or it was fetched from GitHub. Now, again, I want to point out that most of the time you'll be fetching code from GitHub or GitLab or some remote source when you're using third party dependencies. In our case, we used this replace keyword uh, to point the go tool chain to the location of the my strings package on our machine. So we already briefly talked about this, but I just want to reiterate that this little replace hack is useful for kind of testing and doing things on our local machine, but it's not suitable for production. Generally, what you would do is push up that my strings git repository to GitHub and then import from there. So you will typically not see replace aliases in production go.mod files very often. You'll just see um, packages sort of required vanilla from their remote location. So now we're going to practice using a remote third-party module. It says create a new directory in the same par uh, parent directory as hello go and my strings called date test. So let's go back up one level and create a new directory, make dir date test. And then I'm gonna go ahead and again, reopen VS code into that directory. Okay, create a main.go with this code. We can do that. Next, initialize a module. So we do go mod init. And again, I'll just use github.com slash wagslane slash date test. Creating new go.mod to add module requirements and subs, do go mod tidy. Okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna ignore that for just a second. And instead I'm gonna follow the instructions. It says download and install the remote go tiny date package using go get. Okay, so we've used go install in the past, right? Go install installs an executable on our machine to be used anywhere. Um, go get is how we go download and install third party dependencies. So we're going and grabbing the github.com slash wagslane slash go tiny time module. And it gets added automatically to our go.mod. You'll see that and it just kind of grabs the latest version. Cool, um, print to co the contents of your go.mod. Uh, I don't need to run that because we've got it open here in VS code. Um, and then compile and run our program again. So let's do that, go build and run, and it's going to compile to a file called date test, right? Because that's the name of our directory. Cool, and as you can see, it's printing out this date here. So what did we do, right? We used go get to download code from this remote location, which also happens to be the import path, right? Because that's how go packages work typically. So let me go grab that and just show you, this is, this is a package that's hosted on GitHub. So the Go toolchain actually went to GitHub and downloaded this code, right? 
added it to the go.mod as a dependency, and then created this new file called go.sum that kind of contains any uh, transient dependencies or dependencies used by the go tiny time package that we just imported. So it kind of keeps track of everything that we're using. And the question for this one is, how did the go tool chain know where to download the go tiny time package? Oh man. This uh, this question is not optimized for this ridiculously zoomed in view. It says the module import path is used for remote lookups, e.g. github.com slash wags lane slash go timing time. Um, or the Go tool chain has every open source Go modules location memorized. Uh, that is not true. It just it just does a remote lookup, right? It goes and fetches that from the remote Git URL. And then just to make sure that we did the step correctly, uh, it's asking us what was printed after running the new date test program. You can see it right there. And it looks like it's this 2020-04-03, right? It's it's this hard-coded date in RFC 3339 format. So hopefully that last section gave you a taste of local development, at least showing you how to build and compile some code on your own machine. We'll obviously be doing a lot more local development at the end of this video with the project, uh, but for now, for the rest of this course, we'll be back working in the boot dev web interface. Cool. So we're on to talking about clean packages. And this is kind of just a, a, an article that I'm not going to bother reading out loud on screen, but I'll talk about each individual section as the questions are asked. So the question is, should you export code from the main package. And that's talked about um, down here. It's basically simple. Don't export code from the main package. And if you think about it, it makes sense. There's no reason to capitalize function names in the main package because no other packages can import from a main package. A main package is built into its own standalone executable. It's not a library. So uh, capitalizing functions in the main package is just kind of confusing because it, it kind of signals to developers that you're writing code that's meant to be imported and it's not. This next question says, when should you not export a function, variable, or type? Now, this is an interesting question. I think a lot of newer developers think, well, maybe I should just export more stuff because maybe the users of my package will find it useful. Um, you actually want to think in the reverse. You want to export as few things as possible when you're building library packages. Because anytime you export a function, you now need to support that function, right? You can't really take it away later. Everyone's code will break, right? So you should really think about what you're exposing to your users as like the surface area of a shape. And you want to keep that surface area as small as possible to keep the maintenance burden down and to make your package easy to use, right? The fewer things that your users need to know about in order to effectively use your package, the easier it'll be to use. So when should you not export a function variable or type? Um, when the end user doesn't need to know about it. Hide everything that they don't need to know about. The next question is, should you often change a package's exported API? So API stands for Application Programming Interface. And basically, anytime you export something from a library package, uh, you're adding that thing to the package's API, right? It's the interface that other developers will use to access your package. So should you often change a package's exported API? The answer is that no, you should try to keep changes to your internal functionality, right? Imagine if the Go programming language, uh, let's say the standard library, changed fmt.println to fmt.print, right? And just removed fmt.println. That would break an immense amount of code, right? So you don't want to go about uh, publishing packages that you intend to kind of update the API for uh, very rapidly. Stable APIs are good APIs. So should you often change a package's exported API? No, try to keep the changes to internal functionality. Yes, move fast and break things. Or if the package is main, then yes. Uh, the answer is just no, try to keep changes to internal functionality. Again, if the package is main, then it's irrelevant because you're not building uh, a library. I want to talk about the difference between concurrent or parallel programming and synchronous or sequential programming. Now, it's worth pointing out at this point that 
concurrency and parallelism are different, and we'll talk about their differences in a future course. For, for now, we're going to kind of treat them as the same idea, and I'll just kind of refer to them as concurrency. Uh, similarly, sequential programming and synchronous, they're slightly different terms, but um, I'm going to kind of bucket them for the purpose of this discussion. We'll be really comparing uh, concurrent code to synchronous uh, or sequential code. So let's start with the easy one. Let's talk about synchronous or sequential programming. Say we have some code, x colon equals 5, x plus plus, and then maybe fmt dot print dot print line x. The nice thing about this code and what makes it synchronous or sequential is that the code executes in order from top to bottom, right? First, we create a variable named x set equal to five, then we increment it by one, and then we print x, right? Everything's happening in order from top to bottom, one thing at a time. Now, this is usually what you want. It's simple, it's easy to reason about, it's easy to write code this way. The problem is sometimes it's not the most efficient way to write performant code or code that can run as fast as possible on a given set of hardware. So in order to understand how we can maybe optimize this, we need to look into how your computer's CPU or central processing unit works. So your CPU has a clock speed, um, which basically like from a very high level means how many instructions how many instructions it can do per, let's say, second. Those aren't necessarily the units, but it is basically how many computations it can do um, per amount of time. We could just say it's seconds to keep things simple. Okay, so when we're analyzing this code over here on the right, basically what needs to happen is first we set x equal to five, and that takes up one instruction, right? After that, we get to increment x by six, that'll take up another instruction, and then we get to print x. So the speed at which we can execute this little program here is dependent on how fast the CPU's clock speed is. So if we want our program to go faster, we can basically do one of two things. Either we can reduce the number of instructions required uh, for our program to execute, or we can get a faster CPU, one that can do more instructions per second. The problem is getting a faster CPU sometimes is really, really expensive. And so instead of getting a faster CPU, what we've kind of done over the years is instead add more CPUs. And in this case, um, we've kind of broken the CPU up actually into what we call different cores. So you might actually have a quad core processor, each of which let's say does, I don't know, 5,000 instructions per nanosecond. I'm totally making these units up, um, but you get the idea. Any one of these CPU cores can only do 5,000, but the interesting thing is they can all do 5,000 per nanosecond at the same time. So if we distribute our program across all of the cores, in theory, we should be able to go, uh, we should be able to go about four times as fast. Again, if we use all four cores instead of just one. The problem is that most code we write can't take advantage of all four cores. For example, let's look at this code over here. We set x equal to five and then we increment it and then we print it. It has to happen in one, two, three, right? In order one, two, three. We can't do all of these instructions at the same time. If we did, then x plus plus would have nothing to increment because we never would have set um, an x variable equal to five in the first place. And print line x would have nothing to print because x hasn't been set yet. So writing concurrent or parallel code can drastically speed up the performance of our programs because we're able to distribute um, kind of all the instructions that we need to compute across multiple cores. The problem is we do actually need to write our code in a different way. We need to expect that some of the instructions are going to happen at the same time. And that's what's going to speed up our program. So let's say we had a little bit more code in our program here. Maybe we have x, or excuse me, y colon equals six, y minus minus, fmt dot print line y. Okay, this code here in this block, kind of dependent on each other, right? We have to do it in one, two, three order. 
Um, and the same goes for this block here. But we don't have to necessarily do this block of code where we calculate and print X before or after we calculate and print Y. They're, they're kind of separate in that way. So what we can actually do is take this block of code and execute it in one core, and at the same time, execute this other block of code in another core, doing them at the same time. So let's sort of visualize the runtime of this program here. If we run this code synchronously or sequentially, right, not taking advantage of two CPU cores, but instead doing it all in one core, then our running time might look something like this. I don't know, let's just say six nanoseconds. But instead, if we run it across two cores in parallel, each core executes at the same time, and they'll each take approximately, let's say, three nanoseconds. So we're done in half the time. Again, because we took advantage of the hardware that was available to us. So to wrap up, writing concurrent code in many cases can drastically reduce of how long it takes to run our programs. And it depends just a little bit on kind of fundamentally what we are trying to do. So in this case, we literally could take a program and chop its runtime in half by utilizing a little bit more hardware. So this chapter is going to be all about concurrency in the Go programming language. And the great thing about Go is how easy it makes it to write concurrent code. So the question is, how do we write concurrent code in Go? What's the syntax? Well. There's actually a really awesome built-in keyword to the Go program language, the Go keyword. And it spawns a new Go routine when you use it. Now, a Go routine is a kind of unique to the Go programming language, but at a high level, you can just think of it as a separate thread of execution. We're essentially telling the Go programming language, hey, all this stuff in this function, right, that I'm calling with the Go keyword, can happen in parallel, right? We can go execute that on another core of the CPU if we need to. So whenever we use the Go keyword, execution kind of immediately jumps to the next step after the function call, right? So this do something function will kind of go be executed in parallel, right? And then execution continues in the current function um, kind of just on the next line. And then as a last note, before we jump into some code to see how this really works, when we use the go keyword, we're not able to capture any return values from this function call, which makes sense, right? Because we're kind of moving on. We can't wait for the function to finish and return some stuff. That's the whole point. We want the function to go kind of do its thing on another thread. So let's try this out in an assignment. It says, at Malio, we send a lot of network requests, right? Requests over the internet. Each email we send must go out over the internet. To serve our millions of customers, we need, to, we need a single Go program to be capable of sending thousands of emails at once, right? So we need to be able to do lots of things at once. This is what Go routines allow us to do. Edit the send email function to execute its anonymous function concurrently so that the received message prints after the sent message. So let's go ahead and run the code in its current state. And we get Email received, hello there, Stacy. Email sent, hello there, Stacy. Right, so it looks out of order. Now here's our send email function. It takes a message um, as a string parameter. And the interesting thing is it calls this anonymous function here, right? So it's defining this function and then immediately calling it um, where it's going to wait for 250 milliseconds and then print email received. And then this function will exit and it will print email sent, right? And then print the message. So again, that's why this is out of order, right? We're, we're executing this function first, and then we're moving on to the next line. So the way we fix this is by using the go keyword to execute this bit of code at the same time as this bit of code, right? The go keyword will immediately move down to line 13 on the main thread or the main go routine and spawn a new go routine to kind of do this in the background. And because of this waiting time, the email received message should happen afterwards. So let's go ahead and run this again. Sent received, sent received, looks good to me. So you may have been thinking to yourself, well, how useful is it to call a function in a Go routine if I can't even get the return values? 
The answer in Go is that we use channels typically to kind of resynchronize our code. So typically we'll use Go routines or the Go keyword plus some function to go do a bunch of computation all at the same time. And then we can kind of resynchronize either in the main Go routine or in some other Go routine by passing data back and forth between Go routines using channels. A channel is really just a thread safe or Go routine safe queue. We can put stuff in one end and read it out the other end in the same order. So we'll typically have one or more Go routines kind of sending data into the channel. Maybe they finished a calculation, they're returning their results over the channel, and then we'll have one or more Go routines on the other end reading that data off of the channel and processing it in some way, maybe sending a report, maybe printing it to the console. So this is the syntax for making a channel and channels are typed. So we can say this is a channel of integers and then we can send data into the channel using this arrow operator. It's, it's really pretty intuitive. We're saying 69 is being sent into the channel and then it's actually the same operator to read a value out of a channel. We just move it over to the other side. Again, super intuitive. We're reading a value out of the channel and saving it into the variable V in this example. Now, it's important to understand that the, both of these operations, sending and receiving on a channel, are blocking operations. So if I'm trying to send a value into a channel and there's no other Go routine on the other side that will be able to read it out, then my code will actually stop and wait on this Go routine until there is a reader ready. And the same goes for reading. When a Go routine gets to this section of code, if there's nothing being sent into the channel on another Go routine, then this code will just sit and wait until something is sent. So let's move on to the assignment. It says run the program, you'll see that it deadlocks and never exits. So a deadlock is basically when all of the Go routines in a program are blocking and there's nothing for them to do. It means there's a bug in the code. So let's run the code just to see what that feels like. Although I think it's just going to feel like it's running the code for a long time. So I'm gonna go ahead and cancel that. The filter old emails function is trying to send on a channel and there's no other go routine running that can accept the value from the channel. Okay, so let's take a look. Filter old emails, takes some emails as an input, creates an is old channel, and then it looks like it loops over the emails. And if they are before a certain date, it's going to pass the Boolean true into the channel. Otherwise it's gonna pass in false. And then once that loop exits, it's going to read out of the channel here and print to the console, you know, whether or not the emails uh, were old. Okay, cool. So this makes sense. This makes sense why this is blocking, right? This first send, either here or here, whichever one happens first, is going to block because the reader, like that code hasn't happened yet. This is the same, this is the same Go routine, right? This is not happening at the same time as this is happening. So we'll use a Go routine to fix it. Uh, fix the deadlock by spawning an anonymous Go routine to write to the is old channel instead of using the same Go routine that's reading from it. Okay, cool. So we need to run this loop essentially in a new Go routine. So we'll do go func and we'll just use an anonymous function here because we don't really care about naming it. And we'll just run that entire block of code in a new anonymous function. So now this and this will happen at the same time. Let's go ahead and run that. Cool, and this looks like what I would expect. I'll go ahead and submit that. So there's this concept of a token when we are talking about concurrent programs. A, a token is basically a unary value, right? So not, not binary, there's not two possible values, true and false unary there's just one possible value and when there's just one possible value we really don't care much about that value it's not interesting in any way right so it's not that we care what is passed when we're working with tokens it's that we care when and if something is passed through a channel at all so for example this code here is reading a value out of this channel and it's just discarding whatever it reads out. It doesn't even care what it is. It's just waiting to see uh, kind of when something comes through the channel. 
So let's move on to the assignment um, and kind of put that into practice. It says, our Malio server isn't able to boot up until it receives the signal that all of its databases are online. And it learns about them being online by waiting for tokens, which are just empty structs, um, on a channel. Complete the wait for dbs function. It should block until it receives numdbs, so this integer here, um, tokens on the db chan channel, right? So this is a channel of empty structs. And again, empty structs are tokens. They're unary values. Um, they're not interesting. They don't have any fields. Each time it reads a token, the get databases channel go routine will print a message to the console for you. Okay, so I'm guessing that's down here. Yeah, it looks like it's going to watch um, and, and print here. Okay, so let's get started and write some code. It should block until it receives numdbs tokens. So it's a variable amount of tokens. So I guess the easiest way to do this would be for with a loop. So for i colon equals zero, i is less than numdbs, i plus plus. And then in here, we're just going to wait for a token to come across the db channel, right? So it'll block once and then it'll move on to the next iteration of the loop, block again, move on until we've waited for, you know, numdbs tokens. Um, and then block until it receives the tokens, each time it reads a token, that's it. Looks like we don't have to return anything. So let's run that. Database one is online, two is online. This looks good to me. So now let's talk about buffered channels. So the channels we've been using up until this point haven't really stored anything in them, right? We needed a sender and a receiver at the same time. As soon as the sender sends, the receiver receives. There's nothing kind of stored in the channel at any given time. But that is exactly what a buffered channel is. So we have a buffer of some length, let's say five different items, and senders can actually send into the channel even when there's no receivers until the buffer fills up. So a sender could send five things into the channel and then the buffer is full, the channel is full, right? And when a receiver finally goes to read and pop items off of the other end, it will read and pop them off in order one by one until the channel is empty. So this is the syntax we'd use if we want to make a channel of integers with a buffer size of 100. We just use that optional second parameter um, to the built-in make function. So let's move on to the assignment. It says, we want to be able to send emails in batches. A writing go routine will take an entire batch of email messages to a buffer channel. Uh, we'll write an entire batch of email messages to a buffer channel. And later, once the channel is full, a reading go routine will go read all of those messages. So we can actually go find where that's happening here in the test suite. Da, 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 da. Okay, here. So send emails. Um, oh, nope, this is where they're getting read. I'm sorry. Ah, I'm silly. The function that we'll be working on is what's writing into the channel. So emails to send is the channel. Um, we're supposed to write an entire batch of emails into the channel. And then theoretically, sometime in the future, those emails will be read out of the channel and actually sent off. Okay, cool. So what happens if I run the code in its current state? I'm kind of imagining that it's going to block forever. Yeah, that's never going to exit. So add emails to queue is getting called here. And send emails is getting called here. And notice that they're getting called on the same, they're both running in the same Go routine, right? Add emails to queue is, there's no Go keyword anywhere that I see. So that's why we are blocking here. There's no reader on the other end. Right, But because we want to do this batching, we actually should be able to do it all in the same thread. We just need a big enough batch size. So we need a buffer. If we buffer this emails to send channel with the length of the emails slice, then we should have enough room to push all of the emails into the buffer channel. Let's go ahead and try that. Cool, that looks like it is working channels in Go can actually be closed. And there's really only one reason you'd want to close a Go channel, and it's to indicate that you're done with it. A channel should always be closed from the sending side. So the sending Go routine, the one that's pushing values into the channel, will be the one to close the channel. And that will indicate to any readers of the channel that this channel is closed, there's nothing else to read from it. 
And the actual syntax is really simple. It's just the built-in close function where we pass in the channel itself. Now on the reading side, we can actually check if a channel is closed using this kind of optional second variable um, that comes back when reading a channel, this okay variable. It's a Boolean. Uh, if the Boolean is true, the channel is open. If it is false, the channel is closed. If the channel happens to be buffered, then OK will remain true until the channel is emptied out. So OK will only be false once the buffered channel is empty and closed. The last thing I'll mention before we jump into the assignment is that you never want to send a value across a closed channel. If you do, that Go routine will panic. And that's why it's really important that you only ever close a channel from the sending side because that go routine is going to be the one that knows when it's done sending values. Okay, on to the assignment. It says, Emilio, we're all about tracking what our systems are up to with great logging and telemetry. The send reports function sends out a batch of reports to our clients and reports back how many were sent across the channel. It closes the channel when it's done. Okay, so the send reports function here sends the reports or sends the number of reports across the channel and closes the channel. Great. Complete the count reports function. It should use an infinite for loop to read from the channel. If the channel is closed, break out of the loop. Otherwise keep a running total of the number of reports sent and return the total number of responses. Okay, cool. So first things first, we need to keep track of a total. So let's start it at zero. And we know that at the end of the function, we'll be returning the total, right? Then it says, use an infinite for loop to read from the channel. Okay, so four. Um, and then we need to read from the channel. So we'll do um, numsent and read from the numsent channel. Okay, if the channel is closed, break out of the loop. Ah, right, so we need to use that syntax to check if the channel is closed. So if not okay, if the channel is closed, then we'll return total. Or I suppose we're returning down here, so we could just break. Let's just do that instead. Break. Otherwise, uh, we do total plus equals numsent. And it's important to understand that as soon as OK is false, numsent will just be a zero value. So it's not a valid value that was sent across the channel. So it's safe to just, just break like that. OK, cool. This is looking correct to me. Let's go ahead and run that. Let's see. Batch of 15, 38, and 61 cent. Do those add up to 114? Uh, it looks like they might. Uh, like. My terrible in, in my head arithmetic says that that's perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and submit it. The range keyword works with channels as well as slices and maps. So we can actually range over the channel and it will block until a value is ready. It will read it into, in this case, the variable item and then execute the body. And it will do that over and over and over for each new value coming across the channel. Um, and we'll only exit the loop once the channel is closed. So onto the assignment, it says, it's that time again. Malio is hiring and we've been assigned to do the interviews. For some reason, the Fibonacci sequence is Malio's interview problem of choice. We've been tasked with building a small toy program that we can use in the interview. Okay, so complete the concurrent Fibonacci function. If you're not familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, um, I don't wanna go like too crazy far into it, but it's basically this sequence of numbers here where each number is the sum of the two preceding numbers. So one and two equal three, two and three equal five. In fact, you probably can't even see that. Let me zoom this in a little bit. So one and one, or one and two equal three, two and three equal five, three and five equal eight, right? So it's just this kind of set sequence of numbers. Okay, complete the concurrent fib function. It should create a new channel of ints. So let's go ahead and do that. So channel ints make channel of ints, great. Call Fibonacci in a Go routine, passing to it the channel and the number of Fibonacci numbers to generate. Okay, so we have a Fibonacci function here and it takes the numbers and the channel itself. So let's start a Go routine in an anonymous function. Go func, call the function um, and 
in here we call Fibonacci. Let me just copy and paste that because I can't spell it. <laughs> uh, it takes N and this channel of ints as input. Okay. And then use a range loop to read from the channel and print out the numbers one by one each on a new line. Okay, so the Fibonacci function is going to pass the, its results back over this channel. So it's it's taking the channel and it's going to act as the sender on the channel. So we down here below um, kind of where we're spawning that go routine need to act as the reader. So for V in range channel events, Print out the numbers one by one. Print line V. And then when the Fibonacci function is done, it will close the channel, so we'll exit from the loop. Cool, let's go ahead and run that. Does this look accurate? 10 numbers, zero and one, zero plus one is one, one plus two is three, two plus three is five, looking good to me. On to select statements. So a select statement is similar to a switch statement. If you're familiar with switch statements from other languages or from Go, where it's kind of this if else uh, chain. And we're really looking to kind of match a specific case. But what's interesting about select statements is they're unique to channels. And they basically let us listen on two different channels and kind of execute one block of code um, or, or, or rather execute a block of code for the channel that sends a value the soonest. So we can kind of simultaneously listen on both channels. And if this channel sends a value first, then we'll do you know one thing. Otherwise, when this one sends something, we'll do another thing. So one Go routine can kind of process events from multiple channels at the same time using a select statement. So this is the syntax here. We create a select block and then multiple cases one for each channel that we are interested in kind of listening for values on or reading uh, values off of. So if this channel ints has a value ready, then this case will be executed. Otherwise, if this one, uh, if channel strings has a value ready, then this case will be executed. If both have a value ready at the same time, then one will be chosen randomly. So you don't want to kind of be dependent on any weird ordering. Um, basically, as stuff comes across, it's going to get processed. So on to the assignment. It says, complete the log messages function. Use an infinite for loop and a select statement to log the emails and SMS messages as they come across the two channels. Okay, so channel of emails, channel of SMS messages. Add a condition to return from the function when one of the two channels closes, whichever is first. Um, use the log SMS and log email functions to log the messages. Okay, cool. So, uh, infinite for loop, start there. And inside we'll need to select. Can use this as our syntax guide over here. Uh, we've got case, uh, email, okay. Value from channel of emails. If that case fires, then we say, if not, okay. So if the channel is closed, we just return and this function returns nothing. So we could just naked return. Um, otherwise we need to log email. I think that's, yeah, log email. There it is, the email. Cool, other case, uh, SMS, okay. From the channel of SMS, if not, okay, return. Otherwise, log the SMS, right? So this for loop will just go forever until one of these two channels closes, in which case it'll return, right? And it's important that we return before we do the logging because when a channel closes, the okay variable um, is false and a zero value comes across the channel um, that wasn't sent into the channel, if that makes sense. So like the closure happens after the last value comes out. Let's go ahead and run that. Looking good to me, we'll submit it. The select statement also has a default case. You don't always need to use the default case and basically the default case only fires if you're interested in non-blocking. So for example, this select block here will fire the case uh, that kind of pulls this V value out of this channel 
if there is a value ready to be pulled at the time that we enter the select block. If there's not a value ready to be read out of the channel, um, then the default case is fired immediately. So it kind of turns the select block into a non-blocking block of code. And then there's a few things we're going to need to know for this assignment. The first are these uh, there's several standard library functions. So time.tick returns a channel that sends a value on a given interval. So we could say uh, pass in a second to time.tick and we would get back a channel um, that receives a value once per second. Pretty cool for like rate limiting, doing something on a set interval. Um, time.after sends a single value after the specified time has passed. So if we created a new channel with time.after and passed in one second, then one value would come across after a second had passed and then the channel would be closed. Um, time.sleep just blocks for the specified amount of time. In fact, I think we've kind of seen it around um, so far in the course. And then we have read only and write only channels. And these are pretty cool from like a type safety standpoint. Uh, basically we can take a channel and we can pass it into a function, but specify that within the function, we are just going to read from it. So then within the function, uh, the compiler will not allow us to write to it. So this is a great way to kind of keep uh, go routine safe in terms of which functions are readers of channels and which functions are writers of channels. Um, and we can do the same thing with writers uh, by using this syntax here. So readers read out of the channel, writers write into the channel. The assignment says, like all good backend engineers, we frequently save backup snapshots of the Malio database. Complete the save backups function. Okay, it should read values from the snapshot ticker and save after channels simultaneously. Okay, so the ticker and the save after, these are channels that are created down here using those standard library functions that we just talked about. Okay, so we need to use a select statement, it looks like, should read values continuously. So I'm gonna use a for loop and a select statement. If a value is received from snapshot ticker, call take snapshot. Okay, so a case, a val, okay. We want to read out of a snapshot ticker. Um, do we actually, do we care about the channel being closed? Let's see, I assume saved after. No, actually we don't. So we just need the value from snapshot ticker. Oh, and we don't even care about what the value is. So we can just completely ignore the value. Um, call take snapshot. Okay. If the value is saved after, so case save after, call save snapshot and return from the function because we're done. Okay. So again, we don't need to return anything from this function doesn't have any return values. If neither channel has a value ready, call wait for data. Okay, so default, wait for data. And then sleep for 500 milliseconds. So time.sleep, time.millisecond times 500. Okay. This is looking good. So we've got this infinite for loop. We'll, we're looking for values um, that are coming across these channels. Anytime a snapshot should be taken, we take it. Anytime um, this save after channel passes us a value, we will save the snapshot and exit the function. Otherwise, we'll wait for data, whatever that does, and sleep for 500 milliseconds. In fact, I'm curious, what does wait for data do? Okay, so all these do um, is kind of print different messages. So let's go ahead and run that. Okay, cool. So nothing to do waiting, nothing to do waiting, right? So every 500 milliseconds, we're kind of logging out that we're waiting, we're waiting for things to, to do, um, taking back backups, taking backups, and um, finally saving the backups at the end. Cool, let's submit this. This looks correct to me. Dave Cheney is a fantastic author and contributor to the Go programming language and the Go ecosystem. Um, and he has this awesome article that I would definitely recommend checking out. It's called Channel Axioms. Um, I've kind of summarized it here and we're going to talk about a few key points. So the first is that ascend to a nil channel blocks forever. 
So the zero value for a channel is nil. If you don't use the make function to initialize a channel, then the channel's value is just nil. And if you try to send on a nil channel, your code's just going to block forever. Similarly, a receive from a nil channel will just block forever. Now, this one's a lot more dangerous. Trying to send on a closed channel panics. So you need to be really careful and make sure you're only closing channels from the go routine or the function that's writing to the channel so that you can be sure you'll never try to write to that closed channel again. And then a receive from a closed channel returns the zero value immediately. So if you're trying to pull data out of a channel and it's already closed, you'll just get the zero value. And we've already seen how you can also kind of optionally check for that okay value, uh, which will be returned as false. So what happens when you read from a nil channel, uh, the receiver will block forever. And what happens when you send to a closed channel, uh, you'll get a panic and you never really want to panic and go. That's almost always indicative of a bug. So channels are one tool that we have in Go to sort of synchronize state across different Go routines, right? We can send data from one Go routine to another safely. Mutexes are another built-in primitive. Well, rather, they're not built into the language, but they're built into the standard library. And they allow us to also sort of communicate or share data between two Go routines. Mutexes work by locking access to protected resources so that only one Go routine can access that resource at a time. So the sync.mutex type is exposed by the standard library. And basically the way it works is you create a new mutex and then you share it across many different Go routines. And then you wrap whatever code that, that is dangerous or whatever resource that is dangerous um, that you never want two Go routines at the same time kind of getting access to, you wrap them in a call to lock and unlock. So for example, in this function, we have this protected function and it calls mutex.lock at the top of the function, and then it defers an unlock. And what this means is when one Go routine calls this protected function, um, if it's the first call to this protected function, then this mux.lock will lock the mutex for this Go routine, and it will be able to move on and kind of complete the rest of the function and then call uh, mutex.unlock. Every other Go routine that calls this function, right, on this shared mutex, will actually block at the mux.lock function call because the mutex is locked by another Go routine. So mutex stands for mutual exclusion because it excludes every Go routine except one, except for the one that holds the lock. And once that first one actually unlocks the mutex, then one other Go routine is able to pick up the lock um, execute its protected code and, and move on from there. So it's a way to take some dangerous resource and sort of share it across many different Go routines uh, safely. There are a couple of different reasons why you would want to protect a resource and only allow a single Go routine to kind of work on that resource at a time. But one super common one is maps. So maps are not thread safe in Go. If two different Go routines are trying to read from and write to the same map, uh, Go will actually panic uh, because that has a very high likelihood of causing a race condition. And if you're wondering what a race condition is, a race condition is kind of what it sounds like. It's when two different Go routines are effectively racing uh, to get access to a specific resource. So imagine a case where we have a count variable and it's set equal to maybe five. And you have one Go routine that reads that count variable and saves it into, say, another variable, uh, my count, right? And then maybe doubles it and then saves the doubled value back into count. Well, what if we have another uh, thread of execution doing the same thing? If they both read count, let's say they both read five, double five, so now they both store 25, and they both go to write 25 back into the variable, all you did was double five once, where you were probably expecting to have two different threads doubling the variable. So you, you probably were expecting for it to go five to 25 and then double again, 25 squared, 625, I think. Um, the point is, depending on exactly how those operations are threaded into the CPU, you'll actually get different behavior. So race conditions are awful to debug and mutexes allow us to lock access to those protected variables. So we could wrap that count variable 
in a mutex to avoid it being accessed at the same time by different Go routines. So this should make a lot more sense once we write some code. The assignment says we send emails across many different Go routines at Mailio. To keep track of how many we've sent to a given email address, we use an in-memory map. Okay, so we've got this counts map stored within a safe counter struct. The map is of string to integer. And then we've got a pointer to a mutex uh, that we're sharing across all of these different Go routines. Um, our safe counter struct is unsafe. Update the increment and the value methods so that they utilize the safe counters mutex to ensure that the map is not accessed by multiple Go routines at the same time. Okay, so we've got the safe counter and it looks like it's going to be kind of copied across different Go routines. So we create one instance of the safe counter. Um, it's getting passed into this test function. And then we've got this Go routine. Um, it looks like we're spawning Go routines in a for loop and then uh, and, and then using that safe counter, right? So increment is being called many different times across many different uh, threads of execution. And that is not safe. Cool. Um, so let's see what happens if I run the code right now. Jill has three emails, John has four. And if I look down into the tests, like that is wildly inaccurate. Right, so it, it kind of looks like what's happening is is like the example I described where maybe you're multiplying numbers together at the same time, so you kind of end up with a smaller number because everyone's doing it at the same time and then saving the variable back. It kind of looks like that's what's happening. We're getting these tiny results because all of these different Go routines are incrementing uh, the number at the same time. Okay, so we need to lock this down sc.mux.mux.lock. So lock the, the mutex and then defer the unlock. It's important to understand that we could do this and it would be the same. Um, right, we lock, we do the dangerous thing and then we unlock. Um, but this is the preferred the preferred way, kind of the idiomatic go way to do it. Um, it just It's just a little safer, right? If we add multiple returns, the defer will never not execute. So um, that's how we're gonna do it. And then we also need to lock um, on the val function because reading um, and writing at the same time is also dangerous. Cool, let's run that. See if we get some bigger numbers in our counts. Notice it's taking a lot longer to run. And, and that's because we're locking and unlocking. So every thread has to kind of go one after the other. So it slows it down, um, but it's a lot safer. So we get these accurate counts. Let's go ahead and submit that. So as we discussed, a mutex is called a mutex because it's short for mutual exclusion. And the conventional name for a mutex is um, mutex, or sometimes it's abbreviated to mux. Personally, I use mux a lot. So to answer the question, what does it refer to? It's gonna be mutual exclusion. The next question is how many threads or go routines can lock a mutex at once or at the same time? Uh, the answer is one, right? If any more could lock it at the same time, it wouldn't be very useful. And the next question is, why would you use a mutex to safely access a data structure concurrently, to stop other packages from using my code, to protect data from network access, or to encapsulate private data members of a struct? It's going to be to safely access data concurrently. Time to talk about another type of mutex. So we've already covered pretty much all of the functionality you need to know about the sync.mutex type, but there's another type. There is a sync.rw mutex or sync.readwrite mutex. So the sync.readwrite mutex has a little more functionality. Um, it has the same lock and unlock methods and works exactly the same way as a normal mutex, but additionally, it has two more methods, rlock and runlock. So the reason you would use a read-write mutex is because it allows you to have multiple readers at the same time. For example, it's actually safe to read from a map on multiple Go routines at the same time, as long as you're not reading and writing at the same time or writing and writing at the same time. Writing is the dangerous operation. So the way this works is if the mutex is locked, like with the dot lock method, then no other Go routines can lock 
or R-lock the mutex. However, if the mutex is just R-locked, then other mutexes can still R-lock it. So you can get multiple readers, but you can't get readers and writers or writers and writers. It just allows many threads to concurrently read. So what this does is if you have a program with a shared resource where most of the threads are interested with reading the shared resource and you only have a few writers, you can make your code a lot faster by using a read-write mutex and allowing multiple readers at the same time. Your code will move faster and have fewer locks slowing down um, and synchronizing your application. So onto the assignment. It says, let's update our same code from the last assignment, but this time we can speed it up by allowing readers to be read from the map concurrently. Update the val method to only lock the mutex for reading. Notice that if you run the code with a write lock, it will block forever. Okay, cool. So if I run, try to run it right now, um, it's going to have issues because I believe it is R locked um, by the test suite out of the gate. So that's a problem. Um, we can fix it by changing those to R lock and R unlock. Perfect, looks good to me. I'm gonna go ahead and submit that. So a quick review on read write mutexes. How many writers can access an RW mutex at once or at the same time? Uh, the answer is one. And how many readers can access an RW mutex at once? It's gonna be infinite, there is no limit. The next question is, can readers and writers use RW mutexes at the same time? The answer is still no, right? No one can use the mutex if it's being written to. Generics are an amazing new feature in the Go programming language. At least they are new as of the time of this recording. We're on version 1.20 now and generics were just released in 1.18 and they were one of the most widely requested features by Go developers. So let's talk about what generics are and why they're so useful. Let's take a look at this code here. We have a function called split int slice. So it takes a slice of ints and it splits it into two smaller slices of integers. It effectively just splits the slice in half and returns two new slices. The really interesting thing about this function is that if you take a look at the function body, it doesn't actually care that this is a slice of ints. It could be a slice of strings or a slice of booleans. The logic in the function body would be the same, right? We calculate um, kind of the midpoint of the slice and return two new slices um, with all the values up to that midpoint. The annoying thing is that prior to generics in version 1.18, if we wanted to split a slice of strings, we would actually need to write an entirely separate function because in Go, we have static typing and we need to tell the compiler what type of slice it is that we are splitting. Now, it is true that prior to generics, you could write a function that takes a slice of the empty interface, which is essentially a slice of anything, and then returns to slices of the empty interface. The problem with that is that you'd need to cast the return values back into whatever they were, which is kind of a dangerous runtime check. So generics or type parameters are really just a way for us to write that function with the empty interface, but do it in a compiler safe way. Because if you think about it, the compiler can know that this function doesn't care about the types going in, but that anytime it's called, the types coming out will be the same as the types coming in. So how does it work? Well, we effectively have a new type of parameter that can be passed into a function. So after the function's name, we have these optional square brackets. And here we're defining a new type, we're calling it T, and we're saying it is of type any, or it can be anything. Now, because we are using T, the type parameter, as both the input and the output, we're telling the Go compiler, hey, whatever I pass into this function, that's what I'm expecting to get back out, right? If I pass in a slice of integers, I expect to get out two slices of integers. So now if we take a look at how the code is actually used, right? How the function is called, we can use the split any slice function, give it a slice of integers, and we'll get back two slices of integers. Everything is type safe. So in a nutshell, the reason to use generics is to dry up our code. Right. Dry is just an acronym for don't repeat yourself. It's a way of writing code uh, that can be reused uh, more easily. 
So instead of having to write two nearly identical functions just to deal with two separate types of slices, we can now write a type safe function once and reuse it throughout our application. So let's jump right in. The assignment says at Malio, we often store all of the emails of a given email campaign in memory as a slice. We store payments for a single user in the same way. So those are two very different things, right? Emails and payments. Complete the get last function. It should be a generic function that returns the last element from a slice, no matter the type stored in the slice. If the slice is empty, it should return the zero value of the type. Okay, cool, let's get started. Okay, so we can kind of use this syntax as a guide. So we're going to need um, to specify a type. It can be anything, uh, like the assignment said. And we're going to take as input a slice of that type and return one element of that type. Okay, now it says um, we need to return the last element from a slice. So uh, we need to slice the slice, essentially check its length, right? So we can say um, if the length of s is zero. So if there's nothing in the slice, we're going to have to just return uh, the empty type of t, which down here it says we can create uh, we can create a new empty variable like this. So we'll just do var zero val. And then we'll just return it. Okay, cool. So if the slice is empty, we'll return the, the zero value. Um, otherwise, we'll return s at the length of s minus one, right? Okay, so if there's nothing in the slice, we'll return the zero value. Otherwise, we'll return the element in the last index. And the reason we have to do this guard clause is because otherwise this would be an unsafe operation. We'd get an index out of bounds error uh, if we tried to do this operation on a slice of zero length. So let's go ahead and run it. And it looks like, okay, so the test case with a zero length slice returns an empty struct. That looks correct to me. Getting last email from a slice of length three. There's the last one, looks like it returned it correctly. And then here we have payments, right? So a completely different type. And the last one is jane at example.com. Yep, that looks correct to me, Margo, Margo. Cool, let's submit it. So why are there generics in the Go programming language? Well, there's kind of three main points that are important to understand. The first, as we already covered, is that generics reduce repetitive code. So whenever we have code that doesn't really care about the type, or maybe it only cares about a small superficial part of the type, then we can write more abstract and more reusable code if we have access to generics, right? Because it keeps the code compile time safe and type safe. Before in Go, if we wanted to reuse code, we had to do sort of dangerous runtime checking, right? Casting things to empty interfaces and back from empty interfaces. It's also important to understand that generics are going to be used much more frequently in libraries and packages. If you're, say, a backend developer and you're building applications um, and not libraries or packages that are intended to be used by other people, um, you probably don't need to use generics all that often, which is why the Go programming language was able to get away with not even supporting them for so long. Now, if you do work on libraries or packages, or maybe you're even a contributor to the Go standard library, then you probably are going to use generics quite a bit more. They'll make it a lot easier to write more abstract code that's useful uh, for more and more use cases. The last point that's important to understand is just why did it take so long to get generics into the language, right? They're super useful. Why didn't we add them, I don't know, five years ago or a decade ago when Go was kind of getting started? The answer is that one of the philosophies behind the Go programming language is just to kind of keep it simple. Go doesn't have all that many features because Go developers and Go maintainers don't buy into the idea that more features necessarily makes a better programming language. By having fewer features, it means there's less to learn to get up and running with the language. It also means that anytime you see a piece of Go code, you'll have an easier time understanding it and working with it. So even more so than other languages, the Go team is very hesitant to add new stuff. So generics were in the works for a long time, and it was only after many years of thinking about it and making sure that we really needed them uh, that they actually got their way into the language. So the question here is, what code would generics be most likely to help with? A binary tree, detecting whether or not a string contains a given substring, or calculating the area of a circle? Well, 
Detecting whether or not a string contains a substring will probably just use string types, and calculating the area of a circle just sounds like floats to me. Um, but a binary tree is a data structure that can store any type. It's kind of like, you know, a slice in that way. Um, so I'm going to go with binary tree on that one. The next question is, Go's approach to language design is to support as many useful features as possible, to resist adding new features until they're extremely important or proven extremely important, or to never add new features. The language doesn't change. Um, and the answer is to just resist adding new features unless they're proven to be very, very important. The next question is, generics will probably be used more heavily in blank. Main packages, which are executable applications, or library packages. And I definitely argue that they'll be more heavily used in library packages. Okay, so we've talked about how generics are super useful when the type that is being used in your function doesn't matter, right? When it can be anything. But constraints allow us to write generics that are actually just useful for a subset of types, right? So maybe this function doesn't care too much about the types that are being used, but it does care a little bit. So let's take a look at an example. This concat function is similar to the other generics that we've worked with. The big difference is that the type T, the type parameter, instead of being able to be anything, we're saying it has to be a stringer. Right? And we've specified the stringer interface here. It's just anything with a string method on it that returns a string. With the built-in any constraint, which is effectively the empty interface, we can't really do anything with the values inside the functions, right? Which is why it works for something where we're just, say, splitting a slice of that type. But in this function, the concat function, we're actually able to use the type a little bit. We're able to call the method that's implemented on it. And that's just because the only thing that we know about these values coming into the function is that they have that string method. So what does the concat function do? Well, it takes a slice of stringers, it loops over all of them, grabs the string representation, right, by calling that string method, the string representation of each value, and then kind of just mashes them all together, right? It concatenates them and returns the result. So let's take a look at the assignment. We have different kinds of line items that we can charge our customers credit cards for. Line items can be things like subscriptions one or one-time payments. Great. Complete the charge for line item function. First, it should check if the user has a balance with enough funds to be able to pay for the cost of a new item. Okay, so we're given a new item, which is of type T, given a slice of old items, and a balance, which is just a float. Um, if they don't have enough funds, then we'll return an insufficient funds error. But if they do have enough funds, then we'll add the line item to the user's history by appending new item to the slice of old, old items. Okay. This new slice is your first return value, right? So we're returning three values here. So we're returning kind of the new list of old items after a new item has been appended. Um, other, and we need to calculate the user's new balance by subtracting the cost of the new item from their balance. This is my second return value. Okay, cool. So we take in their balance. We're going to subtract the cost of the new item and then return the new balance. Um, and obviously if nothing went wrong, we'll return a nil error. Okay. So we have the type here as a line item. So line item is this interface, and it looks like we, we kind of have these two methods available to us um, within our function. We can get the cost of a line item, or we can get the name of a line item. So the first thing our function is supposed to do is check if the user has a balance with enough funds. So we need to do something like uh, new, new balance is equal to balance minus the new item dot get cost, right? So we're gonna check what the new balance would be after subtracting the cost of the item from the user's balance. Then we can say, if the new balance is less than zero, then we'll return this insufficient funds error, right? And zero values for everything else. So it'll be, uh, nil slice, 0.0, .0 float, and oh, errors.new, insufficient funds. We'll need the errors package. Okay, cool. Otherwise, that means this, uh, this balance is uh, zero or greater, right? Um, and it says, add the line item to the user's history by appending it to the slice of old items. So we could do old items equals append old items 
new item. Okay. This new slice is your first return value. Great. Otherwise, um, and then calculate the, new, the user's new balance by subtracting the cost of the new item from their balance. So we already did that. Um, this is your second return value. So I think we could just return um, old items, new balance, and nil. All right? Let's go ahead and run that. Okay. Charging customer for a yearly subscription. Current balance is 1,000. New balance is 750. Total number of line items is now one. So for a monthly subscription, new balance is less. Total number of line items is now three. Let's go take a look at those test cases just to make sure that this makes sense. Okay, so they had zero. Now they have one subscription. Here they had two subscriptions. Now they have three three subscriptions cool that looks or, or three line items that looks good to me i'm gonna go ahead and submit it when generics were released a new syntax for writing interfaces was also released um partly just because this new syntax is super useful if you're trying to use interfaces as constraints for your generic functions so let's take a look at an example um, a type list is pretty much as simple as it sounds. We're basically just creating a new interface in this case we're calling it ordered and then we're just listing all of the types that we are saying implement that interface. So there's no methods here, but the interesting thing about all of these types is that they all support these inequality operators like less than, less than or equal to, greater than. And so if we use ordered as a constraint, then we're free to use these comparison operators on that type. And the question that goes along with this is why might you create an interface using a type list? And the answers are, you know exactly which type satisfy your interface, or it's too much trouble to define the methods required by your interface. Um, that second one is a bad reason. Uh, it's it, You would really only do this if you know exactly which types satisfy your interface. Let's take a look at parametric constraints, which sounds like a kind of complex term, but it's actually really simple. It basically just means that we can use type parameters in interface definitions as well. So instead of just creating interfaces, which we then use in our type parameters for functions, we're actually using type parameters to define new interfaces. So for example, here we have a store that takes as a type parameter P, which is a product. Now a product is just an interface, right? Um, it's a product is anything that can return a price and a name. So a store, which is again, an interface is just anything that can sell a product. Now, the idea really is that simple. If you want to get an idea for kind of how this whole uh, snippet of code works, the example code, I'm not going to talk through every line that would take a little bit too long, but feel free to kind of browse through this and get a feel for how um, that interface works. We're going to jump straight into the assignment. So getting onto the assignment. The chief architect at Melio has decided she wants us to implement billing with generics. Specifically, she wants us to create a new biller interface. A biller is an interface that can be used to charge a customer and it can also report its name. Okay, so let's take a look at what a customer is. So a customer is this interface. It's just anything that has a get billing email method on it. So in this case, a user is a customer and an org is a customer. Okay. Um, and it can also report its name. Okay, that's simple enough. Um, there are two kinds of billers, user billers and org billers. Okay, so we've got user biller here and org biller here. Create the new biller interface, which have two methods. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Type biller interface. Two methods, charge and name. The good news is the architect already wrote the user biller and org biller types for us that fulfill this new biller interface, right? We took a look at that. Use the definitions of the types and their methods to figure out how to write the biller interface on line seven. Okay, cool. So let's start with name. It looks simpler. So a user biller um, has a name method. It takes no parameters and returns a string. Uh, same with the org biller. So that one's simple. It just returns a string. Okay, the charge method for a user biller accepts a user returns a bill, but for the org biller accepts an org and returns a bill. Okay, so it always returns a bill, that part's easy, but what it accepts is a little bit different, right? And if we take a look at 
the customer interface, where did it go? Customer interface here. Then we see that we have, um, we have this common interface that we can use to represent both a user and an org. Okay, so that's convenient because we can use that interface, right, as a parametric uh, constraint. So let's create a new uh, parametric type or, you know, a, a, we'll create a new type parameter. Call it C because it's a customer. Should be easy enough. And then charge will actually take as input C, right? It will take a customer rather than specifically a user or an org. Okay, let's try that. It compiled at least, let's see what we got. Using basic user biller to create a bill for joe at example.com, $50. Basic user biller for Samuel Boggs, $50. Pro user biller, Jade, one hundred dollars. Okay, that's looking correct to me. It looks like the pro, uh, pro and basic uh, have a discrepancy of fifty and one hundred dollars, and then the org biller is being used here. And you can see it's actually much more expensive. So that looks correct to me. So let's talk about naming generic types. Uh, we can take a look at this old example or the example from earlier in the course where we had this split any slice, right? And it has. T as a type parameter um, of type any, and then we use T um, kind of all throughout the function signature. Um, T is just a variable name. It doesn't, we don't have to use T there. We could name, we could name this whatever we want, right? We could name it my type, uh, just wh whatever the heck we want, right? V uh, slice value, it doesn't matter. Um, however, it turns out that capital T is actually fairly common convention um, when there is just a single type parameter for a function. So the question here is the name of a type parameter blank can and should be whatever you want, can be anything, but T is a common convention or must be T. Uh, it turns out it can be anything, but T is a fairly common conventional name. Rob Pike, one of the creators of the Go programming language, created an awesome set of proverbs that outlines some more of the philosophies behind the language. I'm not going to read them all to you, but I am going to cover some of the ones that I think are the most important. And if you are interested, I'd highly recommend going and watching his talk about the Proverbs uh, if, if you want to go more in depth on them. So let's start at the top. Don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating. So this basically is telling us we should probably try to use channels more often than we use mutexes when we're trying to share memory between Go routines. Which leads right into the third one, which is channels orchestrate and mutexes serialize. So when we use channels, we get kind of this elegant flow of data through our program, right? One Go routine did something, another Go routine can react to it. Mutexes are all about just locking access to protected resources. If we can use channels to express logic in our program, it will tend to work a little bit better. Another great one is that the empty interface says nothing, right? Every type in Go fulfills the empty interface. You should really avoid using the empty interface just because it doesn't tell you anything interesting about your types. The empty interface is sometimes used by new Go developers to kind of get around the type system. And that just leads to unsafe code. Go format style is no one's favorite, and yet Go format style is everyone's favorite. So we'll get into this in just a bit when we jump into the project, but the Go toolchain comes with its own formatter and pretty much every production piece of Go code out there uses the same formatter, which is fantastic because it means all Go code looks the same. While not everyone necessarily agrees on the formatter's choice of say tabs versus spaces, it's still everyone's favorite because it means we all get something consistent that works reasonably well. The next one is one of my favorites. It's a little copying is better than a little dependency. Now, if you've ever worked in the JavaScript ecosystem with node modules, you'll know exactly what this means. Node modules is typically a huge folder. And a lot of times when you're working on a front end framework, your dependencies are much greater than your actual application code. And in Go, we typically just kind of inverse that way of thinking. We want our application code to be the bulk of the code within our project. And we tend to use far fewer dependencies as almost a philosophy. 
And this brings us to the one uh, mentioned here in the question, which says, which is better, clear or clever? And at least according to Rog Pike, clear is better than clever. So if you can write your code in a way that is very clear to anyone else reading it or even just to yourself, that's better than trying to do a trick that might seem clever but is actually hard for humans to understand. Remember, code is written for humans, not for machines. The next question is, which is better, copying a little code or including a small dependency? And Rob Pike would argue that it's typically better to copy a little bit of code rather than include a very small dependency in your project. The next one I wanna point out is that errors are just values, right? In Go, error is just a specific interface and we return it from functions just like we do any other value. There's not some special way to handle errors with tries and catches. Errors are just values and we deal with them just like we would any other value. And the last one I want to point out is that documentation is for users. And this is actually an interesting one. I think what he's saying here, and I, I need to go re-watch the talk to confirm, but that documentation is primarily for people who aren't maintaining the code. In other words, it's best if the code itself is really easy to understand so that it doesn't need to be heavily documented so that other maintainers can work on it, right? Um, documentation, in the sense that, you know, we should be writing external documents that explain how the code work or, or how to use it, should be for the users of our code, right? In, in the sense that if we're writing a library, we should be writing documentation for the users of the library, um, the developers calling our exported functions, right? Not the maintainers of the library itself. So documentation should primarily be written for the users of your code. It's time to build a fully fledged backend server in Go from scratch on our local machines. The purpose of the server will be to aggregate data from RSS feeds. If you're not familiar with RSS, it's a protocol that makes distributing things like podcasts and blog posts really easy. So what our server will allow users to do is add different RSS feeds to its database, and then it will go automatically collect all of the posts from those feeds and download them and save them in the database so that we can then view them later. Before we get started, there are four things you're going to need. The first is a basic understanding of SQL, the language that's most often used to query relational databases. If you're not familiar with SQL yet, that's okay. I've got a full course on SQL. I'll link that down in the description below. Go watch that, then come back here if you're not familiar with SQL. Number two is you're going to need a text editor and a command line. I'm using VS Code and ZSH uh, here in the video, so you'll see me using that. Uh, feel free to go download those if uh, you want to try them out, but you can use whatever text editor you want as long as it can edit your files and you have access to a terminal to run commands. Number three is the Go programming language itself. If you don't have that, you can go download it. I will link uh, the download page down in the description below. And I'd also recommend just installing the Go plugin. Um, if you're in VS Code, there is an official Go plugin. Go download that. It'll make your life easier with syntax highlighting and formatting and that sort of thing. Number four, the last thing you'll need is an HTTP client. So an HTTP client will allow you to make get and post and put requests into the web server that we're building. We'll need that for testing. I use the Thunder client. It's a VS Code extension, but you can use anything you like, even curl on the command line or Postman, Insomnia. There's tons of choices, Google HTTP clients, um, or if you don't already have a preference, again, if you're in VS Code, I'd recommend the Thunder client extension. Now that you have all of those tools installed and hopefully working, let's jump into the project. The first thing we're going to need is just a main.go file. We'll create our entry point. Um, it will be a part of the main package and it will need a main function. So func main takes no arguments, return those, returns no parameters. And for now, let's just print hello world, make sure we can kind of build and run this program. Um, we're going to need to initialize a new module for our project. So I'm going to do go mod init. And I like to name my modules after their remote path, right? Where they will exist um, kind of out on the internet. So uh, in my case, I use github.com slash my GitHub uh, namespace, which is Wags Lane, slash the name of this repository, which again is where I'll be keeping this code on GitHub. So I highly recommend you keep track of this code in GitHub. This entire project should be checked into Git and uploaded to GitHub or GitLab or, or, or whatever you prefer. Um, so I'm going to name this repository 
um, RSS aggregator, RSS ag. So we'll go ahead and create that. That will create this new Go module. And now that that's ready, we should be able to just go build and execute the new um, binary or the new executable that will be created from Go build. In fact, I'll just run it once so you can see. I created this new binary file here in my current directory. And so from now on, I'll be running this command, go build and dot slash RSS ag. So that will build and run. And we got hello world back, so we're good to go. Like I said before, we're going to be building this project with Git and storing our code in source control as we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new Git repository. And in VS Code, it highlights all the code that has changed but not yet been committed to source control here in green. Uh, but I don't want all of this in my source control. The .vs code file is configurations for my editor. Um, that's a personal thing that doesn't need to be in the project itself. Um, same with the RSS ag binary. We don't want to commit the binary that we're building or the executable file that we're building. We just want to commit our source code. So I'm going to create a new .gitignore file. And we're going to ignore the .vs code folder and the RSS ag binary. And next, um, we're going to add all of the secrets, the like configuration secrets uh, for our project in a .env file and read them out of the file itself. So uh, for example, one of the configuration variables that we're going to set is the port that the server will run on. So um, I'm gonna set that port to 8,000. And I'm going to also ignore that .env file in the gitignore. Again, because configuration data is something kind of local to my machine, in production, this port might be something different. So we don't need to commit this file to source control, um, but I do want it here in my repo. Now, at this point, I do want to pause and say, if you have no idea what a port is, or you have no idea what HTTP requests are or REST APIs are, um, we're going to move fairly quickly in this project. So if you're not familiar with that stuff, again, I will link down in the description below my HTTP course. That would be a good one to go brush up on before working on this project. So now we need a way to read this port variable into our program so that we can use it. And the Go standard library has a built-in a uh, function called os.getEnv. So it's uh, an exported function called getEnv from the os package. And we can get the value of a variable by its key. So in this case, the key is port. And we'll get back a port string. And then for now, let's just, uh, let's just say if port string equals the empty string, then we'll say uh, log.fatal. So log.fatal will exit the program immediately with arrow code one and a message. And we'll say uh, port is not found in the environment. Otherwise, we'll say port and we'll print the port string. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and run that. is not found in the environment. Okay, so the problem here is that port, the environment variable, doesn't exist in my current shell session. If I wanted to add it, I could run in my in my command line export port equals 8000 and then run this again. And then we get port e equals 8000. The problem is I don't want to manually set this environment variable every time I work on my server. I want to pull it from this file. So we're going to use a package that allows us to grab environment variables from a .env file. Um, and it is this package here, github.com slash joho slash go.env. Um, that's also the URL of the library. You can paste that into your browser, uh, go check it out. Uh, but we're just gonna install it here locally. And that will add it here to our go.mod. And then I'm going to run go mod vendor to copy that code here into uh, my, my vendor folder. Um, we get a, kind of a local copy of that. And we'll run um, here, we're going to need to actually use it. So we do go.env.load. 
And by default, load loads the uh, .env file. I think we can also optionally pass in .env as the file path. And what's uh, what's my error here? Could not import. No required module provides. Go ahead. Let's, hmm. let's go mod tidy. That should clean up my imports. Okay, perfect. And do I need to do anything else? What are we getting here? Could not import. No required module. Oh, I should probably go mod vendor again. That should pull in the code. Okay, so you can see we've kind of imported and downloaded all of that code from the package. And now I'm not getting error, any errors in my console. Okay, so this will take the environment variables from my .env file and pull them into my current environment so that then I can use os.getenv to load the variable. So to test that, let's go ahead and change uh, the port to 8080 and rerun the server. Still says 8,000, so something went wrong. Maybe I'm misremembering how to use this uh, use this package. Let's try just go.env.load. Still port 80. What am I doing wrong? Does it not overwrite? You know what? It might not overwrite my current session. I'm going to kill my current cell session, shell session and create a new one. And then we'll do this again. So now I won't have that exported 8,000 that I had in my terminal. Um, run that again. Okay, cool. So now it's pulling it from the file because I don't already have it defined in my shell session. Now, I want to take just a second and point out there are text instructions for this entire project over on boot.dev, and I'll link that down in the description below. We're going to be using a lot of text, uh, you know, code snippets from those text instructions, and they'll be easier to kind of copy and paste and grab from boot.dev directly than trying to, you know, retype what you're seeing me type here on the screen. Now we're going to actually spin up our server and we're going to be using the Qi router to do it. It's a third party router, uh, very lightweight, built on top of kind of the same way that the standard library in Go does HTTP routers. And so let's go ahead and install those now. We'll do go get um, github.com slash go dash chai slash chai or Qi. I always struggle to pronounce that one. Um, we'll install that and we'll install the, the cores package from the same uh, the same namespace, the Qi namespace. Next, we'll create a new router. So I'll do router colon equals Qi dot new router. In fact, I should probably go mod vendor. Have it there and then I'll do another go mod tidy and go mod vendor to bring it in. Cool. So this creates a new router object. Next, we'll connect up this router to an HTTP.server. So at serve colon equals a pointer to an HTTP.server. And a server needs a handler, which will be the router itself. And we also need a or an address, which is just a colon plus that port string. So in this case, it'll be colon, you know, 8080. Cool, and then we can call http.listen and serve. Or sorry, not http.listen and serve. We want to call it on the server object. So serve.listen and serve. Cool. And before we call that, in fact, I think that returns an error. So let's capture that error. And say if error does not equal nil, log.fatal. Pass in the error as a message. Okay, listen and serve will block. So when we get to line 30, our, our, our code basically just stops right here and starts handling HTTP requests. If anything goes wrong in the process of handling those requests, then an error will be returned and we'll you know, log it and exit the program. But it kind of the happy path for our code is that you know, nothing should ever be returned from listen and serve because our server is just going to run forever. Before we run this, let's just add one more kind of logging statement. We'll do log dot print line. Actually, let's do print F and we'll say server starting on port percent V and we'll pass in that port string. Okay, cool. With that, let's go ahead and build and run again. So go build, see what we get. 
hello world server starting on port 8080. I should probably remove, I should probably remove that hello world at this point. Now that we have a running server, let's go ahead and test it. So I'm over here in the Thunder Client tab again, because I'm using the Thunder Client plugin and I'm gonna click new request. And we're gonna make a request to HTTP colon slash slash localhost, right? We want to make a request to our own machine on the port that we are running on, which I believe is 8080. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and start up our server. Okay, server starting on port 8080, so it, it should be good now. You'll see I don't have a new prompt because my, my server is still running. Um, if I send this get request, perfect, we get a 404. That's exactly what we'd expect because remember in our code, we haven't actually set up any handlers or anything. We just have a server running. So we're getting a 404 because we're trying to hit a path, in this case, the root path, uh, and it doesn't have anything, any logic there to handle that code. If we killed our server, and ran it again, we just get the connection refused. I've configured my Thunder client to actually store all of my tests or my HTTP requests as plain text here in the working directory, uh, but I don't want those going into my source control. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that to the git ignore. Thunder dash tests will ignore everything in there. Next, let's add a cores configuration to our router. So this is so that people can make requests to our server from a browser. And we're gonna be using some fairly permissive uh, configurations here. And we'll use router.use, and then we'll pass in this cores.handler configuration. This comes from that cores package that we installed earlier. And let me see, what am I doing here? We need one more parenthesis there. And then I'm gonna go ahead and vendor this as well. So go mod tidy, go mod vendor. Cool. So we should have all of that code here in our vendor folder as well. I'm not gonna go too in depth on exactly what cores are. You can definitely go look that up, but just to give you a high level overview, um, this configuration is essentially telling our server to send a bunch of uh, extra HTTP headers in our responses that will tell browsers, hey, we allow you to send uh, you know, requests to HTTP or HTTPS versions. We allow you to use these methods. We allow you to send any headers. Um, it's just a way to say, hey, we're gonna allow you to do basically whatever you want. There are ways you can tighten up this configuration for security purposes, but for now, we're just going to be running our project on our local machine. So we're going to just open it up, make it permissive to avoid any sort of uh, kind of weird testing issues if we try to connect to our server through a browser. This server we're building is going to be a JSON REST API, which means all of the request bodies coming in and response bodies going back will have a JSON format. So let's create a little helper function that will make it easier to send JSON responses. So I'm gonna create a new file, call it json.go. It's gonna be in the main package. And the function signature is going to look like this. So we've got a function, we're calling it respond with JSON. It takes as input a response writer, this is the same HTTP response writer that uh, HTTP handlers in Go use. It's exposed by the standard library. Um, it will take a code. So this is the status code we're going to respond with. And then it will take an interface, which is just something that we can marshal to um, a JSON structure. The first thing the function will do is marshal the payload into a JSON object or a JSON string. And the way we do that is with the standard library. So we data and error equals json.marshal and we pass in the payload. So this function will attempt to marshal uh, whatever it's given into a JSON string and it will return it as bytes. And the reason it returns it as bytes is so that we can write it in a binary format directly to the HTTP response, uh, which is pretty convenient. If that fails for whatever reason, then what we'll do is we'll write a header to the response and we'll use status code 500. We'll say something went wrong on our end, right? Internal service error or internal server error. Um, and then we'll just return from the function. And actually, if something goes wrong, we should probably log it um, as well on the server side so that we can see our own logs and see, hey, we tried to do something and it broke. Uh, so we'll do log dot print line failed to marshal JSON response. And let's print the response. Or let's print what we tried to marshal. That's probably more 
more interesting. We'll use print F so that we can interpolate that value there. Um, next, we're going to need to add a header to the response to say that we're responding with JSON data. So we'll do w.writeheader. And, or not write header, I'm sorry. Uh, w.headers. Is it header? Dot add. And we want to add to the content type key. So content type. And the key will be applic or the value will be application JSON. So this adds a response header to the HTTP request saying, hey, we're responding with a content type of application slash JSON, which is the standard kind of value for JSON responses. Um, and then we should be able to uh, write the status code. So we do w dot write header 200. So everything went well. And then we need to write the data itself. So w dot write and pass in the JSON data. This will write the response body. Now that we have a way to respond with some JSON data, let's create an HTTP handler that does that. So we'll do handlers or handler readiness. Again, this will be in the main package. And we're gonna create a new function called handler readiness. And this is a very specific function signature. This is the function signature that you have to use if you want to define an HTTP handler in the way that the Go standard library expects. So it always takes a response writer as the first parameter and a pointer to an HTTP request as the second parameter. And then in the body of this handler, we can just call our respond with JSON function. So we'll say respond with JSON. We'll pass in that HTTP response writer. We want to respond with a 200 status code and some, some response payload. In this case, all we care about is the 200 okay status code. So I'm actually just gonna respond with an empty struct, which should marshal to kind of an empty JSON object. And now that I'm writing this, I realized that we actually made a mistake or I made a mistake in the JSON, uh, respond with JSON code, we should pass in uh, we should use the passed in response code instead of hard coding the 200. So if everything goes right, we'll use the code given. Okay, now with that, we need to hook up our handler. Now, using the Chi router, what we do is we hook up a, an HTTP handler, which is this function, to a specific HTTP method and path. Okay, so the way we're gonna do that is I'm gonna create a new router, so v1 router, and we'll use that same chi.new router to do it. And I'm going to specify v1 router dot handle, handle func, excuse me. I want to handle the slash ready path and I want to handle it with this handler readiness function. Okay, so we're, we're connecting the handler readiness function to the slash ready path. And the reason I created this new v1 router is because I'm going to mount that so I can do router dot mount to the slash v1 path. Okay, so I'm nesting a v1 router under the slash v1 path, and I'm hooking up the readiness handler at the slash ready path. So the full path for this request will be slash v1 slash ready. And that's just so that if we make breaking changes in the future, we can kind of have two different handlers, one under version one and one under version two for our REST API. This is fairly standard practice. And actually, I'm going to name this path health, health Z. That's just a habit uh, that I'm bringing with me from Kubernetes land. That's pretty standard to have a slash health Z path um, that you can hit to see if your server is live and running. So that's the purpose of this handler. It should just respond if the server is alive and running and everything's good. Okay, so let's go ahead and run the server and make sure it's doing what we'd expect. So go build and dot slash rssag that starts up the server. And then we can open up Thunder Client. And now instead of making a request to the root, which we'd expect to get a 404 from, we'll do slash v1 slash health z and make that get request. And we get the 200. Now here's the weird thing. If I change this to a post request and I make that, I actually still get a 200, but that's not really our intention. The health Z endpoint should really only be accessible by get request. So I'm going to make an update here. Rather than using the v1router.handle func, I'm going to use v1router.get. And this will scope the handler to only fire on get requests. Okay, 
With that, let's go ahead and rebuild our server and check again. Post should fail, method not allowed, perfect, but the get request should still work. So we have a nice helper function for responding with arbitrary JSON. Now I want one for responding with arbitrary error messages. So let's do function respond with error. Um, it will look very similar, but instead of taking a payload, which is an interface, it will take a message string. And this function is basically just going to format that message into a consistent uh, JSON object every single time. Okay. Uh, first thing we're going to do is say, if the code is greater than 499, we're going to log a message. And that's because uh, error codes in the 400 range are client-side errors. So we don't really need to know about them. It just means someone's using our API in a weird way. Um, but we do need to know whenever we're, serving, we're responding with a 500 level error code, because that means we have a bug on our end and we should probably go fix it. So we'll do log.println responding with 500 level error and we'll just tack the message itself on there okay cool after we do that logging um we'll use the respond with json function uh but we'll be responding with a specific uh structure of json uh so let's go ahead and define that as a struct so type um error response is a struct and it has one field error so just a string and we'll add this JSON tag to just say this, the key that this should marcel to is error. So in Go, we typically take a struct and add these JSON reflect tags to it to specify how we want this JSON.marshal function, or on the other side, the JSON.unmarshal function, uh, to kind of convert this struct into a JSON object. So in this case, we're saying, I have an error field, it's a string, and I want the key for the field to be error. So this struct will marshal into a JSON object that looks kind of like, uh, like this. Error, you know, something went wrong. Right? It wouldn't have, a, actually wouldn't have that, but it would look like that, okay? And we'll see that in just a second. Okay, so now we get to respond with JSON. We pass in the response writer, a the same code that we were given, and then we'll just respond with an error response. And the error message will be the message that we were given. Okay, let's hook this up to another handler. So here we can do v1 router.get. We'll create an error endpoint. And oh, I need. I need an actual handler. So we'll create a new one called handler. Error. Handler error. And we'll respond with an error. Instead of passing in an empty struct, we'll say something went wrong. And we'll respond with a 400 status code. Client error, right? Okay, now we can hook up this error handler here. It will only work on get requests. That seems reasonable. And basically it's just going to call that respond with error function. So it'll be a good way to test that. Okay, let's go ahead and rebuild the server. Oh, what did we screw up? Routing pattern must begin with slash. Ah, let's go fix that. So you can see here we've got slash health Z slash V1. We need to start these with a slash. It's just the way the chai router or the chi router works. Cool. Um, let's go open up the Thunder client and send a request to the slash error handler. Cool. We get the 400 bad request status code. And this is that JSON body. Um, so every single time that we need to return an error from our server, now we can just use this function and it will always use this consistent error format, which is great because we can throw this in our documentation and just tell all of the users of our API, hey, this is what you should expect when something goes wrong. Now that we have a little bit of our boilerplate set up, I'm going to take the opportunity to commit all of this to Git uh, so that I don't lose it. Um, I will say that I generally recommend committing the vendor folder. 
So you can think of the vendor folder kind of like the node modules folder if you're familiar with JavaScript land. And in JavaScript, you would never commit it. It's way too big. Um, but in Go, we typically don't have all that many dependencies. So it's actually perfectly fine to commit the vendor folder in most scenarios. And I'd even recommend it. So I'm going to go ahead and add that and commit it. We'll say boilerplate or HTTP server complete. For this project, we're going to use Postgres as our SQL database. It's a production ready database. In fact, it's the one I used to build boot.dev. You're going to need to install Postgres on your local machine, make sure that the Postgres server is up and running and that you have a client installed that you can use to make kind of one-off SQL queries against it. I have detailed instructions on how to do all of that in the text instructions for this project over on boot.dev. So again, go check those out if you need to figure out how to install Postgres locally and get a Postgres client up and running on your machine. I use pgadmin, so that's what you'll see me using in this tutorial. So if you followed those instructions, then you should have a Postgres server running on your local machine and a Postgres client installed. Again, I use pgadmin, that's what you're seeing here on the screen. Okay, so, because Postgres is running locally, I have this localhost server here in PG admin that I've connected to. Again, that's the Postgres server running on my own machine. And under databases, I have kind of the built-in Postgres database, but I want to create a new database that we're going to use for this project. So um, in this case, I'm just going to name it uh, RSS ag, and we'll create that database. And then here within the RSS ag database, as long as the uh, kind of icons are gold, then you're connected and everything is working at least up to this point. Let's run a quick query against the database just to really make sure everything's working. So I'm right clicking here on the RSS ag database and I'm going to click query tool. And from this tool, I should be able to just write some raw SQL. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a select version. This should just return the current version of Postgres that I'm using. I'm on version 14.7. And as long as you're on something 14.7 uh, or newer, you should be good to go. Now it's important to keep in mind here that PG admin is just a client for interacting with an SQL database, right? We are able to write raw SQL code here and run it against our database server. If you think about it kind of in an analogous sense, PG admin is basically just the same thing as the Thunder client, where the Thunder client is a client for running one-off HTTP requests against our server. PG admin is a client for running one-off SQL requests or SQL queries against our database directly. Next, we're gonna install two command line tools that will allow us to work with SQL databases from our Go code much easier. Now, these aren't fully fledged ORMs, if you're familiar with that term. These are kind of lightweight libraries that allow us to work with SQL databases using the standard library and just sort of streamline the process for us. The first one is called SQLC. And again, you can find all of these commands in the text instructions over on boot dev. So be sure to be following along over there. But we're gonna use the go install command to go grab uh, SQLC and install it into our command line. Once that's done, you should be able to just run SQLC version to make sure it's working. Next, we'll install Goose the same way. So go install um, and then the installation path for Goose again, uh, that link is over in the text instructions. And then you can make sure that Goose is installed and working correctly by typing Goose dash version. The great thing about SQLC and Goose is that they work based on raw SQL. There's no kind of fancy query language that's unique to those tools. We can just write SQL queries. And we're gonna store all of that in our repository. So I'm gonna create a new folder, just called SQL. And in there, I'll create a new directory called schema. And this is where we'll store all of our table definitions, um, or more specifically, our migrations. So uh, we'll start with a users table. And the way Goose works is it runs the migrations in order. So we're going to start with a 001 migration, and we'll call it users.sql. From a very high level, the way that database migrations work is they have an up and a down statement. So for example, here we're creating a users table. The up statement will just create a new users table and the down statement will delete that same table. So any down statement should just undo the operation of the up statement. 
And that just makes it easy to roll back changes to our database schema if we ever need to. The Goose command line tool works based off of SQL comments. So we'll start with a comment, dash dash plus Goose up and dash dash plus Goose down. And then anything we type here uh, will be considered an up migration and anything here will be a down migration. So let's start with the up migration. It's gonna be create, ooh, create table users. And the first field will just be called ID. It'll be a UUID, a universally unique identifier. Um, I prefer UUIDs to integer primary keys for a number of reasons. Um, I'll link a blog post down in the description below. Um, and that's just gonna be a primary key. Uh, next, we're going to need a created at, which is a timestamp, not null. But we must have must have a created at, must have an updated at, same thing. And then a user will also have a name, and we'll just make that a text field. Again, let's say that's not null. I need to remember to terminate my SQL statements with a semicolon. And for the down migration, um, it's pretty simple. We'll just drop the table. So drop table users. All right, let's run our migration. But first, we're going to need to be able to connect to our local database from our program and from our command line. So uh, very first thing is we'll need a DB URL and we'll set it equal to the URL that we use to connect to our local Postgres server. So this isn't to connect to PG admin. This is the same connection string that PG admin uses to connect to the database server. We want to go directly to the database. So it's going to look something like this. Postgres is the protocol. So colon slash slash. Um, again, this is just a URL. Um, and then we have the authentication part, uh, which in my case is WAGS lane because that's the uh, user on my machine. Um, and then colon and then password. If you have a password for your local database, this is where it goes. I actually did not set one up because it's just my local database. And it's going to be at localhost colon 5432, which is the standard port for Postgres. And the last part of the URL is just going to be the database name uh, that you created. So in my case, I believe it was RSS ag. Okay, so your URL will, should look very similar to this with maybe, you know, the username, the database name, um, something like that could be, could potentially be swapped out on your machine. Okay, to run our migration here, I'm going to copy, I'm going to copy this database URL, and then I'm going to CD into this directory. So CD SQL schema, and then from here, I can run goose postgres. So I'm telling, I'm telling Goose that, hey, I'm using a Postgres database, and then I'll paste in my connection string and type up. So this will run the up migration. A nasty error here. Turns out I forgot some commas. We need to separate all of these field names with commas. Cool. Save that file. Let's try again. So we got OK. 001 users.sql, no more migrations. So that should have run. Let's check PG admin to make sure that it works. So now over in PG admin under my RSS ag database, I should be able to come into the schemas tab, the tables tag, and I can see here that I've now have two tables, goose db version. So this is an automatic table created and managed by goose. And then I've got the users table that I just created. Let's go ahead and do a select star from users and we should just be able to see uh, those column names come back now let's make sure that the down migration works as well go ahead and run the exact same thing but this time down instead and you can see that it down migrated the same file now over in pg admin if i right click on tables and click refresh you'll see the users tables gone and this query should fail now Okay, so let's re-up migrate to get that database table created again. And then the interesting thing about migrations is you can rerun the same up migration and you won't get any errors because Goose knows that you're already migrated up to the most recent version of your migrations. Now it's time to write a query. So we're using SQLC to handle our queries and Goose to handle our migrations. So to get SQLC set up, we need to create a new file in the root of our project called sqlc.yaml. 
I'm going to paste in this configuration here. Basically, it's just telling SQLC what version we're using, um, what database engine we're using, and where we're going to store our queries. The raw SQL for our queries are going to live in the SQL directory under a new subdirectory called queries. We've specified that here, right? And here I'm going to create a new file. I'm just going to call it users.sql. And again, this is where the SQL will live. And the way SQLC works is that it takes the SQL statements and it generates Go code, type safe Go code that matches the SQL. Every SQLC query starts off with a comment that starts with its name. So name, we'll do a create user statement and it returns one record. So we're saying, I want a new function called create user, oops and it's going to return one user. That statement will be insert into users, uh, ID created, created at, updated at, and name, values, dollar sign one, dollar sign two, dollar sign three, dollar sign four. Okay, so what's this nonsense, right? In SQLC, each dollar sign number is interpolated with the parameters for the function. So this statement will create a new function called create user with four parameters. And the first parameter will, will go in right here, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, etc. So it allows us to create queries that take arguments as input. And then we'll end the query with just return, returning, returning star. Okay. We want to create a new user and return that record, right? We, we expect one record back. Now let's use SQLC to actually generate the Go code for this query. We always run SQLC from the root of our package rather than within the queries directory itself. Um, and, and the reason that works is because we have this SQLC.yaml file at the top level. Okay, so if everything was written correctly, we should be able to do SQLC generate. And what happens is it goes and reads that query, and it also reads our table definitions, which we've specified here, right? SQL slash schema. So it knows the shape of our tables, and it knows the query we want to create, and it can go automatically generate all of this Go code in the internal slash database package. Now we need to actually use the database in our Go code. So here in main.go, I'm going to create a new struct called API config, and it's going to hold a connection to a database. Now this database.queries type is actually exposed by that code that we generated using SQLC. So you can poke around through this package and kind of get familiar with the generated code. We never manually update this code that's generated by SQLC. It's completely managed by SQLC. We're just going to write raw SQL to generate this code. Okay, uh, next thing we need to do is import our database connection. So here in .env, we have our DB URL, and we need to grab that um, and pull it into our application. Uh, we're also going to need to disable SSL mode. So SSL mode equals disable. Um, and it just, this just tells our code, hey, we don't need to be connecting to our local database um, using encryption. Uh, we kind of trust our local database. So we'll parse that as a string. So I'll do db URL. And if the database URL is not found, then we'll, we'll report a message uh, or we'll log an error message and exit. After that, we need to actually connect to the database. So the Go standard library has a built-in SQL package. We do sql.open. The driver name that we'll be using is just Postgres. And then we can pass in the connection string. And this will return a new connection and an error. And again, if there's an error, we'll just go ahead and log a message and exit. Can't connect to database. Now, this is kind of a weird, quirky thing about how Go handles databases, but we actually need to import a database driver into our program 
um, but we don't actually need to call anything from it. So the SQLC docs mention this, but basically we just need to include this line at the top of our program and we do need to import it. So I'll do a go get um, on that lib slash PQ and we'll import it using that underscore just to say include this code in my program um, even though I'm not calling it directly. Okay, with that there, uh, now we should be able to create a new API config. And let's just call it API CFG. And it takes as one of its fields, a DB. Where am I at? I think I scrolled too far. DB, oh, and I should probably go mod tidy and go mod vendor so that I stop getting weird errors in my, in my VS code. Okay, uh, this API CFG takes a database.queries, but if you look here, we don't have a database.queries, we have an SQL.db. So we actually need to convert it into a connection to our package. And we can do that with database.new, and we pass it as input the connection, and we'll get back queries error. Here we can say if error does not equal nil, and pass in the queries to the struct. Nope, did I do that wrong? Maybe this doesn't return an error. Mismatch, two variables, but database.new returns one. Okay, cool. So this actually can't fail. It's just a, it's just a simple conversion. We could actually even just do this. It's probably easier. Great. Now we have an API config that we can pass into our handlers so that they have access to our database. Let's write that create user handler. Okay, so I'm just gonna copy paste this handler readiness and change it to handler user. And we'll update this to say handler. This will be the create user handler. Now, here's the interesting thing about HTTP handlers in Go. The function signature can't change, but we do want to pass into this function an additional piece of data. We want to add this API config. So the way we do it is by making this function a method. So we do API CFG is a pointer to an API config. So our function signature remains the same, right? It still just accepts these two parameters. Um, but now we have some additional data stored on the struct itself uh, that we can gain access to. And let's hook up this create user handler in main. So we'll add it to the v1 handler. We'll do v1 router dot post. We want this to be a post request to slash users. And we want to use the create handler create user method, which we defined on this struct. So we can pass in API CFG dot handler create user. And now our handler will have access to um, to the database. Okay, cool. This handler needs to take as input a JSON body. It should expect some parameters. So we'll do type parameters is a struct. And I think for now we just need a name. And we need to parse the request body into this struct. So we'll do json.new decoder and r.body. Okay, and this respond or this returns a decoder. And we can do decoder.decode. And we want to decode into an instance of the parameters struct. So we'll do params is an empty parameters struct and we'll decode into a pointer to parameters. And this returns an error if anything goes wrong. If there is an error, then we should use that handler function that we made earlier, respond with error, and say something like, well, we need to pass in W. Um, if something goes wrong here, it's probably a client side error, right? So I'm just gonna pass in a 400. And we'll say, um, Let's see, error parsing JSON. Cool. 
and then we'll return because we're done at that point if there is an issue. Okay, uh, otherwise we have access to a name. So we can use our database to create a user. So we do API cfg.db dot create user. Now this is the method that SQL C generated for us, right? Because it, it read our create user SQL and it created a create user function for us, right? And it created the parameters as a struct. So that's pretty convenient. Uh, let's see how this works. So create user accepts a context and some create user params. So I'm going to use, uh, I think it's ctx, no, r.context. There we go. So that's the context for this request. And then we pass in database.createUserparams. This is a struct and it should have, yep, all of our uh, types that we need to pass into the create user function. Okay, so uh, first things first, an ID. The ID is a UUID. Um, and this is the first point at which I think we've needed to use them. So we're going to have to import this package. So github.com slash Google slash UUID. This is a very uh, well-known UUID package in Go. We will go get it. With that installed, we should be able to do UUID.new. And that will just create a new random UUID. And if you weren't familiar, this is what a UUID looks like in string form. It's basically just this really long random uh, bit of, I mean, in this case, represented as text that we can use as a primary identifier for every user. So every user will get their own random ID. Cool. Um, I should probably go mod tidy, go mod vendor. It's just good practice every time you install a new package to make sure you vendor it and go mod tidy kinds of cleans up any unused imports um, and resolves some issues there. Okay, uh, created at, I'm going to set to just time.now.utc. It's created now. And then updated at should represent the last time it was updated, uh, which would also be now, right? Because we're creating something new. And the user's name will just be params.name, right? It's whatever was passed in to this HTTP request in the body. Oh, and I just am now realizing that I messed up this JSON tag. Should look like this. Okay, cool. Um, so create user should probably return an error. Yep, returns a new user and an error. Again, if there was an error creating the user, we'll want to respond with an error. And we'll say, couldn't create user. Uh, 400 seems fine. And then we'll actually respond with the user object itself. Okay, database.user and see how that goes. Well, let's, let's actually take a look and see what does a database.user even look like? I'm curious. Yeah, so all these, I mean, all these fields are exported, so they should marshal to JSON just fine. Let's go ahead and run this and see and see what we get. Before we run the code, though, it looks like I've got a couple little things to resolve here. So error is already defined there. And then here, oh, I'm messing something up. We need to pass that in. We need to interpolate that. Cool. Oh, and here as well. Do percent %v because those are errors. Okay, cool. Um, now let's go ahead and run, build and run the code. So go build and run RSS hack. Okay, st server has started. So let's go ahead and open up the Thunder client. And now we'll be sending a post request to the user's endpoint. And we'll be sending in a JSON body. Oh, me grow this just a little bit. And we need to specify a name. So I'm going to create a new user called lane. And let's see what happens. Couldn't create user. Database wags lane does not exist. It looks to me like I probably messed up my connection string. Let's go take a look at that. So here in env. Yeah, okay, we forgot to or I forgot to add um, the name of the database here at the end. So uh, we, we need to do slash name of database. 
All right, let's try that again. Let's rebuild the server and resend that request. Cool, we got a 200 response. It looks like that is a new random ID. Great, created at, updated at, and the name. Next, just to make sure that the record actually was created in the database server itself, I'm gonna pop back over here to PG admin, um, refresh my tables, there's our users table, and rerun this select star from users. Perfect, looks like we've got one record in here with all of the data that I would expect. Now, I want to make one more optimization to our code here. You can see in this JSON response that the, fee the key names in the JSON object are the same as the exported key names here in the user struct in the database package. Now, we can't change this struct manually. Um, again, this is generated by SQLC. So what I think we should do is instead create a new models folder, models.go in the main package. And here we'll create our own user type. So type user struct, and it will be nearly identical. So let me go grab this one, be nearly identical. The only difference at this point is that I'm going to add JSON tags so that I can specify, you know, what these names should be. And we've been using kind of this snake case convention, so I'm just gonna stick with that. So updated at and name. And I'm gonna create a function, uh, we'll say database user to user. And it will take a DB user and return a user. And all this does is return a new user struct where uh, we kind of populate it with all of the all of the stuff from the database user. So again, the purpose of this is really just I want to own the shape um, that's being returned over the wire, right, on our HTTP responses. Um, and now I have the power to configure that easily within within my application. So we'll go ahead and just uh, paste these in here. Okay, and then in my user handler, rather than responding with the database user, I'm gonna respond with our user. Cool. Let's rerun and build that. And let's run our query again. Now remember, we already have a user in our database. So I'm going to create a second one. Uh, let's call this one Rob. And this time you can see we have those snake case keys. And again, I'm gonna go check in PG admin to make sure that Rob is there. Perfect, now we've got Lane and Rob. And you can see they have different randomly generated IDs and their timestamps are slightly different. We're going to be using API keys to authenticate our users on this server. The nice thing about an API key is not only is it a little more secure than a username and a password, but because it's so long, it also serves as a unique ID for that user. So we don't even need a combo of username password. We can just use the API key in order to kind of uniquely identify people. So we need to run a migration that adds a new field to the user's table so that we can store their API keys. Now, we've already created this migration that creates the users table, and we don't want to modify this because it's generally a really bad idea to go modifying your existing migrations. Instead, we create a new one. So I'm gonna create a new one, and we'll call it 002 because we want it to run after uh, the first migration. And again, Goose uses these numbers to know in which order it should run uh, the migrations. And we'll call it users API key. And the migration statements are going to look a little bit different. Okay, so the up statement is going to be an alter table. So alter table users. We'll add a column. And we'll call the column just API underscore key. It's going to be a varchar. So varchar. 64. Now the difference between varchar and text, um, at least for our purposes here, is that the varchar is exactly 64 characters long. So we're saying we want our API keys to be 64 characters long. And we want those API keys to be unique. No two users should have the same API key. Um, we also don't want them to be null. And we're going to set a default 
a default API key. And this is important because if we didn't set a default, we'd run into an issue when we run this migration. Remember, we already have two users in our database currently. So if we just try to add a column that has these unique not null constraints on it, then what's the SQL database going to do? How is it going to generate new API keys that are unique and not null? Typically, it would just default the new, um, you, know, you know, the field in the existing records to null, but because we've said they can't be null and they must be unique, we need to provide a unique default for every new record, or for, excuse me, for every existing record in the database. So the default value that we need to add, again, needs to be unique for every person. So we're actually going to have to use some random number generation so that we can generate a unique API key for every user. And this is the snippet of code that does that. Again, you can go grab this in the text instructions for this project over on boot dev. But let me explain basically what it's doing. We're generating some random bytes and then we're casting it into a byte array. And we're using the SHA-256 hash function to get kind of a, a fixed size output. So we're saying, take a, a, a big random slice of bytes, hash them with SHA-256 so that we get a fixed size output and then encode it in hexadecimal. And that's so that we get 64 unique hexadecimal characters. This will make more sense when we actually run the query and you see what the output looks like. And then as far as the down migration goes, we just need to alter able users and drop column API key. Again, down migrations should just undo whatever was done in the up migration. Let's go ahead and run this migration. So I'm gonna need to change directory into SQL uh, schema. And then we'll run goose postgres. And then let me go grab the connection string. Now we do need to peel off this SSL mode disable. Goose doesn't need that, um, just our code needs that. So I'm gonna grab the rest of the string and we'll run an up migration. Cool, so it looks like it ran successfully. Let's go see if those default values look good. Run the select star statement and there you can see the new API keys. So big old hexadecimal strings that uniquely identify every user and should be kept secret by the user because just the API key is enough to authenticate the user. Now that we've got our migration and we've updated our schema, we actually need to go update our query, right? We need to be creating new API keys for new users. So let's go update our create user function. It should now accept an API key as the last parameter and pass it in here. Actually, you know what? If we do it this way, we're basically telling our application code, hey, you need to go generate an API key in the same way that we generated it here in our SQL. I think it would actually be easier. What if we just take this and plop that in here? Right, so now we'll use, we'll use SQL to generate the new API keys. We don't even need to update the function signature of our create user function. Cool, so the SQL will just handle the creation of new API keys every time a new user is created. All right, now we should be able to run SQLC generate. Insert has more expressions than target columns. Let's see. Oh, right, sorry. We, st we do still need to pass in the API key as the column name. Um, the difference is because we are not using $5, $5, our function signature won't change. Uh, this got a little confusing. I was reading it like a function signature, even though it is, it is SQL. Okay, run that again. It went off without a hitch. You can see it updated a few files in our database package. Now we should be able to go use that in our code. But before we test our server, let's add one more thing. Let's give us a way to get a user. So we'll create a new function and this one we'll call get user by API key. And it should return a single row and it's going to be a select statement. So select star from users where API key equals dollar sign one. And we'll run SQLC generate again to generate the code for that query. You can see it created it here. 
So in our handler user function, we actually don't need to make any changes to our create user handler, right? We didn't change the number of parameters that we need to pass in for the API key. It's handled kind of under the hood by the SQL query. But we do need a new handler for getting users. So let's go ahead and add that. So I'm gonna copy paste that, do handler, get user by API key. Maybe we can just, let's just simplify this. Let's just call it handler get user. Now this handler is going to look very different. This is an authenticated endpoint. So in order to create a user on our API, basically to register a new account, you don't need to have an API key. But if you want to get your own user information, you have to give us an API key first. This isn't going to be the only authenticated endpoint or the endpoint that you can only do if you're logged in. Um, so I think it makes sense to kind of abstract the logic for getting a user by their API key into a package. So under the internal package here where we have our database code, I'm gonna create a new package and we'll just call it auth. And in there, I'll create a new file. We'll call it auth.go. And this whole package will just be called auth. Now, the only function that we care to export in this auth package is gonna be this one called get API key. And its purpose, get API key, we'll say it extracts an API key from the headers of an HTTP request. So it's gonna go into the headers, look for a specific header and see if it can find the API key. If it can, it'll return it, uh, otherwise it will return an error. Now, as the authors of this server, we get to decide what we want the authentication header to look like. So I'm just going to say, um, example, let's expect an authorization header. So the key of the header will be authorization and the value will be API key and then some, you know, like insert API key here. Okay, so we're looking for a header of this format. So first let's look and see if we can find a value associated with the authorization key. Um, we're just using the HTTP standard library here. So we can do headers dot get authorization. And this should return, let's see a string. Okay, so the value associated with this, with this header key. Now, if value is the empty string, then we can just say, uh, turn empty string and an error, say errors.new, no authentication info found. So otherwise we have a valid value. So we could do something like this. Uh, vals strings.split val. Okay. So Strings.split takes a string as input and a delimiter. So we're gonna say we want to split this string here, right? The, the value given to us uh, by the authorization header. Uh, we want to split it on spaces, okay? So next we can say if the length of vals does not equal two, then again, we can return an error saying like, you know, maybe malformed malformed auth header, right? Because we're expecting that the value of this key is two, like two specific values separated by a space. The first should be API key and the second should be the API key, right? The first should just be the string API key and the second should be the actual API key. Okay, so if the length is wrong, then uh, next we should probably check and make sure they typed this incorrectly. So we can say uh, if vals at zero does not equal API key, malformed auth header, we could say malformed first part of auth header. Okay, otherwise we can just return vals at one and no error. Right? Because by that point, we're sure that all, of the, all this part was correct and we're extracting just the API key. 
Okay, what did I screw up here? Errors.new. Oh, right. You're not supposed to capitalize errors in Go. That is a, a linting error. A stylistic error. Okay, cool. So now we've got the get API key function. We can go ahead and use this in our get user handler. So let's go ahead and grab that API key. So API key and error auth.getAPI key, and we pass in the HTTP headers. So r.header. Perfect. If there is an error, let's handle it. We can just respond with an error saying auth error and 400. We should probably do like a 403. And in fact, now that I'm thinking about HTTP codes, creating a user probably should be a 201 instead of a 200. Like, you probably won't run into any issues for using a 200, um, but 201 is the created code. So it's like a little more correct uh, if you're looking at it from kind of a restful HTTP standpoint. And then 403 um, is one of these kind of permissions errors. So that should be good. Okay, now that we have an API key, we can use our database query that we created, dot get user by API key. Again, we'll pass in the requests context and the API key. I haven't really touched on this yet. In Go, um, there is a context package in the standard library. And basically it gives you a way to track something that's happening across multiple Go routines. And the most important thing that you can do with a context is you can cancel it. So uh, by canceling the context, it would effectively kill the HTTP request. I don't want to go too much into detail on how all of that works here. Um, you could definitely go read up on it. Um, but for now, just make sure that it's important to kind of use the current context. So every HTTP dot request has a context on it and you should use that context um, in any calls you make within the handler that requires a context, just in case uh, kind of cancellations happen. Okay, cool. Uh, that returns a user and an error. Again, if there is an error, let's do a, let's use a better uh, string here. Maybe couldn't get user. And this one, let's just go with a 404 or a 400 for now. Cool. Um, and then we can respond with JSON. This time it will just be a 200 code. And again, we should cast that database user to the user uh, model that we defined here, right? With the, the nicely formatted JSON tags. And that should be good. Okay, let's hook up our get user handler to our router. So here we'll do v1 router dot get. So same path slash users, but we'll be hooking up the get user handler to the get HTTP method. So again, same path, different method. All right, let's test our new endpoint. Um, first, I'm gonna go ahead and rerun SQLC generate because I can't remember if I've done that. And then, We'll build and run the server. Okay, with that running, let's head over to Thunder Client. And first, let's create another new user. So JSON body, let me minimize this a little bit. Um, let's keep create a new user, we'll call him Rand. And it'll be a post request, that looks good. Okay, response came back. Rand was created, and this is Rand's ID. Ah, we screwed something up. We're not responding with the API key. Let's go update that. So here in our model, I believe it's because we're not casting. So we need API key string JSON API key. And then here need to do that conversion. So it's just getting dropped because we weren't we weren't setting the API key anywhere. Okay, uh, let's rebuild. And we'll create a new user. Let's call this one Joe. Okay, cool. 
So Joe was created and it actually returned the API key. Perfect. Now let's go ahead and I'm gonna create a new request. This one also to localhost 8080 slash v1 slash users, but this one will be a get and we're going to add some headers or specifically one header, right? We're going to add our authorization header and its value will be API key and then the actual API key, which I just pasted in there. Okay, let's go ahead and run that. And it's returning Joe. It's good to test failure cases too. So let's just see what happens if we update this header and let's just like, let's just make something broken. Let's just remove a section of the API key and see what happens. Cool, we get a 400 bad request, couldn't get user, SQL, no rows in the result set. So essentially users not found, perfect. So we've got our users set up and our authentication system. Now it's time to actually get to some business logic, right? This is an RSS feed aggregator. So we need a way to store feeds. Let's create a new schema or rather a new migration in our schema folder. This will be 003, we'll call it feed, feeds.sql. Now this is going to be a create table migration, right? We want to create a feeds table. So we'll do create table feeds. Now a feed and the drop will also drop the feeds table. A feed has an ID just like a user. Um, it also has a created at and an updated at, and it also has a name. Like all of that is actually very similar. Um, what's unique about a feed is it has a URL, uh, which is text as well, that is unique and not null. And it also has a user ID which references, sorry, it's a user ID is a UUID which references users ID. And we'll also add the on delete cascade. Essentially what this does is, is it says we have a user ID stored in our feeds table that references the ID of a user in the users table. Right, so this is this is relational data. This is a relational database. Um, essentially, what this means is, if we try to create a feed for a user ID that does not exist in the users table, we'll get an error, uh, which is what we want because we don't want feeds to be able to exist without a user who created them. And then this on delete cascade bit just says when a user is deleted, I want all of the feeds associated with that user to be deleted automatically. It will cascade and delete all of them. And let's run this migration. So I'm gonna hop into the SQL schema directory. And from here we can run goose, postgres, postgres, and grab my connection screen. Again, we don't need the SSL mode stuff for goose. Grab the rest of it and up. Cool. Now over here in PG admin, I can do a select star from feeds and make sure that that table exists with those fields. Next, we'll need a query to create a new feed. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this queries file, update it to feeds, and then we'll delete this one because we don't need it, and we'll create a create feed, and insert into feeds, ID created at, updated at, name, there will not be an API key, but let's see, we need a name, URL, and user ID. Okay, name, URL, user ID. We won't be generating an API key here. Instead, all of these values, I think, will just be passed in from our application code. So one, two, three, four, five, six. We need six parameters for this function. Five and six. And then we'll just return uh, the entire feed row after it's done being created. And then I'll just navigate back to the root of the project and run SQL, SQLC generate to create the code for that new query. Next, we're going to create a new handler that will allow users of our API to create a new feed. Here's the thing, that handler is also going to need all of this same logic that we have in the get user handler, right? We'll need to grab an authentication uh, token or an API key from the authorization header fetch the user, and then use that user in the handler. And rather than copying and pasting uh, this, what, 
10 lines of code into every handler that's authenticated. Instead, we're going to build some middleware to kind of dry up the code, right? Um, let's go ahead and do that. So I'll create a new file. I'm gonna call it middleware auth.go, part of the main package. And here we're going to define a new type and it's our own custom type. Uh, I'm calling it auth handler. And you'll notice it looks almost exactly like a regular HTTP handler. The only difference is that it includes a third parameter. It has a user associated with it. So if you think about this, um, it makes a lot of sense uh, for any authenticated handler to accept three parameters where the third one is the authenticated user. Now, the problem with this auth handler type that we created is that it doesn't match the function signature of an http.handler func, right? Uh, those functions with just the response writer and the request as the only two parameters. So what we're going to do is create a new function called middleware auth uh, that works. It's a method on our API config, so it has access to the database. Um, but it its job is to take an auth handler as input and return a handler func so that we can you know, use it with the Qi router. Okay, let's implement that. The way this function will actually work is that we're going to return a closure. So we're returning here a new anonymous function with that same function signature as your normal HTTP handler func. The difference is that as we define this function, we'll have access to everything within the API config. So we'll be able to query the database. So we can basically just go rip out the code from our get user handler and paste it in here, right? We're gonna go get the API key from the request, well, from the request headers at least. And then we can go ahead and grab uh, the user using that API key, right? So we'll have access to the user here in the function. Finally, all we need to do is run the handler that we were given with the response writer, the request, and the user, right? So by the time we get to actually calling the auth handler, we're able to give it an actual user from the database. And this is really great, let me show you why. So now that the middle, middleware auth function exists, we can remove all of this code from the get user handler. We can update the get user handler to accept as input a database user. User, database.user. Look at how clean this function becomes, right? Now it's just, now it's literally just one line. Cool, and now to hook it up, you'll notice we have an error over here. We just need to call our middleware auth function, API CFG dot middleware auth, we call this function to convert the get user handler into a standard http.handler func. I kind of move fast through that. Hopefully it all makes sense though. Basically we're just calling the middleware auth function first to get the authenticated user. And then we're calling that callback, the, the get user handler. The nice thing is now we'll be able to reuse that middleware across many different HTTP handler functions. So now let's create the create feed handler. I'm gonna go ahead and just copy this handler user, change it to handler feed. And for now, we just need a create function. So I'll delete this get, and we'll call it handler create feed. And remember, it's an authenticated endpoint, so we can have it accept the user directly. So user database.user. We know who's creating the feed by the time we get to this function, which is awesome. All right, in order to create create a feed, use our new create feed function, which takes create feed params. And create feed params have ID, created at, updated at, name, that's all the same. The difference is a URL and a user ID. So URL and a user ID, which is a UUID. Uh, which actually exists already on the user object. So we can just do user.id. Okay. Um, what do we want as input? We need a URL. So we also are going to want a params.url. So 
So we want the user that's creating a new feed to be able to just send us a name and a URL, and we'll go about creating the entire uh, kind of, you know, feed object in the database or feed row in the database. So this is what our parameters should look like. Uh, what error am I running into here? Cannot use API create feed. No new variables on left side of, hmm, that's odd. Create feed should return a feed. Let's take a look at that definition. Yeah, it does return a feed. What am I messing up here? Oh, first of all, that shouldn't be a user. That should be a feed. Okay, that's the problem. I was over. I was trying to overwrite the database.user type with a feed type. That won't work. Okay, so we're creating a feed. We're generating a new UID. That's great. We're using the current time. Perfect. Um, this is getting messed up. Uh, variable of type uuid.uuid as uuid.nulluuid. Ah, okay. I see the problem. The create feed params except a uuid.null uuid. That's a problem. We don't ever want a u uh, the null uuid type from the uuid package is a nullable uuid. But we don't want it to be nullable because we expect that every feed will be created by a user. So let's go update our our uh, I think it's our is it our migration? Let's go look. Schema feeds. Yeah. User id uuid not null. Cool. It doesn't need to be unique. A user can have multiple feeds, but it should never be null. All right. Um, with that, we're actually going to need to go uh, rerun our migration. So SQL um, schema. And we'll do a down to drop the table down and then back up to create the new table with the proper schema. And then we should rerun SQL C generate. Okay, did that work? Create feed, create feed params. Looks like that error is gone. It's now just a UUID type, perfect. Now at this point we have a valid database feed. We should probably update this error so that it actually says feed. Um, and we want to return it. Um, in our HTTP response. Trouble is, remember, we don't want to just directly return the struct. Let's go create a new model for a feed. So we'll do type feed. And then I'm gonna go just copy the types from here and we'll use those. And we'll make our own JSON tags for the type. user ID, URL, name, updated at, and created at. Okay. And then we'll want a, what is it? Database, database, feed to feed. And we'll return a feed. All of this should be pretty straightforward. And again, this just gives us more control, right? Now we, in our code that's not generated by SQL C, um, are able to define, you know, what the shape of the response will look like. If for whatever reason we needed to store some data in the database but never wanted to respond with it in our JSON API, we could make those changes here in this struct. Okay, so now we've got database feed to feed. We'll call that. And now we should be good to go. All right, let's test out our new handler. So I'm gonna rebuild our server and run it. And over in the Thunder client, let's see. So we just created a new user, Joe. So we have our authentication key here, or our API key. I'm gonna do a new request to HTTP slash local host. 8080 slash v1 slash feeds. Ah, now that I type this out, I realize 
that we never hooked it up. <laughs> Let's go hook up that feed. So feed handler, handler create feed. We need to go paste this in to the main function. So this one will go under slash feeds. Because we're creating a resource, we're going to use a post request. Handler create feed. Okay, that should be hooked up now. Let's uh, restart our server. And over here, again, I need to grab that API key. All right. What do we want here? Post request, localhost 8080, v1 feeds. We do need to authenticate again, so query headers, authen, authorization, API key, paste in that API key. Okay, uh, what do we send in as the body? Let's take a look at our handler again, a name and a URL. Okay, so name now remember this is this is this is not a person this is a feed right and a feed is a url that kind of links to an rss feed out on the internet so this one i'm going to put just a uh, lanes lanes blog and then the url is going to be https colon slash slash wags lane dot dev slash index dot XML. So in case you're not familiar with what an RSS feed is, let me just show you really quick. Um, I'm here on my blog, wagslane.dev, and if you click RSS up at the top, it'll take you to my RSS feed. Now, every RSS feed um, will have a different URL. It's kind of up to the author of the blog or the podcast what that feed URL is, but you can usually find it by poking around on their website. So in my case, um, it's just wagslane.dev slash index.xml. And it will look something like this if you open it up in a browser. It's basically this structured XML document that describes what each post on the blog says, at least from a high level. It'll usually have something like a link to the post, maybe a short description, um, basic stuff like that. Again, podcasts also work on this same RSS structure. So for testing, you can use my blog, or if you know of any other RSS feeds um, out on the web, you can use them. So now that I've pasted in that URL, uh, let's go ahead and create that feed. And what do we get back? Cool. The feed's got a new URL, created at, updated at, the name and the URL seem to have persisted correctly, and that is the user ID associated with the API key that we use to create the feed. Next, we're going to add the ability for any user to get all of the feeds in the database. This is not an authenticated endpoint. Okay, so we need a new query. I'm gonna go ahead and use the same file. Um, this query will just be called get feeds and it will return many rows instead of just one. All right, and this one will be uh, select star from feeds. Super, super simple query here. We're just gonna go grab all the feeds and return them. Okay, um, from there, we should be able to SQLC generate. And let's go hook up that handler. I'm gonna use the same uh, handler feed file, uh, but this one will be a little bit different. We are going to call this one handler get feeds. It's not authenticated, so we don't need to pass in a user, and it doesn't even take any parameters, right? It's just going to go get all of the feeds. So um, api cfg .db .get feeds, and it the get feeds function, if you remember, we just wrote it in SQL, it doesn't take any parameters. And it just returns all the feeds that are currently in the database. So this error should be say something like, couldn't get feeds. Cool. Um, now we need to return all of the feeds. This is not a single feed. This is now a slice of database.feeds. So not only do we need to return them, but we need to actually convert them. So let's go update our models a little bit. Let's create a new function. This one will be database feeds to feeds. 
And the difference is it will accept a slice of database feeds and it will return a slice of feeds. Let's do this. Slice feed, we'll create a new empty slice of feeds and then for db feed range db feeds feeds equals append feeds database feeds or database feed and return feeds sorry not we don't want to append it directly we have to we have to call our conversion function okay so this function will just iterate over all of the database feeds one by one converting them into our new feed structure and then returning them cool now here we can use that function to do that mapping great let's hook up this handler so in main.go, we'll create a new entry here. This is going to be a get request, and it's not authenticated. It will be handler get feeds. Cool. Let's regenerate. I can't remember if I generated my SQL C, so I'll do that. Couldn't hurt. And then we'll build and run the server. Okay, with that running, let's go ahead and create a couple more RSS feeds. So here, update the body of my request. Sorry, I'm so zoomed in so that you guys can see and it just makes it hard. <laughs> um, no, this was to create users. This is users, here's feeds. Okay, let's, let's just add the same URL with a couple Oh well, no, we can't we can't add the same URL. Let's just use some garbage URLs just to test. All right. Okay, that created properly. Now let's test our new endpoint. This one is going to be a get request to feeds, and we don't need to add any authentication information. Okay. Run that. Awesome, this looks good to me. We've got an array at the top level and then two feed objects, one for garbage blog and one's for, one for lanes blog. So it looks like everything's working. So we've given users a way to create feeds and a way to query all of the feeds. Now we're going to give users a way to follow specific feeds so that they can see kind of an aggregated view of all of the feeds that they care about on the system. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and add a new migration. We need a new table. So this will be the fourth migration, and we'll call this new table feed follows. And this table is just going to store the relationship between a user and all of the feeds they're following. So it'll be a many-to-many -many, uh, kind of table of user IDs to feed IDs. All right, um, the table is gonna be called feed follows. So create table, feed follows. Every feed follow, like every other record in our database, will have an ID, a created at, and an updated at but its unique fields will be a little bit different. First, it's going to need a user ID, which is, oh my gosh, why can't I type? Fingers are the wrong place in the keyboard. So a user ID is a UUID. Um, that can be, it doesn't, let's see, it doesn't need to be unique, um, but it does need to be not null. And then we need a feed ID. Also a UUID, not null. And then we're gonna create a unique constraint on the combination of user ID to feed ID. So unique user ID feed ID. So again, this constraint is going to make it so that we can never have two instances of a follow for the same user feed relationship, right? You as a user can only follow a certain feed once. You can't follow it twice. That doesn't really make sense, right? So we're gonna ensure that that's unique. Um, also, I missed a couple things here. The user ID uh, should reference, so references, uh, the users table ID field, and on delete, we'll cascade. So if a user is deleted, we're gonna go delete all of the 
data about what feeds they're following. Um, and then this one's going to be very similar, except it references the feeds table with its ID. And again, if a feed gets deleted, then we'll go delete all of the following data related to that feed. Cool. Okay, let's go ahead and run this migration. So I'm gonna go back up into the SQL, or I should say back down into the SQL schema directory. And from here, I'll need my connection string, do goose, postgres, connection string. Ah, oh, I didn't grab the whole thing. Let's try that again. All of that, goose, postgres, up. Cool. Feed follows databases, or feed follows table is there. So now we need a way for users to follow feeds. All right. Let's go ahead and go create that. So I'm gonna copy and paste the feed handler file and we'll call it handler feed follows and update this. So handler create feed follow. So remember, in order for a user to follow a feed, all we need to do is create a new feed follow record with that user feed relationship. Okay, this is an authenticated endpoint. Right, we, so we, we need a user and we need them to be authenticated, have passed an API key, right? And let's see, what do we need them to give us as input? I think all we need is a feed ID, right? They just need to tell us which feed they want to follow. So a feed ID is a UUID. All right, and now we should be able to create Oh, we, did, we never, we never made, we never made the SQL query. What am I doing? What am I doing? I'm getting way ahead of myself. Let's go add that query quickly. So feed follows. And to start, we'll need a create feed follow. Okay, what's in a feed follow, right? Got all these, all of these fields. And I think, yeah, we're just gonna have them all passed in directly seems like the easiest way. So insert into feed follows, ID created at, updated at, user ID, feed ID. That's five parameters, right? One, two, three, four, five. Cool, that looks good. Now I should be able to go back and run SQLC generate. Cool, now I should have a create feed follow function with create feed follow params. All right. It accepts a user ID and a feed ID. So the user ID is just the authenticated user. The feed ID is going to be passed in as params, right? Cool. Couldn't create feed follow. Don't need a get handler quite yet. And then we're gonna just need to make uh, make that uh, mapping function as well for feed follows. So in our models file, I'll create a new feed follow struct and it's going to have a user ID and a feed ID. And a new function database feed follow to feed follow. All right, db feed follow dot ID. By the way, I'm not using GitHub Copilot in this video, just so that you can, just just so you can see more of my thought process. Um, but I typically do use GitHub Copilot, and it makes this kind of function just like way faster to write. Um, it would guess this kind of function almost perfectly. Um, so just so you know, I, I do recommend those kinds of tools to speed up the development process. Um, 
I'm just not using it uh, right now so that you can see how I think through, you know, architecting this, this application without all the AI prompts getting in the way. Okay, now we should be able to database feed follow to feed follow, and we're gonna be clear that this is a feed follow, not a feed. And that goes there. Perfect. All right, let's hook this up. So we're going to need to go into main.go, v1 router, dot post because we're creating a resource slash feed follows and this is an authenticated authenticated handler handler create feed follow okay let's test this new endpoint so we'll build and run the server and we'll need a new request this one will be kind of similar. It'll be oops, a post request to the feed follows endpoint. And we're going to need to authenticate. So let's go grab some authentication information. Let's see, get users. Let's go ahead and send this. Couldn't get users, SQL no result. Okay, I need to figure out what users I have available to me. Oh, that's right, we, we changed this API key. We wanted it to break. Let's go create a new user. We'll make a new one called uh, Billy. And there's Billy's API key. Cool, we've got some feeds, but our feed follows need an auth section. Sorry, in the headers. We're doing it manually. Authorization, API key, there's Billy's key. And then in the body, we need to pass in the ID of the feed that we want to follow. So let's do a get on all of the feeds and we can follow either of these. Let's follow Lane's blog. There's our feed ID. Paste that in there and create. Amazing. New ID for the feed follow. There's the user ID, the feed ID. What happens if we try to recreate it? Cool, couldn't create feed follow, duplicate key value, violates unique constraint. That's what we'd expect, right? We shouldn't be able to follow the same feed multiple times. We're already following it. We already have a record uh, indicating that we are following it. Everything appears to be working just fine. Next, let's give users a way to see all of the different feeds that they are currently following. So we'll do get feed follows. And it will return many. And the query will be select star from feed follows where user ID equals dollar sign one. All right? So get all the feed follows for a given ID. Let's get that hooked up. We need to run SQL C generate to create that query. And then down here, we'll create a new handler. This handler will also be authenticated, but it's going to be get feed follows. Have the user, we don't need any parameters here. And we're just going to call get feed follows. And we'll just need to pass in the user's ID. Couldn't get feed follows. Cool, now we've got a list of feed follows or a slice of feed follows. So we're going to need to convert an entire slice. So again, down here, we'll write this type of a function. It's gonna be database feed follows to feed follows. All right, lots of copying and pasting here. Feed follows. Okay, so now we have a way to convert an entire slice 
of database feed follows to our own struct. That looks good to me. There, feed follows. Ooh, okay, cool. Now we have a handler for getting feed follows. Let's go ahead and update this. So we need a new v1 router dot get slash feed underscore follows. Middleware auth. Get feed follows. Perfect. All right, let's give that a shot. So we'll build and run again. And now, let's see. So this is um, this is the request that we used to create. So let's grab. Oh, so hard working on such a small screen. Let's grab our API key and create a new request. Eighty slash v one slash feed follows. It's going to be a get request. It does need to be authenticated. Okay. Let's see if that works. Cool. We got the one feed back that we are currently following. Finally, we need a way to unfollow feeds or to delete feed follows. So let's create a new one, a new query. We'll do delete feed follow. Now, this one is gonna be our first query that doesn't actually return anything. Um, it's just going to be an execute, right? We're not returning one record, we're not returning many records, we're returning no records. We're just going to run a, a SQL query. So uh, it's going to be delete from feed follows where ID equals dollar sign one and user id equals dollar sign two now it's important it's important to point out that we don't actually need the user id here for this query to work right the id is already a unique identifier the reason i'm tacking on this user id is because this will prevent someone who doesn't own a feed follow from trying to unfollow a feed on behalf of somebody else that makes sense uh if for whatever reason, another user got access, to, let's say if, if for some reason user B got access to the feed follow ID of user A, if we didn't have this check here, then that user who hijacked a feed follow ID would be able to like unfollow, like force the other user to do an unfollow if that makes sense. This ensures that only the user who actually owns the follow record can execute the unfollow command. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, uh, from here, let's just go ahead and generate that and go hook it up to a new endpoint. So we'll do handler, delete, feed, follow. Now, this one's gonna be a little different in that it, it is authenticated, but we need to get a feed follow ID and delete requests, so like HTTP delete requests, the delete HTTP method, they don't typically have a body in the payload. It's, it's possible, but I would argue it's not super conventional. Um, it's a little more conventional to pass the ID in the HTTP path. So um, it's gonna look something like this. View and router dot delete feed follows slash feed follow ID. And then this will be handler uh, delete feed follow, right? So we want the feed follow ID dynamically passed in the path of the request. So the question is, how do we grab this feed follow ID um, in our handler itself? Well, the Chai router has, or Chi, oh, I'm, ne I'm never going to say that the proper way. Uh, the Chi router has a, I think it's pat, is it URL? Let's see, URL parameter. 
that's the one a uh, URL, url parameter function where we can pass in the request and a key and in this case it's going to have to match so feed follow id matches whatever we type in here between the open and close brackets okay and that's going to return a string so this is the feed follow id string great we're going to take that and we're going to parse it into a uuid so we'll do uuid.parse and that will return a feed follow id and potentially an error if the error does not equal nil we'll say couldn't parse feed follow id and that will be a 400 level error perfect okay from here we should be able to do api cfg .database .delete feed follow and we need to pass in the request context and the feed follow params so database .feed, delete feed follow parameters it takes an id and a user id it's the id of the feed follow we just parsed and then the user id comes in with that user object because this is an authenticated request. Cool, and that should return just an error. Right? Oh, and we just, it's just it's just giving me yellow squigglies because I need to handle the error. So couldn't delete feed follow. Perfect. Uh, what do we respond with here? I guess we have a couple different options. Um, the simplest thing would just be to respond with like an empty JSON object, I guess. Uh, what matters to the client is probably the 200 response code. Um, so we could like for the sake of simplicity, just so we can use our respond with JSON function, we'll just return an empty JSON object. Alternatively, maybe we could return an object that says like message, you know, unfollow successful or something um but it, it doesn't matter too much i think as long as it's a 200 level code uh, we're pretty much good to go okay and that's already been hooked up so let's go ahead and test it i uh, can't remember if i generated let me do that again and then we'll restart the server and take a look okay so this was our endpoint it's returning the feeds that we are currently following let's go ahead and delete this feed follow so we need new request this is going to be a delete request we're going to unfollow a specific id we're going to unfollow this we're going to delete this feed follow right feed follow with that with that id and the headers, we do need to be authenticated as the same person. So authorization, same API key. Okay, let's run that delete. We got a 200 response. Now let's go do a get and make sure that it's gone. Yep, empty list or empty array. We're good to go. Okay, we've built out the majority of the CRUD section of our API, but we haven't built the most interesting part, which is the part of the server that actually goes out and fetches posts from the different RSS feeds that exist in our database. Again, the whole purpose of this server that we are building is so that it can keep track of all of these different feeds in the database and then go out periodically and actually download all of the posts that are on each individual feed. So for example, we have a feed for my personal blog post. This server will actually go out to my blog every, I don't know, 10 minutes and check to see if there's a new blog post to download and store in the database. So the first thing we need to do is update the feeds table to have one more column. We need a new column called last fetched at, and it's just so we can keep track of when we last fetched the posts for a given feed. So let's go ahead and add that. We'll need new migration. Um, and it will look kind of like this migration. Uh, it's going to be our fifth migration so far. It's going to be on the feeds table, and we're going to be adding the last fetched at, last fetched at field. Okay, so alter table feeds, add column, last fetched 
at. And this one is going to be timestamp. And it will be nullable, so we don't need a not null constraint. Um, in fact, that's it. Um, it's okay. Like, we don't need to specify any defaults. Uh, that should be it. Um, and then as far as the down migration goes, we'll just be deleting or dropping the column from the feeds table. Okay, cool. Let's run that migration. So Goose, Postgres. Perfect. So we don't need to update the create feed uh, function. We want the last fetch dat field to default to null. So no changes are necessary there. But we do need a new, we do need a new query. This one's gonna be called get next. Oh my gosh, get next feed to fetch. Can't type today. Get next feed to fetch, and it will return a single row. And this one should say select star from feeds order by last fetched at descending nulls first limit one. Whew. Okay. So we always this the purpose of this function is to go get the feed that next needs to be fetched. Like we need to go get posts for this feed next. And the whole idea is first we want to go find any feeds that have never been fetched before. Those need to take priority. After that, if every feed has been fetched, then we want to go find the one that was fetched the longest ago, like the farthest in the past, right? So we're ordering by last fetched at um, nulls first in descending order. Actually, scratch that. We're going to want to do ascending, right? Ascending would put the lowest, the, the smallest timestamps, right? The ones further in the past at the top and then ascend into the present. Okay, so order by last fetch stat, ascending nulls first. Perfect. Okay, just to make sure that my SQL code is valid, we'll generate that. Looks good. Okay, next we need one more query. This one will be called uh, mark feed fetched. Mark feed, I guess, as fetched. This is the one we'll call after we fetch a feed to say that we fetched it. Um, and we'll return the updated feed. Okay, so it's going to be update feeds set last fetched at equal to now and updated at also equal to now. So we haven't really gone over this, but the updated at and created at fields are mostly for auditing purposes. It's pretty standard practice to set these fields on basically every record in an SQL database, just so you can see when they've been created and updated. It's kind of, again, auditing purposes. Okay, uh, where ID equals dollar sign one and returning star. Okay, so we update the feeds, we set the last fetch at and the updated at to the current time for the given ID. That looks good to me. Let's go ahead and generate that. Perfect. Next, we need a way to kind of take an RSS URL or a feed URL and parse it into an actual response body. And in this case, we're going to re represent it as a struct. Let me show you what I mean. So let's create a new file. I'm just going to call it rss.go. And it's going to be part of the main package. And we need a new function. And we're going to call it RSS to, or actually let's call it URL, mm, URL to feed. Okay. And it's going to take as input a URL, which is just a string, and it will return a new type. So we need to specify the new type. Type um, RSS feed. It will return both an RSS feed and potentially an error if there's something wrong uh, with the request that it's making. Now, that RSS feed struct that we just created is going to represent basically this giant, this giant document here, right? So if you go to 
wagslane.dev slash index.xml, which is a valid RSS feed, then you'll see this giant document. And really you can think of RSS as just a structured data in XML format. And XML is just kind of like crappy JSON. So the way we parse XML in Go is very similar to the way we parse JSON. Let me show you what I mean. I've done the dirty work of scanning all of the valid um, values in that big RSS document. And I found that basically these are the keys um, for the RSS entries in my blog. So RSS is kind of a standardized set of keys within XML. Um, and basically what I'm saying is these are the keys that we care about, right? At the top level of an RSS feed, we expect a channel key, right, in the XML document. And we expect a channel to have a title, a link, a description, a language, and then a slice of items. And then items are kind of these nested objects that each have their own title, link, descriptions, and publication dates, right? And each item is a new blog post. And if you're asking how I came up with those names of all of the different keys, it's because I went and looked here in this document. I saw, okay, at the top level, we have a channel, right? And then we have um, this entry with a title, a link, a description, right? So I just kind of manually looked through this document and found all the stuff that I wanted to parse out. So let's fill in the rest of this URL to feed function. So first we're going to need an HTTP client. Um, I'm just creating a new client using the HTTP library. Um, we'll set it to a timeout of 10 seconds. If it takes more than 10 seconds to fetch an RSS feed, uh, we don't want that feed anyway. <laughs> Probably broken. Okay, uh, then we can use that client to make a get request to the URL of the feed. And that's going to return an HTTP response and potentially an error. If there's an error, we'll just return. Let's just do, um, for, cons for ease of use, I'm going to make this a pointer to an RSS feed. So we can just return nil and the error. Cool. Um, if everything's okay, then we're going to defer a close on, let's close on the resp. Sorry, it's not, it's not the close function. It's resp.body.close. Okay, and then after that, we want to get all of the data from the response body. So it's going to be io.readall. We want to read everything from resp.body. And that comes back as a slice of bytes and an error. Okay, this slice of bytes, we want to read into this RSS feed. So Dealing with XML in Go is very similar to dealing with JSON in Go. So it's actually going to be XML dot unmarshal, pass in the data and a pointer to where we want to unmarshal the data. So actually I need to create an empty struct. We need RSS feed is an empty RSS feed struct. Then we'll unmarshal into that location in memory. That will return an error. If everything goes well, then we can just return the new populated RSS feed. Perfect. Now, as I type this out, I'm already kind of dissatisfied with this pointer solution. I don't think that needs to be a pointer. I think we should just return empty structs. Um, either way would work. I think this is a little cleaner though, because it means the user of this function, us, <laughs> right, uh, will we'll get an actual RSS feedback and not a pointer to an RSS feed. Okay, let's go ahead and test this really quick. I'm just gonna do a little kind of hacky thing. Just right at the top of main, I'm going to call URL to feed and give it the URL of um, my blog. So wagslane.dev slash index.xml. That should return a feed and an error, right? And then if error not equal nil, log dot fatal error. Otherwise I want to just print out fmt dot print line. Let's just print out the whole feed. It'll be disgusting, but it, at least we'll get to see if it kind of worked. Okay, let's build and run that.
there we go. Cool. So if you kind of scroll through this, you'll see it looks like, I mean, there was no errors. And then it looks like we properly, at least, you know, at first glance, it looks like we properly filled out that struct. It's kind of just dumping all of the data. So now that we've done a sanity test on our URL to feed function, let's go write the actual scraper. Let me create a new file. Let's call this scraper.go. Again, in the main package. Okay, um, the scraper is a long running job. So this scraper function is going to be running in the background as our server runs. So we'll, let's name it something like start scraping. And let me split up these parameters so we can really see, so we can actually see what, uh, what we're dealing with here. So it'll take three inputs, a connection to the database, um, a number of concurrency units. I guess the best way to think about this is how many different go routines we want to do the scraping on, and then how much time uh, we want in between each request to go scrape a new RSS feed. Cool. And it shouldn't return anything because this is going to be a long running job. Now, because this worker, this scraper, is going to be running in the background of our server, I think it's really important that we have good logging um, that kind of tells us what's going on as it's happening. So when we start scraping, I'm going to do a, a little log message here. So log.printf will say scraping on percent v go routines every percent s duration pass in the concurrency and the time between requests cool after that we need to figure out like how we're going to make our requests on this interval and there's a really cool um, mechanism in the standard library in go called a ticker so we can create a new ticker uh, using the standard library so time.new ticker and we give it a duration in this case, time between requests. And it responds with a ticker. And then we can use a for loop to execute the body of the for loop every time a new value comes across the ticker's channel. So the ticker has a field called C, which is a channel where every kind of, let's say that, you know, time between requests was set to one minute. In that case, every one minute, a value would be sent across the channel. So by using this syntax here, we could say run this for loop every one minute. And the reason I'm passing in an empty initialize and an empty um, middle section to the for loop is so that it executes immediately the first time. So the very first time we get to line 17, the body of the for loop will, will, will fire immediately and then it will wait for the, for the uh, interval on the ticker, if that makes sense. If we just did this, oops, if we just did, what is it, for range ticker.c, uh, then it would actually wait for the minute up front. But I want to do it once immediately. Um, it'll make it easier to debug and work with. Now, at this point, I realize that I've made a mistake. The purpose of this concurrency parameter here is to, uh, you know, indicate to the start scraping function how many go routines we want to use to go fetch um, all of these different feeds. And the whole point is that we can fetch them at the same time. So that means that each time that this ticker fires, we need to be potentially go, you know, going out to the internet to fetch 10, 20, 30 different RSS feeds and download all of their blog posts at the same time which means we'll actually need to be able to grab a, a, a multiple number of feeds. We'll need to grab more than just one at a time. So rather than get next feed to fetch, let's change this to get next feeds to fetch and we'll have it return many. And then rather than limiting to one, let's limit to dollar sign one. So we can actually pass in how many feeds we want as a parameter to this function. Okay, then we should be able to regenerate that. And we should, oh, we're not even using the function yet. So, okay, so that was actually the perfect time to do that. Okay, let's fill out the body of this for loop. So every interval, time between requests, we want to go grab the next batch of feeds to fetch. So we can just call that function that we just wrote, 
database.getNext feeds to fetch. It takes a context and a limit. So the first thing we'll just use context.background. So again, I haven't gone into a ton of detail on the context package, but basically context.background is like the global context. It's what you use if you don't have access to a scoped context like we do for our individual HTTP requests. Okay, so that'll work for now. And then we also need to pass in a limit. So we'll just cast int 32 and the limit, or the sorry, the concurrency. And that should return some feeds and an error. If there's an error, we should probably print something. Now notice I'm continuing here. That's because this function should always be running as our server operates like th there's no time in which we want this function to ever stop so if i returned here that would be a problem it would actually stop scraping completely just because maybe i don't know our database connection was down temporarily so for now we're just going to log and continue now that we have a slice of feeds let's write some logic that goes and fetches each feed individually and importantly fetches each individually at the same time so we're going to need a synchronization mechanism uh, i'm going to use a wait group so the standard library has this awesome thing called a sync.wait group. Then we can iterate over all of the feeds. So for feed, range, feeds. Okay, so the way that the wait group works is anytime you want to spawn a new go routine within the context of the wait group, you do a wait group.add and you add some number to it. So here I'm iterating over all of the feeds that we want to fetch on individual Go routines, and I'm going to add one to the wait group. Then at the end of the loop, I can do a wait group dot wait. And within the loop, I can spawn a new Go routine. So we're gonna go do some function. In fact, I guess I should just name it kind of what we'll be doing. Uh, let's call it, scrape feed, go scrape feed. And here we're actually going to pass the wait group in as one of the parameters. And within scrape feed takes a wait group, which is a pointer to a sync dot wait group. Within this function, we'll defer a wait group dot done. Okay. So what happens here? Basically, we're iterating over the, 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 all of the feeds on the same Go routine as the, you know, the start scraping uh, function. So on the main Go routine. On the main Go routine, we're adding one to the wait group for every feed, right? So say we had a concurrency of 30, we would be adding 30 to the wait group. Now, we'll be spawning all of these separate Go routines as we do that, and when we get to the end of the loop, we're going to be waiting on the wait group for 30, 30 distinct calls to done. So done effectively decrements the counter by one, right? Done decrements the counter by one. So we're adding one every time we iterate over the slice, and then we're calling done when we're done actually scraping the feed. So what this does is it allows us to call scrape feed at the same time 30 times. So we go spawn 30 different Go routines to scrape 30 different RSS feeds. And when they're all done, line 35 will kind of execute and we'll move past that. Until they're like before they're done, we'll be blocking on line 35, which is what we want to do because we don't want to continue on to the next iteration of the loop until we are sure that we've actually scraped all of the feeds. So we've sort of stubbed out this scrape feed function. Right now it doesn't do anything other than call wait group dot done. Uh, let's actually go scrape some feeds. So it's going to need access to a database connection. And it's also going to need a specific feed to go fetch. So feed is a data base dot feed. Cool. And then here we can pass in database and feed. Great. 
the first thing scrape feed should do and and keep in mind we're deferring the weight group dot done so this will always be called at the end of this function um the first thing we should do is mark that we've fetched this feed or that we're fetching this feed so it's going to be database dot mark feed as fetched we can just use the background context again and we need the id of the feed so feed dot id Cool, that should return an error if there was an error, I think. Oh, it also returns the updated feed. I don't think we care about the updated feeds. I think we can ignore that. Say so if error is not equal nil. Now keep in mind, we are not returning anything from this function. Remember, we're calling it on a new go routine. So there's nothing to return here if there's an error. Instead, we'll just log there was an issue. and return nothing. And next we need to actually do the heavy lifting, which is to go out and scrape the feed. So we already wrote our URL to feed function. Let's just use that. So URL to feed, and we'll pass in the feed dot URL, and we should get back an RSS feed and an error. And if error does not equal nil, Error fetching feed. And we'll return there. Otherwise, we need to do some logging. So in the future, what we'll do is instead of iterating over all of the um, items in the RSS struct that we get back and just printing them to the console, we'll be saving them into the database. But for now, just so that we can test our scrape feed function, um, we're just going to log, log all of this to the console. So we're going to log um, each individual post or rather that we found a post um, and then how many posts we found. The last thing we need to do is go hook up this start scraping function to our main function so that it actually starts. Okay, so start scraping takes database concurrency. Actually, I'll just open this. Oh, my, my screen's too small to be working in two tabs at the same time. Okay, um, we're going to need to call it before listen and serve because remember, this is where our server kind of blocks and waits forever for incoming requests. So we should probably call it, I don't know, right here. Seems like a good spot. So, um, it's just it's just a function, right? Yeah, it's not a method. It takes database concurrency and time between requests. Okay, so we go go start scraping. Remember, we want to call it on a new go routine so that it doesn't interrupt uh, this main flow. Because remember, start scraping is never going to return. It's a long running function. Uh, this is an infinite for loop. Okay, it needs a database connection, so we'll actually need to save this in a new variable so that we can use it in the API config and in the start scraping function. Next, we need the concurrency. Um, let's just start with 10. Seems good. And then time between requests, let's do time.minute. Perfect. I went ahead and added a second RSS feed. So let's go ahead and check the database and see what feeds we have currently. So I've got lanes blog and the boot dev blog. So there's two. Now remember, we were setting a concurrency of 10 so we should definitely be able to fetch both of these blogs at the same time on the first iteration of that loop if we say deployed this to production and allowed users to start creating feeds maybe we'd get up to 100 200 400 different feeds in here then we'd only be fetching 10 at a time right just so we understand how that mechanism works but for now this should be good enough to test i'm going to update our logs just a bit um, so that we can see which blog each post is from so found post item.title on feed, feed.name. Okay, let's go ahead and run that. Found post, the properties of pointers in Go, on feed, boot dev blog. Perfect. So we can kind of scroll up. We should be able to see some. The boot dev blog has way more blog posts than my personal blog. Here it is. Here's some Lane's blog stuff. Okay, so that looks like it's working. We should be able to move on to the next step now where we'll actually save these blog posts into the database rather than just logging the titles to the console.
We're going to need a new table in our database. So let's start there. We'll call it posts. So the purpose of this table is to store all of the posts that we are fetching from all of the different uh, from all of the different RSS feeds. Okay, um, what am I doing? This is this is queries. We need to start with a migration. So let's grab this. We'll make it 006 posts dot SQL. All right, goose up is going to be create table posts. What goes in a posts table? Um, we are going to need an ID, a create that, and update that. That pretty much never changes. Um, what else does a post have? Well, it has a title. T title. Um, is that text.null? That makes sense. Uh, posts also typically have a description. Text. Um, I'm going to allow that one to be nullable. I think it's okay if a post is missing its description. Posts also typically have a published at date. So published at, which is a timestamp. Um, should we allow that one to be nullable? No, no, let's make that not null. What else does a post have? It has a URL. A URL should be not null for sure. Um, I'm also gonna say that it should be unique. Unique. I don't think we ever want to store the same post in the database twice. There's no point, right? If we have a post, I don't see why we would need it a second time. So let's, let's go ahead and make that one unique. And then lastly, let's just put in a feed ID. And the feed ID is going to be a UUID that uh, we're going to want it to be a reference, a references, um, feeds ID, right? And that's going to be, mm, does that need to be unique? It doesn't need to be unique, but it should be not null. We should always have the feed ID of a post. And let's here put on delete cascade. If we delete a feed, we'll cascade and delete all of its posts. And I forgot to put the type here. So URL text not null unique. Okay, that looks good to me. Let's go ahead and run our migration. So it's going to be, uh, we need to CD into SQL schema and run goose postgres. We'll need this connection string. Perfect. Next, we'll need a couple of queries to interact with this table. Uh, the first one's going to be just a way to create a post. So let's do posts and we'll do create, oops, create post, return one thing. And we'll just kind of be inserting a bunch of stuff, I think. Let's take a look at the post table. So we've got ID, created at, updated at. Let me just grab this so I don't forget it. Okay, so insert into posts, ID created at, updated at. We also have, we have a lot of stuff, so I'm gonna actually gonna start spacing this out a little bit. Created at, updated at, it's gonna be a title and a description. Published at. URL and a feed ID. Okay, and the values one, two, three, four. How many do we got? Just eight, five, six, seven, eight. Returning star. Straightforward, right? Insert into posts, all of these fields, no fancy logic. That should be good. Okay, let's run SQLC generate to add that function to our internal package. And then we just need to go use it. So down in the scraper now, instead of just logging all of these posts to the console, let's save them to the database. Um, I'm going to leave this log message. It just says feed blank collected blank posts found. So that'll just log all of the different feeds we are collecting, but each individual post, I think it's wasteful and kind of busy to log everything. So we're not gonna do that. Instead, we'll just call db.createPost, context.background, and 
what does it take? Create post params, database.create post params. Okay, cool. I kind of like how SQLC breaks down the parameters into um into a struct. It makes it pretty simple to work with. Okay. Um we've got an ID created at, updated at. Okay. Um ID is just gonna be a new ID. Create it at, update it at, it'll just be time.now. UTC. What's next? Title description. Title. Item dot title. I just realized oh, I just realized now that I'm not putting the field names. It's kind of embarrassing. Okay. Title, description. Do they not have a description? What does an item have? Let's take a look at an item. Items have title, link, description. Yeah, it does have a description. What am I messing up here? Can I use item.description variable of type string as sql.null string? Ah, right, okay. So we need to do sql.null string. A null string has the string itself and whether or not it's valid. So we just uh, put in the string and then we say it is valid. String dot valid is a boolean true. Although actually this is a problem, right? This is a problem because if item.description is blank, if it's an empty string, we're gonna be putting in an empty string and saying that it's there even though it's not so let's not do this let's do something a little different let's go description is a new sql.null string why is why is that giving me trouble oh because i'm because i'm doing it within the call to create post do it right here okay so we'll create a new sql.null string and then we'll say if item dot description does not equal the empty string, then we get to set description dot string equal to item dot description and description dot valid equals true. And then we'll use the description here. Does that make sense? So if, if the item's description is blank, then we'll set the value to null in the database effectively. Um, otherwise we'll, create the valid uh, description entity. Okay, next we need a published at. Let's see, we've got an item dot pub date, which is a string. Okay, so we're gonna need to parse that string. To parse that date, there is a time dot parse function in the standard library. And we're gonna use this RFC 1123Z layout. So this is the layout that I'm using on the boot dev blog and on my blog. To be more robust and support all of the different publishing formats for all the different blogs that we want to scrape, we'd probably need to make this logic a little bit more robust. But for now, I'm just going to say, we're parsing it this way. If it's not that way, I guess we take a hike. Okay. Um, if there's an error, so if error does not equal nil, you can say log.println. Couldn't parse date. Sent v with error. Sent v, and we'll pass in the actual pub date and an error, and that's going to be a printf. Oops. Cool. And then if that's an issue, we'll just continue. So if we don't get a valid time, uh, then we'll just we'll just log it, log and move on. Okay. So published at pass in that I shouldn't use single name variables like this. Let's do pub at. Okay. What else do we got? A URL and a feed ID. So URL is just going to be the item.link. And feed ID. Do we have access to the feed ID here? We do. We have the feed, right, because we passed in the feed here. Perfect. Feed.id. Now, db.createPost does return an error. 
So we need to handle that error. What am I screwing up here? Oh, it also returns the post itself. I don't think we care about the new post though. I think all we care about is if it failed. So if error equal nil. Failed to create post with error. Ooh, okay, let's give that a shot. Okay, build and run. Now remember, we're expecting this time to get logs that just say that the blogs were collected. So 21 posts from Lane's blog, 321 posts from the boot dev blog were collected. I'm gonna go ahead and kill the server and let's check PG admin. So now if we select star from posts, we should see a bunch of stuff in here. IDs, created at, titles, descriptions, published at dates. Awesome, this is looking fantastic. We scroll down to see how many rows there are, 342. That looks right to me. Now, I think we have an issue here. Let me show you what I mean. If we run this again, so remember, we've scraped both of the feeds and pulled in all of the posts. So if I rerun my server at this point, yeah, we're getting all of these issues. Failed to create post, duplicate key value, violates unique constraint, posts URL key. Right Now this makes sense. We didn't want to store duplicate posts in our database, so we have a unique constraint on the post URL, which means when we go try to recreate the posts, it fails because we already have the posts in our database. So let's do a little string, uh, a string detection so that we don't log this crap every time this happens because this isn't really an error. This is expected behavior. So um, we could do something like if strings.contains error.error uh, duplicate duplicate e then do we continue what are we doing here yeah then we continue otherwise we'll log the error so we're only going to log the error if it's not a duplicate key error okay so let's run that again and make sure we don't get those errors. Perfect. We have one last feature to add to our RSS aggregator. We need a way for users to be able to get a list of all of the newest posts from the feeds that they're following. So we'll need a new query. Uh, we can call this one get posts for user, and it will return many posts. Now, let's think about this query for a second. It's a little more complex than the other queries we've done in that I think we need to do a join. So we have our posts table, right? Posts have IDs, created at, updated at, but importantly, they have a feed ID. So we know what feed every post in the database belongs to. And we also have a feed follows table that tells us which feeds an individual user is following. So if we join those two tables together, right, if we take all of the feed follow information, kind of join it to the posts table, then we should be able to filter by all of the feeds that a user is actually following. So what does that look like? You can do select posts.star. So everything from the post table, from posts, join feed follows on Oops, on post dot feed ID equals feed follows dot feed ID. Okay, so this adds essentially all the feed follow information to our like the virtual table for this query, right? We're joining those two tables together. So now we should be able to filter um, the way we want. Okay, so we've we've joined them together uh, where posts dot wait post no where feed follows dot user ID equals dollar sign one. Okay, so we join the tables and then we filter all the posts down or rather the entire table down by the specific user ID. So all of the posts that belong to feeds that the user is not following should at this step get trimmed out. Then we can order by, let's do post dot published at descending. So give us the newest stuff first. 
and we'll limit by a configurable amount. So dollar sign two. Cool. Let's go ahead and try to generate that. Looks like it worked. Let's see if uh, see if when we run the actual application, it does what we expect. Let's hook that query up to a new endpoint. So I'm here in the users file. That seems like a reasonable place. We'll do handler get posts for user. It will be an authenticated endpoint, so we'll need that that user data. Um, but here we're going to call db dot or sorry api config dot db dot get posts for user, and then we can pass in the request dot context and user dot id. Oh, we also need I think a limit. Oh, get no 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 sorry we take we take database dot get post for user params, right? Because we had multiple parameters here, so we'll need the user's id and a limit. The user dot id, and for now let's just say a limit of ten, and that will return to us some posts and potentially an error. If we get an error, we'll respond with it. Couldn't get posts. Otherwise, we need to return the post themselves. Now, we should go create a special posts model, right? So that we get our, our own tag. So type post struct. Go mostly copy this from our internal post model. Wherever it ended up, here it is. Okay. Add some JSON tags. Goodness, typing is hard. Now here's an interesting thing. This SQL.null string um, is not something that we're going to want to use um, in this struct because this is a struct that marshals to JSON. The null string object is a nested struct. So if we marshaled it directly to JSON, we would actually get description as a JSON key and then string as a JSON key and then valid as a JSON key. So it'd be a little nested object there. That's pretty bad user experience because JSON natively supports kind of null in the sense that you can just omit the key um, or use like the, the actual value null. Um, so what we're going to do is instead do a pointer to a string and the way JSON marshalling in Go works is if you have a pointer to a string and it is nil, then it will marshal to what you'd expect in JSON land, which is that null value. Okay, and then publish that. URL and feed ID. Okay, did I miss anything? Let me look over this really quick. That's looking good. And next we need the conversion. So we'll do database post to post. Now, this one gets a little hairy, right? Um, we probably need to do some logic here. So we'll say var description pointer to a string. And then if db post dot description dot valid, then we'll set description equal to the address of db post dot description dot string. Cool. Then we can just directly use the description variable there. All right, published at. Uh, 
What else we got? URL and feed ID. Okay. And last but not least, we need a way to do it. Uh, do the conversion for an entire slice. Funk DB or database posts to posts. And the logic will look pretty much identical to that, but I actually think it'll be easier to type it out. So we'll do uh, posts, slice post. The database, post, post. That's in the database post. Okay. There we go. <laughs> A lot of conversion logic there. But now we should be good to just respond with some JSON and we can pass in those posts as database posts. Cool, what am I getting here? Struct literally uses unkeyed fields. Oh yeah, let's not do that. We want an ID, and I think it's a limit. Right? What am I messing up? User ID. Perfect. Okay, let's build and run the server again. Oh, I realize I made a mistake. I need to actually hook this up to something. So let's go back into main.go. We need a new endpoint. We'll do get, mm, I don't know, user feed. Now feed's probably a loaded term in this, uh, in this application. We should say, uh, let's just do posts. And it's going to require middleware. So middleware auth and API CFG dot handler get posts for user. Okay, so get slash posts. It's an authenticated endpoint, perfect, all right. Let's rebuild and run that. Okay. Opening up Thunder Client. First, we need to check. Well, actually, let's just grab some auth information. So um, this clearly has some auth. Let's grab that API key, create a new request. HTTP colon localhost v1 posts headers close that authorization API key okay so if I make that request I'm getting back no posts now we know we have posts in the database but my the, my user that I'm currently logged in as is not following anything. Right, I'm getting back the empty array when I when I check my feed follows. Um, but I can check which feeds exist by running this API request. So let's grab this feed. Let's grab the Wags Lane feed. And let's go follow that one. So we'll post to feed follows here. This feed ID. Okay, so now I should be following. Let's check my feed follows. Right, I'm following them. So now if I go get my posts, there we go. I should just be getting posts from the wagslane.dev block. Perfect. Let's try following, let's try following um, the other one. So, where is it? Feed follows? No, feeds. Let's try following the boot dev blog as well. So post to feed follows. Send that. Check my feed follows. Now I'm following both. Now if I go get my posts, perfect. We're seeing stuff from the boot dev blog. That's it. Thank you for sticking with me 
through all of this mess, we've created an amazing blog aggregator that will actually work pretty darn well at scale. You could run this thing, uh, you know, over a long period of time, collect millions of blog posts, and it would do pretty well. I hope you had a ton of fun with this project. I do want to remind you that this is a server, right? We've kind of been running it, stopping it, restarting it. But at the end of the day, you can just turn it on, add new feeds and follows and interact with it directly. And it will, once a minute, go out and collect all of those blog posts. So you could just keep this running on a Raspberry Pi in your house um, to aggregate you know, blog posts, podcasts, all that kind of stuff. Um, I will point out that we have done a bit of happy path programming. So happy path programming is when you're not necessarily handling every edge case out there. You're, you're handling kind of, you know, the thing that you expect to happen most of the time. So for example, um, we only had one type of date parsing for the published at dates in our RSS feeds, but maybe there are RSS feeds out there that use a different date format and we'll fail to parse them. Um, so one way that you could extend this project would be to just add a ton of new RSS feeds and make sure that you deal with the issues as they come up. Make sure you improve the logging so that you can see the issues when they come up. Anyways, I hope you had a ton of fun with this project and that you learned something. I just want to remind you that we do have an entire backend learning path over on boot.dev in Golang. So if you liked this project, if you liked this course and are looking for some more content, definitely go check out boot.dev. We also have published a lot of different ways that you could potentially extend this project to make it cooler. For example, maybe you add a front end or a command line application that interacts directly with the API so that you don't need to use a manual client like Thunder Client every time that you want to interact with your posts. And then I also just want to remind you before I go that you can find me on Twitter at Wags Lane or on YouTube at boot.dev. Definitely go subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Thank you again to Free Code Camp for allowing us to publish this course and this project walkthrough. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one.